And welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we have three astronauts and one cosmonaut about to suit up for their journey to the International Space Station in just about four hours. You are seeing aerial views of what their ride will be today. A brand new Falcon 9 rocket. Atop, we have the Dragon Endeavor. We are trying to launch these four folks again after the launch team chose to stand down from yesterday's attempt due to weather. We had elevated winds along the ascent corridor, but today things are looking much more promising. Today's T0 is 1053 and 38 seconds Eastern time, and the weather, while still a watch item, better than yesterday, 75% go here at the launch site, and the conditions have also improved along the ascent corridor but teams will be keeping a close eye on that corridor through the T-minus one-hour weather brief. Crew 8 is a continuation of regular crewed flights from U.S. soil to the International Space Station as part of NASA's commercial crew program. The crews ride to space again, what you're seeing there on your screen. Dragon Endeavor will fly for a fifth time with this launch, and over the next four and a half hours, we will show you all the action live and in 4K. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and the, this is the official launch broadcast of Crew 8's launch. And with me to help commentate to what's happening tonight is NASA astronaut Rajachari. Hey, thanks, Megan. Glad to be back. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll own the first, uh, first scrub from yesterday. We kind of joked that I may have jinxed it, and I think I may have. <laughs> no. But I think I'm also going to blame my wife a little bit, but it turns out she was not wearing her Crew 8 shirt yesterday. <laughs> mm. So she's got it on tonight, and so I think uh, now that uh, myself and better half are synced, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> uh, well, some quick background on Raja before we turn our attention to uh, the operations we have before us today. Raja was the commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission, which launched back in November 2021. Once aboard the space station, he served as a flight engineer and conducted science experiments and technology demonstrations. He also performed two spacewalks. And then after 177 days in orbit, he and his crew, as you can see here, splashed down off the coast of Tampa, Florida. And then in March 2023, one year ago yesterday, Raja watched his first launch from the ground while co-hosting our Crew 6 launch broadcast. And we are, of course, happy to have you back. 
for Crew 8. And happy to be here and still going for uh, three in a row. So like you mentioned, I got to see my first launch after my first launch being on the rocket, uh, and then got to see Crew 6. Uh, I got to be lucky enough to come to Crew 7's launch and uh, be with Jasmine Mogbelli, one of my classmates' uh, family for that launch, and then back again for, for Crew 8 to launch yet another turtle uh, to the International Space Station and keep that string alive. And that turtle, of course, is Matt. Yes, it is, yes. Matt, Matt Dominic, the commander. So right now we are T-minus four hours, four minutes and counting until liftoff. In just about four minutes, we expect to take you all inside the suit-up room. So the suit-up room is a room within astronaut crew quarters, and astronaut crew quarters is a section of the historic Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building here at Kennedy. These are doors that lead into that building, the famous doors where astronauts have walked out uh, for their ride to space since Apollo 7, 1968. Yeah, it's, been, it's a, a long story place. Um, the building itself, as you mentioned, is actually, as the name would imply, the Operations Checkout Building is actually operational facility, so it's got both uh, hardware labs and office space, and it's kind of like shaped, if you imagine, like a giant H, and then the sort of lower right part of the H, uh, the third floor, that's the crew quarters section of the building. Um, but the rest of the building uh, has everything from, uh, you know, commercial crew, our Dragon and Starliner work going on. Um, there's part of the Orion assembly that goes on there, so it's actually kind of a, a cool place to walk around. Granted, the crew can't do that in quarantine, um, but the, the other folks who are helping with escorts uh, can also check in on uh, some of the different programs going along um, that are happening here at Kennedy Space Center, so it's a nice consolidated place to be. And then in those crew quarters, they also have work facilities, uh, a small gym, uh, because when you're in quarantine, you don't have the option to leave, so it's a basically a self-contained hotel with everything you would need to, to be able to be there for, for the days prior to launch. Yeah, talk to me about how the crew has been in quarantine living at crew quarters now for two weeks, more than two weeks. Yeah, so they, uh, they actually start soft quarantine back in Houston. Um, so they and then any of the members of the immediate family who we'll see later on tonight that go into quarantine with them, that starts back in Houston. And then when it gets closer to launch, they fly down to uh, Kennedy and then move into the actual, what they call hard quarantine at uh, at the ONC building in the crew quarters. And from that point on, they're completely isolated uh, from everyone else. They do some other events. They do the wet dress rehearsal. Um, they'll do some pad tours, things like that. But all those things will always be uh, blocked off from other people or, or kept in you know, safe distances. And that's all, uh, all protocols from pre-COVID. So it has nothing to do with just COVID. That's uh, a long history, decades worth of us uh, trying to avoid getting pathogens, viruses, bacteria, really anything um, that doesn't belong in space uh, other than the human up to up to the space station. Right, and now here we are inside the suit-up room where we see our three astronauts and one cosmonaut standing, getting ready to get seated in the same configuration of seats that they'll sit in in Dragon, right? Exactly, yeah, so you'll see uh, uh, Matt and Mike are on the top half of the screen and then Jeanette and Alexander on the, the bottom half. Um, we're getting to see a little bit more than we did yesterday, so yeah. you saw Alexander kind of fist punching so he's working his fingers into the gloves um, and then you can see Matt's uh, there's two zippers there an orange and a white zipper mm -hmm. so the orange zipper is the pressure garment and that's why he's got just two people just verified that visually that it's closed he'll tuck that in with the uh, the velcro and then the white zipper is the outer garment zipper um, and so the but you saw Matt and then both of the SpaceX techs all visually verified that orange zipper um, when you pull it closed, there's a white tooth, and that's how you know it's completely sealed. And so that's what they're visually looking at. And then uh, Maddie, who's the SpaceX tech there with the uh, iPad, is kind of running the show here in the suit-up room. Now, as we see Alexander and Jeanette taking a seat, question, how long does it take to put on the suit? Um, so we actually train uh, for one of, the, one of the emergency areas we train for is what's called a, a mask to suit transition. So the crews are able to do that pretty quickly uh, on the order of single digit number of minutes. Um, mm. Because in the capsule, there's times when you'll, a lot of the time you'll have to suit off. Mm. Um, but you will have to potentially put it on for some, if there's this a... This is LD on countdown one with a T-minus four hour situational awareness briefing. We are currently counting down to a teaser of 0353 UTC, 225338 local, with an instantaneous window. The crew has started suit donning and lead checks in preparation to begin ingress activities, and the advanced team is currently on the way to the pad. Vehicle gases are at me up, FTS checkouts are complete, and Dragon prop tanks are pressed. Weather all, overall looks much better than yesterday, with launch weather at a 25% probability of violation for flight through precip and anvil clouds. 
current trends over the last hour appear to be more favorable. Ascent risk winds are much better than yesterday, but we'll continue to monitor precipitation in the staging area up until L minus one hour. In the kind of scrub, the next available launch attempt will be tomorrow, March 4th. Procedure 52911 is open in the event of a crew contingency from ingress through launch. As a reminder, the launch escape system will be armed prior to propellant load today. Hangar X is going to lock down at T minus 45 minutes and will last until a spacecraft separation or after the launch escape system is disarmed. All personnel requested to stay in their location until lockdown is complete. And CE, the other report on Falcon 9 Health. Falcon 9 is healthy and tracking no issues at this time, ready to proceed. And MD. Dragon team is looking good over here. Dragon is healthy and ready to proceed. All right, copy all. And this will conclude the T minus four hour brief, unless there's any further questions. All right, that was just the T minus four hour situational awareness brief, confirming again that we are go for launch uh, at 10.53 and 38 seconds Eastern time. Weather, again, much better. You heard them just reporting that out. 75% go, much more favorable than yesterday, as well as the ascent uh, corridor weather, much better. Uh, but they will be watching uh, precipitation uh, and other conditions there until the T minus one hour mark. Falcon 9 is healthy. Dragon is healthy. So right now, I think we're in a good spot. Roger, yeah, what do you think? Sounds good. Um, as you heard there, the, the precip in the staging area is the thing they're watching the ascent corridor, uh, which is better than yesterday, which also had some wind uh, and wave issues. So today it's just uh, more of watching, the, watching that rain and uh, as that moves out. And as the night goes on, hopefully that continues to improve. So that's the trend they'll continue to watch. And so we're taking a look at Dominic laughing inside his suit right now. He's getting his suit pressure checked, right? He is, yeah. So you asked about how long it takes to get in the suit. It's a, it's a few minutes. Um, that's uh, if in an off nominal case. So when they're doing it for this, they take a little bit longer just to make sure everything's uh, in the best config it can and everything is comfortable. Um, but uh, yeah, it's actually it's it's meant to self-don, so you don't need two people to do it like you do with the, the EMUs, which are the extracurricular mobility units we use for spacewalk. So these are, are self-donning. Um, and we talked a little bit yesterday about you can see how his uh, knees are starting to puff up, so the suit's mm -hmm. starting to inflate. So once they go visors down, that's when the gas starts flowing and it starts to pressurize. Um, and it's actually unlike, so unlike the, the spacewalk suits that we use that have their own internal closed loop CO2 removal, the SpaceX suits, they actually are leaking in the sense that the, the gas that's flowing is actually coming out. And so that's actually what's scrubbing out the CO2. Um, as the crew members exhaling, so air comes out, but air doesn't go back in, if that Got makes it. sense. Yep. But there's, so there's a regulator that maintains that, um, basically that pressure, and that's, you'll see his uh, um, arms and legs inflate. And why don't we take some time now to introduce you to Matt Dominic, our commander. He was born and raised in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Married to Faith Dominic, and they have two daughters. Matt earned a Master of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School and was designa designated a Naval Aviator in 2007. He made two deployments to the North Arabian Sea, flying close air support missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. He has more than 1,600 hours of flight time in 28 different aircraft, 400 carrier arrested landings, and 61 combat missions. This is going to be his first space flight. Yeah, and and uh, like we talked about yesterday, uh, Megan, the other important thing about Matt is he's a turtle. So as a fellow turtle of uh, the class of 2017, uh, great to see another one going to space. He'll join Jaws and Laurel, who are up there now. Um, so there'll be uh, three of them on board. But um, great to see Matt flying. He is, uh, he is always uh, one of the most hilarious people in any room you're in, <laughs> but also one of the most technically competent um, and just knows how to get the job done. So I'm excited to see him commanding this mission and heading up to join uh, the rest of the crew up on the ISS. And as his uh, pressure check was completed, we have pilot Michael Barrett sitting next to him. He was selected by NASA in 2000. He's the only one of Crew 8 who's been to space before. He was part of uh, Expedition 1920 in 2009 and STS-133 in 2011. In total, he spent 212 days in space. He is board certified in internal and aerospace medicine. He has actually been awarded numerous times for his contributions to space medicine research. Michael lives in League City, Texas with his wife, Michelle, and they have five children. 
personal and recreational interests, we talked about this yesterday, uh, include sailing, boat restoration, writing, and cooking food in harsh or remote places. He said austere, specifically. Yeah, and Mike and Michelle are great, and uh, you mentioned he's the, the one on the crew with the previous space flight experience and, and couldn't have a better mentor for the rest of the crew. Um, and I know that because he was my mentor during ASCAN training, so he's just a, a great human. I'd be curious to see if the suit techs would unzip one of his zippers for us, but I'm guessing he's got snacks hidden in one of those <laughs> pockets uh, because, as you mentioned, he is uh, infamous or famous as it may be for both cooking in austere conditions but for also being consistently supplied with snacks. Um, and, uh, yeah, you mentioned it, he... If you Google him, uh, he is the person that writes the book uh, on flight medicine, space flight medicine. So if you are a space flight medicine student, uh, you surely know his work because that's the book you're studying from. So he's very prepared, will be very valuable up there for snacks and also if anyone gets sick. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> All right, and now this is mission specialist Jeanette Epps we're taking a look at. This will also be her first space flight. The Syracuse, New York native was a NASA fellow during graduate school and then worked for Ford Motor Company, where she received a U.S. patent for her research into auto collisions and countermeasure systems. After leaving Ford, she joined the Central Intelligence Agency for seven years, and she worked as a technical intelligence officer before becoming an astronaut in 2006. She has a Master of Science and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Aerospace Engineering, and Raja, she's also a twin. She is indeed, yeah. So I'm pretty sure it's her, though, in the suit-up room. I, think, I don't think they would have been able to get it this far. Um, but yeah, Jeanette's uh, actually, uh, I can't talk about much of what she did before she showed up at NASA, but uh, based on where she worked. Um, but uh, since she's been at NASA, she's actually got some pretty unique experiences in the sense that uh, she's obviously flying on a Dragon tonight, but she actually worked a lot with a Starliner. So she's one mm -hmm. of the few people in the office who's seen uh, both of our new vehicles that are that are U.S. built uh, heading to the space station. So both the Boeing and the Dragon, uh, which is a pretty cool experience. Um, it, I think uh, one uh, thing I can talk about her background, she's an amazing innovator. Um, so we had a T-38 flight, and I'll keep it short, but uh, basically we had to uh, figure out a way to get something. Uh, there was really windy, so something got blown down the intake while we were in outbase, and she helped with the, the tech out of the outbase figure out a way to get it off the get it out from inside the engine. So we can talk more about it later, but we'll let them keep watching the suit up here. Wow, yeah, really accomplished uh, our whole team actually. And let's introduce you to our last crew eight member here. So this is Alexandra Grabenkin, mission specialist, also a first time flyer graduated from the Irkutska Military Aerospace Engineering Institute in 2002, majoring in the engineering, maintenance, and repair of aircraft radio navigation systems. He then attended the Moscow Technical University of Communications and Informatics, graduating with a degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. He was accepted into the Cosmonaut Corps in 2018 and will serve as flight engineer while on board the space station. We're getting a close-up view of him right there. Visor's up, so I believe his pressure check was also completed. Yep, yeah, so Alexander uh, is in the, one of the newer groups of the cosmonaut classes, and just a testament to the continuing partnership. Uh, Laurel's up on the space station now. She got up there via Soyuz. Uh, Alexander will be heading up uh, via Dragon, so continuing to, to learn from him and work with one another. And so right now, we talked about this a little bit before, but for those who might be joining us for this broadcast and they, they weren't with us yesterday, so right now, it seems like they have some downtime here and they're kind of hanging out. And why is that, Raja? So they build in time. So the whole purpose of, of this, what we're seeing right now in the suit up room is to leak check the suits. Uh, they'll do it again when they get inside the Dragon, but if there's a problem then it has much, it can have the potential to have uh, delays to the launch. Whereas here they have all the equipment. You can see there's a lot of people. It's easy to move around. Uh, so anything that doesn't pass on the suit leak checks, they have the ability to fix it. And so because of that, they build in the assumption of a failed leak check when they build the timeline for this. Um, Maddie there, who's the one with the iPad, has mm -hmm. uh, almost like a, a quarterback has the cuff checklist on her uh, left hand there. So she's got the timeline um, and then is running everything. But yeah, they build in extra time so that if they did have to fix a part, swap a component, they would have time to do that now. And so in the case where it looks like uh, everyone's suit leaks checked past on the first attempt, then you've got a little bit of time left um, to just relax a little bit. Uh, get on cooling. So right now they're umbilicals. They're not on the mobile uh, cooling units yet. Um, I, I can't tell oh, actually. I don't see it, yeah. um, but so right now this is a good chance uh, to kind of get their met rates down, get their core body temperature down because uh, once they get outside in the hot, humid Florida air, 
uh, in a suit, it can get warm fast. So oh, sure. this lets them cool off. Um, it's also a chance for them to catch up with these the SpaceX folks you're seeing here, uh, 1134, and then I can't see his number, but Rick on the far end. The, there's lots of different families the, uh, the astronauts work with. There's obviously their families, um, the, you know, their loved ones. There's a SpaceX family. There's a mission control family. There's an ISS family. Uh, and so every one of those families is special. They've been working with these people for about 18 to 24 months. And specifically, you know, Rick, uh, Maddie, and, and Haley are ones they see a lot. And then this is a shot actually of the astronaut support person, right? So yep. wearing number 21, the one is covered there, but number 21, that is Denise Burnham. And she is a NASA astronaut candidate, graduating actually in two days. And what's her role here? Yeah, so Denise is what we call the ASP, which is the astronaut support person. Um, in the shuttle era, they used to call it the Cape Crusaders, but essentially it's the person that uh, is the eyes and ears of the crew as they're setting up in the final stages for the launch. So she's been in quarantine with them. Um, and in the shuttle era, it would involve being the person, the only other person besides the crew that would go inside and configure switches. What Denise will do, as what has been doing this whole time in quarantine, um, as the schedule shift and as there's different meetings and launch, like the weather briefs, all those mm -hmm. kind of things. Uh, if the crew is unable to make those things as their schedule shifting, she is covering all that. The other, you'll see the very public thing she'll do later on is call uh, from the, the phone on the pad. Uh, but the thing you won't see uh, when they cut the feed here is all the little things. So like getting glasses ready, uh, if like someone has a timer, if they like where exactly on their leg they want the iPad positioned. Hmm. So all those things seem very little, but um, after so many sims, you kind of have a scan or we call it a, cr a cockpit cross check. And it's very kind of particular of where you want all those different things, where you want maybe, like I said, like a timer located, as you can see, where you want your watch. Um, and so she's kind of like the expert and knows for each person exactly how they want it configured to include, you know, Jeanette maybe wants her volume set at whatever on this loop and, and having all that preset. So when they get into the Dragon, things are ready to go. And I do want to point out that everybody else who's in a black suit, SpaceX employees. Correct. Yep. The only the ninjas, person. Yep. yep. The only person um, who's a NASA employee in a black suit is Denise. Correct. Yep. Yeah, and you can see the uh, the other folks uh, in the room. So that there's um, they're in uh, in crew quarters, um, and they're basically just watching the clock at, at this point. Yeah, and you were saying um, that it is more comfortable for them to be sitting because the suits kind of scrunch exactly, them down. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah, I mentioned that yesterday, but forgot to bring it up again tonight. So um, they're not just lounging. It's actually a, a, mm -hmm. a physical uh, uh, reason they're laying there. So you saw when they did the pressure checks, the helmets expand. Um, and the reason uh, they are very tight is because you want to have expansion and you don't want you still want to be able to see it out of the visor when it's pressurized, but that means when it's not pressurized, like right now, if you were to stand up, it kind of hunches you over, and you'll see that mm -hmm. both when they stand up here, and it's really obvious when they uh, go out to the pad and they're trying to look up at the rocket, it's, sure. it, you have to lean backwards, and so it puts pressure on your head and on your shoulders and, and back. So the, the longer you can be in a reclined position, the, the more comfortable it is. Right, because they're in this room until about three hours and 24 minutes, so they have quite some time. They're ahead of schedule. Again, no problem there. Yeah, which is great news. You can see uh, that little blue thing that was dangling outside Jeanette's helmet is her earpiece. Um, and so the reason they haven't popped out is since they're not getting calm through the umbilical, they're talking to people in the room. Mm -hmm. So they have one out, one in in most cases, so they can hear the conversations of the people talking to them. Um, but they still usually will have one in so that there is anything they, when they do the, the umbilical checks, when they're doing the, those suit leak pressure checks, they're talking to them through the earpieces. So it's kind of a 50-50, a so they can hear both. Really cool insight. I didn't know that. I didn't know that they got comms, but. All right, so I have a question for you as we take a look at Matt and Mike there. How long has this crew trained together? Uh, so between 18 and 24 months is the whole training flow. It kind of depends on um, whether you're doing a backup flow or not. But it's not just the Dragon training. So uh, as you're seeing some different shots here, that's the SATA chamber. So you can see Mike and Jeanette suiting up uh, Matt, so practicing all the ops that would go along with that. Um, we use the T-38 as a great analog because it involves uh, you know, talking to another person, having to work together as a crew, talking to a ground control station. This is the ISS simulator in Building 9 at Johnson Space Center, where we spend a lot of time doing space station um, training for both nominal and off-nominal scenarios. Um, Jeanette's working on some of the science payloads you'll see, so that's part of it is 
anticipating what science we're going to be doing on the, on the space station, because that's the whole reason we're there, is to do science. And so being familiar with that before we show up. This is a shot out at Hawthorne, um, which is where the, the high fidelity trainer, also called the Buck, is at, that, uh, that trains the inside of the Endeavour capsule they'll be in today. Hmm. And so that's uh, so those are kind of the big elements, but all those things are happening over the, the 18 to 24 months prior to launch to, to include robotics training, uh, they'll do spacewalk training, so that's all continuing as well. But also just learning about each other, right? Like the camaraderie, but also like learning maybe what people like to do, don't like to do, how they respond to things, right? Exactly, and that's probably the biggest piece of it. Um, there's the technical side of the training, but there's also the soft skills and the team building that happens. Uh, and at this point, um, knowing how to read when someone's uh, you know, stressed or has bandwidth to, to deal with something if it's an nominal situation. So you spend a lot of time in sims uh, kind of debriefing how things went and then trying to adjust going forward. You see some of the other folks in there in the top center of the screen is mm -hmm. Shannon Walker and uh, Norm Knight. So Shannon's the deputy chief of the astronaut office and then Norm's the chief of the flight operations directorate. Um, and so they also have been in quarantine this whole time. To the uh, left of Denise is Piotr, who was uh, on the space station up with me, spent a year up there at Cosmonaut, and so he's down here with Alexanders, uh, also has been in quarantine with him. And it looks like they are on the, uh, the mobile cooling units now. And those mobile uh, cooling units are those blue boxes that we see tethered to them, right? They are, yep. They're uh, very similar technology to what was used uh, early in the space program. Um, it's kind of rebuilt on the inside, but this, you know, it was a good concept then. It's still a good concept now, but uh, that allows them to continue to get cooling um, as they go, uh, as they start walking out and go out into the Teslas. You can tell everyone that Raja is very knowledgeable. And so we are inviting you to challenge him with your questions. Over the next four and a half hours, jump on X, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, and send in your question with the hashtag AskNASA. We look forward to hearing from you and answering as many questions as we can live. We got some good ones yesterday. Yeah, let's see if we, see if we can come up with any stumpers. And one other programming note. So um, right now, you'll notice that Raja and I are just commentating um, off camera, just audio commentary for now. But about an hour before launch, we plan to expand our coverage. We're going to introduce you to more commentators from SpaceX and NASA. And then at that point, we're going to come on camera. And for that last, again, hour before liftoff, and then until our uh, three astronauts and one cosmonaut are in orbit, we will walk you through all that action. So I should say, uh, so at four hours, you heard the, the voice of, well, I'll, uh, I'll hold off here. So just uh, getting up, um, you can see what I was talking about before. You can see Mike is hunched over um, from that, the helmet weight and the mm. suit weight. Mm -hmm. So at this point, uh, the suits themselves, uh, their, gloves are, their, their hands are still in the gloves. When you've done the pressure checks, you can see the visors can go up and down. They are allowed to take their hands in and out of the gloves as well um, because they are going to do another pressure check. And so that's just kind of crew preference if they're getting warm or not. Mm. Um, they, what they generally don't want to have to do is get out of a suit completely because that would then raise some concern of whether that, the leak check they did, you know, could, anything could change. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing they're doing now is uh, we talked about a little bit yesterday. There's some Velcro tabs and hooks underneath different parts of the suit. Mm -hmm. And so those allow them to basically make it flush so that as they get into the spacecraft, straps don't get caught uh, or cords don't get tangled and anything like that. So it's mostly just a half ergonomic, um, half just to keep things clean. And while it looks like they're posing for some photos there in the suit of room, why don't we talk a little bit about their day so far before they got in here? So after yesterday's scrub, we talked about this, Raja, in the interest of sleep shifting, and we'll talk a little bit about that after I go through this. They went to bed at 2 a.m. Eastern time and then woke up at 11 uh, a.m. today. They had breakfast, more like lunch, again, sleep shifting, <laughs> followed by a workout and some family time. And then lunch and dinner moved up 22 minutes from yesterday. They had that about 4.10. Medical checks, other flight day preps. Now they're suiting up and are about to play a card game. They are. So it's a, a long-standing tradition um, with the chief of the astronaut office playing with the crew uh, prior to heading out to launch. Deputy today. Deputy chief, yeah. 
And I think uh, we talked a little bit yesterday. I think the, the really important part about this is the fact that the leadership is there. And, and you might say, well, why is the deputy there? Where is the chief? So the chief of the astronaut office, Joe Akaba, is actually coming back from the Pacific Ocean. So he was out oh. there uh, doing a massive uh, training event with the U.S. Navy with the Artemis II crew, practicing and recovering them. So, so it looks like she split the deck. Yep. She's now dealing. And the point of this card game is so that the commander loses, to use up his bad luck so that he proceeds with good luck, the team, the whole team proceeds with good luck through launch and their whole mission. I think he did not lose, <laughs> so we're redealing. <laughs> Do you recognize this card game, Raja? So it can change uh, from crew to crew, so I'm not exactly sure. It looks like maybe they're going high card. And, and I think Mike won. Mm -hmm. And this is really a moment of levity, right? Like before. Yeah, especially if everything, uh, if everything's on timeline. Like look at the case tonight; they didn't have any suit issues. Um, you know, they're uh, ahead on a timeline, so it's actually a, a nice chance to just kind of hang out and relax again with the the people who supported you and worked with you, not just these last few weeks, but um, really the last 18 to 24 months. Hmm. If it is high card, <laughs> I thought it looked like you lost, but. Well, well, you can like tell by the, by, the, by the fact he's laughing, which is not unusual for, for Matt. <laughs> I, I think at this point they're just having some fun. Looks like it's down to just Shannon and Matt. Mm. Traditions are important, right? They are, and like I said, I think it's, it's really, um, I know Norm, Joe, and Shannon are all very passionate about making sure that they are in quarantine all the time for, for all these, these missions. Um, I had the chance uh, with the scrub to to meet with the administrator staff um, yesterday uh. and, today. and um, yeah, the, the amount of support and vigilance that goes into human space flights, uh, both impressive and warranted. Yeah, and it looks like he <laughs> lost, but there were cheers. It's, it's a very <laughs> counterintuitive, but, but the idea is, is a really nice one and again, a nice moment for the crew to do something with each other before they really get into the motions of this timeline and counting down to yep. liftoff. You can see the, the camera behind Matt, their patch is on the wall there. So one of the other traditions they would have done probably uh, yesterday since it would have been before they suited up is sign around that patch on the wall back there. And then you can see the stickers out just kind of off to the left that are the stickers of the previous crews, so the, the signatures of them around there. Yeah, we actually have video of them doing that. Oh, gotcha. You jump there the you go. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, should, okay. I should read the script. <laughs> um, so this is Matt. He's holding the crew eight patch, like he said. He stuck it onto the wall there as part of a tradition that's been happening. That's why you see all this number of patches that Raja mentioned. And then there's all their signatures. Also patches line the outer rim of the doors that they will soon walk out of. That's yeah. scheduled for T minus three hours and 20 minutes. So still a little bit to go. And you can see a lot more patches, a lot more history coming out of that door. Like you mentioned earlier, Megan, uh, been doing that since Apollo 7 walking out of that door. And so uh, you'll, if, um, if you ever get the chance to go out there, you'll see shuttle patches um, and yeah, a long lineage of, of patches. And there's a wider view of the, the folks that are waiting for the walkout. And when we get a live shot, we're going to see three Teslas lined up. And we will have Matt and Mike, commander and pilot. They'll get into the second Tesla. And then we will have the mission specialists in the last Tesla. So this is a gathering of media that are here to cover the crew walkout, obviously, but also family and friends, select family and friends, yep. though. Yeah, and you can see, tell there's kind of like three rows, if you will. So the, the aftmost one is the people who haven't been in any kind of quarantine, the you know general public press. Mm -hmm. um, that intermediate one is extended family who maybe weren't able to go into hard quarantine. And then the f furthest up one, closest to the crew, uh, are the immediate family who've been in quarantine with them and then their, their escorts. And so. Um, you can see there's some blue flight suits down there at the far right, it's Jessica Watkins, so she's escorting uh, Matt's family. Uh, Jess Whitner uh, is just to the left of her. She's in the new class, also graduating in a few days with Denise, um, and escorting Jeanette's um, uh, family members. And then I can't quite see off camera, I think uh, probably to the right is uh, Steve Bowen, who's escorting Mike Barrett's family members. 
And then further right, you'll see later, um, the other people that are in this group are the, the NASA administrator uh, and some other senior leaders who um, have been down here supporting the crew and out to see launch. Now, we asked folks to send in some questions for you, Raja, and of course, they're sending questions in. We love that. Excellent. So let's pull up our first Ask NASA question. This is from Sebastian yeah, Baccaro on YouTube asking, do you have a cooling garment under that suit? Your suit? Uh, I'm no, assuming I, the crew suit. I'm not, yeah, so I'm <laughs> assuming you're talking about the IV suit. So, um, so uh, yes and no. So the suits you're seeing in the room they're in, there's no cooling garment in that. So it's basically a, like a black spandex, um, like dry fit type material that they're wearing. Um, and there's the shot you can see Administrator Nelson in the, he's the one with the jeans with his back towards us. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Free is the senior um, civil servant at NASA. He's in the Associate Administrator of uh, NASA, yep. yeah. Uh, glasses. And then Pam Melroy, just to the right of the administrator, is the deputy administrator. Yeah. Um, so the, they're in, once the crew comes out, Administrator Nelson will go behind that first stanchion. Um, and then forward of them is where the immediate families will be at. Yeah, it's always nice to see NASA leadership here supporting, again, this continuation of NASA's commercial crew program, a very successful program that's sending uh, astronauts uh, to the International Space Station really every six months yeah, from U.S. soil. It's, a, it's pretty impressive. And yeah, to answer your, the suit question, so the, in the SpaceX IV suit, which stands for in-vehicle suit, there's not a cooling garment. There is airflow, and so it's the basically the convection of that airflow that takes heat off the body, and then uh, I mentioned before that the air actually comes out, and so that's what keeps you cool. In the EVA suits, or the extravehicular activity suits that we wear for spacewalks, those do have liquid cooling garments, um, and so in that case, it's water that's actively going through tubes in the suit hmm. and then going through a sublimator to vacuum to, to chill it. Um, and it just has to do with the workload and the MET rate. So in the IV suit, it's not really meant to do a spacewalk. You're, it's meant to be still strapped in and restrained in the seat because you saw when they were doing those suit checks how their arms and legs kind of puffed out. Mm -hmm. And so it's not meant to really be mobile. It's just meant to protect you to get home. And so meaning that you're not really working very hard and getting very hot, whereas in the EMU, the which we do on spacewalks, you're absolutely working very hard. And so for hours. You, for, yeah, and so you need something to, to basically offload the heat from your body. So very different kinds of suits. Exactly. So again, these are the two Teslas that they will be getting in for their ride to the pad. And the license plate, always fun to see. Yay, space. Yep, so uh, continuing a tradition that I learned about a year ago of uh, always incorporating the number of the crew into the license plate. And, and Tom Marshburn, uh, who was my pilot on Crew 3, hooked me up last night when I <laughs> had my own senior moment and couldn't remember my <laughs> own license plate uh, and sent me a photo of our stars, but send it with the three being the E. Yep. And then some other ones, uh, the most recent ones. So Crew 7 was by, so there wasn't a 7 <laughs> in it, but it was seven letters, so B-Y. E, 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 <laughs> E, <laughs> I forgot one E. And then Crew 6, his license plate was Dragon. Um, the G was a 6. And then for Crew 5, it was Blast Off and a 5 for the S. So, again, fun moments that we like to incorporate into the mission. And here we have Jessica Watkins, NASA oh. astronaut, playing with, I think those are Matt's daughters, they are, right? yeah. And so uh, one of, it's not just the crew that's having to sleep shift, it's uh, families that have to sleep shift. And so I know from my own experience that sleep shifting three kids and, or two in Matt's case can be challenging. So and actually, uh, Wadi is helping out, I'm sure, with that. The youngest daughter there who's playing with Wadi, as you said, it was her birthday on Thursday. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's her birthday on Tuesday. Thursday, awesome. sorry. <laughs> The person to right, to the right of uh, Wadi Morgan has the, has the mask hanging down. So she's there's a whole team of family support folks in, in the astronaut office that also help as well, and they just do an amazing job with the coordinating all this. You can imagine like keeping track of who can be where and who can get so close to the crew or not close to the crew. Uh, so this whole week, actually, she and a team have been um, helping with extended family, doing events, um, trying to let everyone be as much a part of this as they can, but also keeping the crew safe and healthy. Mm -hmm. And it's also nice, right, to feel like the whole office is supporting your family um, as, as you have a loved one who's about to go into space. Yeah, it's, there's no question it's probably the most important job we have in our office other than mm -hmm. being on the rocket. The next most important thing is taking care of the families uh, whose loved ones are on the rocket. 
So T minus three hours, 30 minutes. About six minutes until we expect to see the astronauts again, but they will be walking down the hall into an elevator and then out the doors under the sign with their names on it and their mission patch that you see towards the middle of your screen, the back of it. People are actually walking out of those doors right now. Yeah, so they'll start setting up the cars. You'll see some of the SpaceX folks start coming out. You'll see the flight docks probably come out, so they'll be wearing blue flight suits and head to the aft vehicles. Um, like we mentioned before, the so at this point, Denise, the ASP, is actually helping do all that final configuration for them. Um, so kind of getting things arranged in their pockets, um, doing some probably coordination with anyone that's out of the pad right now, of, you know, what state the vehicle's in, things like that. So all that's kind of happening in the background before they come walking out here. As you can see, we have a camera ready, so we won't miss it. And we'll be bringing you that walk live. Yep. And so for context, you're, you're staring down basically half of the hallway of crew quarters. It goes behind the camera as well. But this view, the, the suit up room is about halfway down the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. And then in the far distance, you can see like wooden doors. Um, that's the medical uh, area. And then beyond that uh, are essentially like, like the hotel, like, like little hotel rooms, um, dorm room type things. Uh, and then on the right side, there's a conference room along the way. That's where, where they would have got the weather brief uh, earlier this evening. Yeah, I've never been in there, but I did look it up, and I was like, wow, it's a, there's a lot in there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty large, I mean, it's, it's maybe half lodging, and the other half is workspace, conference facilities. Uh, you need to have your own washer and dryer, you know, because you can't tend to close anywhere else. You, got, you have to wash it <laughs> all in quarantine since you can't leave. Uh, a pretty sizable set of refrigerators and kitchens because, again, you have to pack for at least 14 days worth of quarantine. Um, so it's kind of like a giant camping trip uh, where you can't go, <laughs> you can't leave. Sizable crowd out here as we take an aerial shot from our flight ops team here at Kennedy. Yeah, and the other, the other folks you're not seeing uh, with the, the NASA administrator leadership that are on hand and got a chance to meet with them um, yesterday after the, after the scrub uh, were some FAA folks who are on hand. And um, huge kudos to the FAA and all the work they do um, for the licensing and all the deconfliction that has to happen. If you think about the fact that this rocket's going up the eastern seaboard, that means planes can't be there. And so mm -hmm. um, they are constantly doing that, and, and as well and on all of our Artemis development programs. So, um, they are a big piece of the, the government effort to do this. All right, we have another question on social media. This is Jenny on Instagram, and she asks, what meal did you guys, the crew, have before flight? I uh, know this answer. Yeah. So you have it for that? You have it for, yeah, I think uh, Megan's got the answer for them, and I can talk about what we had for, for Crew 3. If, yeah, sure. What did you have for the Crew 3? Well, for, uh, so we actually got to have two, because we had a... <laughs> which is unusual since we had a pretty significant launch delay. Uh, so what uh, the great thing we did on our second one, though, was have a, a group meal. Um, so I think it was actually Thai food mm. with key lime pie, I think. That so sounds little, yummy. Yeah, it was delicious. Now I'm actually pretty hungry. I'm very hungry, <laughs> so yes. No more questions about food. Uh, <laughs> I have a banana. That's literally all I have for you. <laughs> um, you said ultimate meals. I do just want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about that. Why is it called the ultimate meal? So we avoid calling it the last meal for obvious reasons, because it's not your last meal, and it's just uh, your ultimate meal before you, you leave. And uh, really the difference with that meal from the other meals you have in crew course, all of them are made by the staff um, and everything has to be checked before it can come into the facility since we're in quarantine. Um, but the majority, well, all the meals uh, are basically everyone's eating the same thing. So they'll make whatever the menu is. That's what everyone has. But the ultimate meal, basically each crew member can re like request the specific thing they want, and then they'll make that for that particular meal. And so for pilot Mike Barrett, his ultimate meal was grilled salmon and veggies. Commander Matt Dominic, he said he'll have whatever Mike's having uh, because he trusts Mike's uh, culinary expertise. <laughs> then we have mission specialist Jeanette, uh, Jeanette F. She asked for butter chicken. And then Alexander asked for nothing special, soup, meat, and veggies. I'm even more hungry. <laughs> All right, we are now looking at one minute and 43 seconds away from when we expect to see crew eight walking down the hallway. He'll take an elevator down and then out the ONC doors to this crowd of folks wanting to wish them good luck for their six month mission to the International Space Station. So just to the left, to Jim Freeze left is Vanessa Weiss, who's mm, the center mm -hmm. director at Johnson Space Center. And then you can see uh, Pam Melroy talking with uh, Mike Barrett's family. 
All right, here they come. All right, here they come in front. Matt and Mike, commander and pilot, and now we have the mission specialist, Alexander and Jeanette. Applause from folks around them as they walk down the hallway here in crew quarters and are getting inside an elevator, their first few steps before their big trip. And this is kind of a cool surprise. Uh, I don't know if they got this far yesterday since we didn't to cut the feed, but I at least didn't know that there'd be that banner in there when we got in the elevator yeah, with all the signatures. So it's a really cool thing. Was um, as soon as the doors close and the cameras now, you can turn around and see all the signatures of all the folks that you worked with on that banner, which is kind of a, a really touching time. And like I said, the surprise factor we didn't know it was there. And actually, yeah, that's a, a good note to point out from yesterday. So yesterday, they decided to stand down from the launch attempt right before this moment, actually. We were waiting uh, for Crew 8 to walk uh, down the hallway when the launch director came onto the mission audio loops, and you guys heard that uh, live for yourselves, and that's when they said that they were standing down um, from yesterday's launch attempt because of elevated winds of the ascent corridor. But again, we are looking much better today and i think we're going to see a launch the launch weather officers telling the team a little bit before the t minus four hour mark that it's looking like a good day to fly now we are expecting the crew to walk out in about three minutes and 30 seconds it doesn't take them that long to get there, right, Raja? But again, we're sticking to a very strict timeline. Right. Everything has got pad built into it, and then it's sort of like a funnel. The closer and closer you get to actual launch, there's less ability to have that pad. And so um, you build that in. So if there was a problem, then you don't have to rush on the end because, as you heard him call it at the very beginning, it's an instantaneous launch window. Um, and that comes out of the fact that the Falcon 9 is fueled on the pad, and the, the fuel immediately starts to boil off. Um, do the temperatures and so unlike some launch vehicles where you can sit there for a while and have launch holds that's not something you do with the Falcon 9 so mm -hmm. um, at the time it's got to go it's got to go so they build these pads in instead of having launch holds they build this pad in uh, and that's it's essentially the equivalent it gets you the equivalent effect without actually stopping the clock sure and this is unique to SpaceX it is yep yeah You said this yesterday, but it looks like we, we might be running out of space on, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the on right the, the right-hand side of the door frame there is, uh, you can see it's the recent SpaceX mission, so um, I can spot mine easily, but uh, so it's three down from the top right, there's three, and then four, five, six, seven, and eight, and yeah, I think we got maybe two spots left, then we got to go below the railing or, or jump over to the left side, um, so I'm sure they'll come up with something. <laughs> we might but, have to add another NASA meatball sign on the door. <laughs> it's a good problem to it have, is, right? Yeah. Right? With all the space flights that are happening uh, from here at Kennedy again. Yeah, we talked about yesterday was the, the five year anniversary of the Demo 1 mission. Right. And so to, yeah, yeah it, it's kind of mind boggling when you think about how much has changed in human commercial space flight here in the United States in the last five years, where in that short period of time, we went from not having the ability to get our astronauts to space on our own to now we're on the eighth operational rotation of a commercial vehicle, it's it's pretty uh, pretty amazing. One where the booster flies itself back, one where we use the capsule, we use the booster. Tonight it's a new booster, but um, this is the fifth time we're using the Endeavour capsule, which is also a record, so just uh, amazing. Yeah, it's a real testament to what we can accomplish when we put our minds to it. I mean, we created this commercial crew program uh, to partner with commercial companies so that we can do this more frequently and reliable. Yep, you're absolutely right. And it has been a partnership from the beginning. One of the things uh, we'll see later tonight, we'll, we'll talk about the team in Hawthorne, we'll talk about the team in Houston, but what a lot of folks don't realize is actually a whole other team in a place called Hangar X over on the Cape side that is chock full of NASA engineers from Marshall, from Johnson, from Kennedy, who are looking at the telemetry streams and working with the SpaceX teams on the status of the launch vehicle. As you can see, our camera is focused in on the doors out of the operations and checkout building here at Kennedy, because in less than 30 seconds, we expect Crew 8 to walk out and greet a crowd of folks here, hoping to wish them well on their trip.
You can see some faces behind the window there, so it looks like they're on time. Here they come, Crew 8, taking their first steps outside before their journey to the International Space Station. We hear some cheers, cheers yep. some waving. From left to right, let me introduce you. We have mission specialist Alexandra Grubenkin. Then we have pilot Michael Barrett, commander Matt Dominic, and mission specialist Jeanette Epps. They're walking now to uh, greet family and friends who came specifically for them. They have assigned spots with assigned stanchions of people. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So what you'll see is that they won't go any further down towards where the administrator is standing, so that's as close as they'll get to them since they have been in quarantine, and then their families, the immediate families are staying behind the stanchions there. And then once they get in the vehicles, <laughs> the, uh, the families that have been quarantined will come up to the windows. Nice big wave for the camera from Alexander there. Now we have a shot of Michael. Do you recognize, are those his kids there? Or? Um, uh, well, he's the ones he's right in front of right now are the administrator. Yep. I can see the administrator, oh, yep. Nelson. I think he went to talk to them, and he's now he's going back by his kids. Yeah. Because I know he has adult children. He does, yep. Yeah, Mike's kids are adults. And I think I can see Steve and his wife, and I think his adult kids are behind Steve in the, in the second stanchion there. We're getting some audio from the feed. Let's see if we can listen in to what folks might be saying. So Haley's giving him the wrap it up, uh, number 34. Um, well, I said, like one of the key SpaceX members that the crew is very uh, familiar with, and she's kind of helping run this whole timeline. So they're going to start working towards the Teslas, and you'll see the families then come up to the windows and you'll talk to them there as well. Yeah, we are expecting them to leave the ONC here at around T minus three hours and 15 minutes. Another great cheer from the crowd. As we see Jeanette Epps taking her seat in her Tesla, she'll be joined by Alexander Grubenkin. And then in front of them, we have Matt and Mike, who just got seated as well. And then the, the people in the Teslas with them are the, the SpaceX ninjas, and usually there'll be a suit tech, and then either a flight dock or two suit techs, just kind of the mix kind of pens. But um, so you're kind of always, always ready to respond if anything is uh, having problems with the suits. And so they're also going to attach them to their umbilicals and the cooling units again. That's why we also have the second opportunity for families to go up. Correct. Yeah. So that's that's why they limit them on time, just so they don't get uh, too hot, as it is not as bad tonight. But uh, some nights can be pretty hot and humid. It's once they're in the vehicles, those cooling units are there, so they can plug back in and start getting cooling flow again. And like we mentioned before, it's much more comfortable for the crew to be sitting yeah. than it is to be standing and offloads the weight of that suit off their shoulders and head. And so the folks who are at the cars right now, they've been in quarantine. Exactly, yep, those are the, so yeah, so the, Matt's there's other extended right family, but those can't actually come up to the, the window because they haven't been in hard quarantine the whole time. Looks like Matt's wife is, yep. and the two daughters, Wadi's taking a picture of them with Matt in the car there. <laughs> so it looks like the, Mike's adult children were able to go to the front of the car, just not up to the window. You can see his wife's over there by the window, which is pretty standard. Um, again, the, only the folks that are actually in quarantine getting that uh, close enough to um, actually be talk the crew with the windows down. You know, since we did see that Matt has younger children, I know you had younger children when you flew. How did you prepare them for this moment, or how was that moment with them? Um, it's uh, it's interesting. I think each family kind of uh, deals with it their, their own way. So we talked a lot about it before and during. And now we can see the crew is departing from the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, beginning their 20-minute drive with a full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to Launch Pad 39A. In the words of their license plates, Yay, space. <laughs> now, we again want to invite those who are watching to participate by asking Raja a question here as we see the convoy hang a right. Again, they're going to be driving through Kennedy Space Center. 
Just hop on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or X. Send your question, hashtag AskNASA, and we will answer as many as we can. And as they begin their drive out, it's usually less than 20 minutes. But as we begin the drive, let's again hear from Commander Matt Dominic. Again, first space flight, but he has more than 1,600 flight hours and 61 combat missions as a naval aviator. I am most excited for the future of space flight for an inflection point that I feel is coming. If you look at the history of civilization and various inflection points, you know, things just kind of take off. I am NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic, commander, NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission to the International Space Station. I grew up in Wee Ridge, Colorado. I was the oldest of two brothers. I had two parents that were amazing in it that they encouraged my curiosity. Growing up there in the Rockies and the outdoors, there were so many things to go and do and see. I've always wanted to explore and, and satiate my curiosity for the world around me. And so I just kept pushing throughout my life. I joined the Navy because I wanted to fly airplanes, I wanted to go fast, I wanted to test airplanes. And so astronaut for me was just the next logical step in life to keep going and keep exploring and keep pushing myself further in terms of intellectual curiosity about the world around me. I've been at NASA now for about six years, and I'm super excited to fly in space. Working and training with Crew-8 is absolutely awesome. We have a diverse group of academic and intellectual backgrounds that come together, and also an international component. It is such a blast to watch the crew grow as we started training over time, to watch that team dynamics develop as we get ready to launch. We're starting to see what makes each other tick, what's important to each other. I view Crew-8 like an Olympic torchbearer. That's where I see Crew-8. We are a torchbearer on that path to the Olympics that are gonna occur in the future as we move humanity forward. We're going up there to relieve Crew-7, Crew-9 will relieve us, and we are keeping the flame of space, human presence in low Earth orbit alive. If you're a studier of science or statistics, you know that you always want to have a big N, and that just means sample size, to understand the thing you're studying. So just launching one or two or 10 or 15 people to space leaves you with a very very small sample size. So every time we launch four more people to space, we're building our sample size and our understanding of the human body and the things that happen to it in a zero gravity environment. That sets us up to go to the moon. It sets us up to go to Mars. Many folks think of NASA and they think we're using crazy cutting edge technology and all kinds of adjectives and superlatives to make space work. There's no smoke and mirrors, there's no magic. It is just hard work through the laws of physics and basic material science to get us into orbit. That's, that's the magic. We are part of a massive team of people that need to continue continuous human presence in low Earth orbit and not letting that flame go out. We are line soldiers on the ground marching to make sure that this continues. And just being a small part of that and continuing that is what's important. The Crew-8 convoy continues their drive across Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. It will be the third launch to space for the pilot of Crew-8. Michael Barrett has previously flown on Expedition 1920 in 2009 and STS-133 in 2011. Here's more on the doctor from League City, Texas. The ISS is, I would say, a very critical stepping stone in human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. I'm NASA astronaut Mike Barrett, pilot of the Crew-8 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Vancouver, Washington, in the southwest part of the state. Grew up around the city of Camas, a very small town in a farming community. And we had about 80 acres or so. We raised sheep and cattle, and it was a really great upbringing. There was plenty of the natural world around us to really be fascinating. And I had interests sparked in astronomy and oceanography and photography. I built telescopes in high school, and I had this commanding dark sky out there. It was really quite magnificent. And I went through these phases of only wanting to be an oceanographer or only wanting to be an astronomer. And all this with the backdrop of always having to fix things and get up and take care of animals and a certain amount of discipline, which I probably didn't appreciate so much at the time, but I certainly do now. The combination of those demands for living and an interest in natural sciences, I think partly what led me to where I am today. I came to Johnson Space Center in 1991 and I've never left, except when I left the planet a couple times. But I spent nine years as a NASA flight surgeon and I would say that is absolutely one of the dream jobs at NASA. I think my passion is the human in space, how we adapt, 
how we prepare for space, how we rehab when we come back, and how our physiology changes. And so that job allows you to dabble in all of those things and be among the last of the people who see the crew before they launch, the first who see them when they land, and to talk to them every day, that was an amazing experience. And I was very, very lucky to transition to the astronaut corps in the year 2000. The last time I was on the International Space Station was in 2011. I was fortunate to fly the last uh, flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery, and she was a magnificent station at the time, and we actually put the permanent multipurpose module into place, and we kind of considered the station complete at that time, and again, it was not small. Since that time, she's actually grown quite a bit. So what I expect to find is the, the core of the station that I left, that I, I loved so much, that I spent over 200 days on, plus some new modules, some new research capabilities, and I think as important as anything, new docking ports for new generation spacecraft. What I remember most fondly from my first mission was looking out the window and just hanging out with my shipmates at the galley table at the end of, the, of a long workday. My personal goal is really to see my crew become part of it, help build it, and have us all come down so much better than we were. If we do that and we've executed our mission and we're fatigued, tired, uh, but giddy with success, that's what I'm looking for. The Crew 8 Convoy now passing Kennedy's iconic vehicle assembly building. Now this is where NASA will stack its space launch system rocket an Orion spacecraft for Artemis II, which is expected to launch in September of next year, and it'll send four astronauts around the moon. And amazing efforts going. As I mentioned, that's uh, where the chief of the astronaut office is now, is working with the Artemis II crew on recovery, and you now we'll be stacking the Orion on top of the SLS there um, in no time at all. It's going to fly by, and they'll be sending humans around the moon for the first time in a, in a long time. There's the VAV there. You see the big meatball on the left hand of your screen. You can't miss that building here. <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a dry day when you're flying here in a T-38, uh, when you hit the west coast of Florida, you can actually see it. If it's clear and dry, you mm. can actually see the VAV from the west coast of the peninsula because it's the biggest thing. It's so massive. Yeah. And we have a former technical intelligence officer for the CIA and U.S. patent holder flying with Crew-8. Here's more on mission specialist Jeanette Epps. What I love about space exploration is finding out new things, learning new things we never thought we would learn in my lifetime. My name is Jeanette Epps. I am a mission specialist for the NASA SpaceX Crew-8 mission to the International Space Station. I am from Syracuse, New York, where it's very cold. I am one of seven children. My twin sister, Janet, yes, Janet and Jeanette, we both love science as kids. Janet went on to become a molecular cell biologist and I became an aerospace engineer. I think I always secretly wanted to become an astronaut. I just never thought that it was something that was obtainable. In 2008, a friend of mine, Leland Melvin, called me and said that they were accepting applications for the next class. I thought it was my last chance to apply, and so I did. June 2009, I received a phone call from Peggy Whitson, and she asked if I wanted to join the astronaut corps. It was very overwhelming and emotional for me to actually get that call and be selected. Prior to coming to NASA, I worked for Ford Motor Company, and then I went on to work for the Central Intelligence Agency. At both of those places, I learned to be very deep in technical matters, but then also how to become operational. Our mission will entail getting on the vehicle, flying to the space station, taking care of the International Space Station, and then we'll also conduct experiments. Each individual will be an experiment in and of themselves, how our cells behave, how our blood changes, how our bone density changes, muscle mass. We're looking at everything to figure out countermeasures for the human body so that it can live longer and longer outside the Earth's protection. Not only will we be an experiment, but we'll have other experiments on board that we'll conduct. The experiments that we conduct, hopefully, will get the human body and other things to the moon and then from the moon to Mars. I will be the GEM specialist, which is the Japanese experiment module. I may get a chance to operate their robotic arm to help them with experiments that they'll do outside of the space station. Since this will be my first trip to the International Space Station, I'm looking forward to viewing the Earth from an amazing vantage point. 
but also experiencing all the nuances that go along with that. As we walk to the launch pad, as we're strapped into the vehicle, the things that I, I believe I'll be feeling, unbelief, surrealism, but also joy. And then once we go into orbit, just to see the Earth from that vantage point, and then thinking of ways that we're gonna work on the space station that's gonna help our home that we're now untethered to. When I get to the space station, I'm expecting that it will be like home. We've trained so much here on Earth in a mock-up that looks just like the International Space Station. The biggest thing I'll have to do is adapt to space during the first two weeks of being there, and then I'll settle into home. An aerial view as we get into Crew 8's Mission Specialist 2, cosmonaut Alexander Grubenkin. He has an engineering degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. К действительно того, что мы получаем, получая на орбите, используем на Земле. Поэтому, если прям вот вкратце, это ведь и новые материалы, это новые лекарства, новые какие-то открытия, которые связаны именно, скажем так, здоровьем людей, которые, то есть обследования, которые там возможны. Я Александр Гребенкин, я являюсь специалистом полета миссии Крю-8 на Международную космическую станцию. Целей несколько. Основная из этих целей – это, конечно же, та научно-прикладная работа, которая будет выполняться с использованием различного оборудования, с использованием различных укладок. Это, конечно же, задачи, связанные с обслуживанием, своевременным ремонтом и дооснащением систем Международной космической станции. Это очень действительно важно, потому что космонавтика, она в первую очередь приносит пользу именно здесь, как бы это ни казалось странным, на Земле в условиях микрогравитации. Они позволяют открывать новые горизонты, разрабатывать новые препараты. Это все используется впоследствии здесь, на Земле. Есть даже сведения о том, что некоторые заболевания, которые раньше ожидания увидеть нашу красавицу Землю с высоты орбитального полета, и то, что я задумал много-много лет назад, пока буду осторожен в высказываниях, штатно мы услышим заветный лифтов и подъем, и окажемся на станции и будем самое главное you are seeing live images now of crew eight's convoy arriving at launch pad 39a they'll be driving around the back right raja yep yeah they kind of take a circuitous route um head up to some trailers uh basically have a a bio break if they need it before they head out to the up to the elevator to the rocket a bathroom break yeah some some awesome videos there of the uh, the crew members uh, it was really cool seeing mike barrett uh when he was first a flight doc at nasa i don't think i've seen some of those pictures before yeah and real quick about the bathroom break this is the last opportunity they're going to have right Right. I mean, they've got uh, what's called MAGS, Maximum Absorbency Garments, which is a fancy acronym for a diaper. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is the last chance to not use a diaper. <laughs> and you don't have to be an astronaut to share in this experience of traveling to space. Just check out our Crew 5 astronauts as they explain how you can get a virtual guest passport. Did you know there's been over a million registrations in NASA's virtual guest program since May 2020? From your neighbor to the Crew 5 astronauts, you might be surprised who is a NASA virtual guest. Do you have Mars 2020? I do. Do you have James Webb? Sure do. Do you have Crew 5? Well, I've got it here, and you guys have it here, but I missed it here. We conducted over 200 science experiments and technology demonstrations on our mission. We love being part of Expedition 68. We even remembered a virtual guest passport for Einstein, our free fall indicator, but we forgot to register and missed the stamp. Even if you're doing existing research, never miss a stamp from NASA's virtual guest program. Whether you're en route to the International Space Station or located anywhere around the globe, register at nasa.gov forward slash virtual guests to receive updates on missions and milestones. As a virtual guest, you will receive curated resources and a stamp for your passport following a successful launch. Remember, you only get the updates and stamp if you register. I join. I won't miss it next time. 
And if you missed the QR code or, or the website that they had up on your screen there, we're gonna bring it up for you one more time. Here's the QR code on the bottom right. Just scan it or nasa.gov slash virtual guest. It's really important for us here at NASA to include as many people as possible to really bring you into uh, what we're what we hope to accomplish by heading into space. Yeah, there's a, yeah, it's obviously only so many people can get on site here at KSC. It's late at night, so yeah, the more people that we can bring in and watch virtually and from home, the better. And uh, hopefully, the next generation of kids out there who's going to solve all the problems we need to solve to be able to live on the moon and Mars. And I know we don't have all the solutions, but I know someone out there does. We are now T-minus two hours, 59 minutes, 28 seconds and counting. The crew arrived early to the pad. That was scheduled for T-minus two hours and 55 minutes. Right now, as Raja said, they are taking their last real bathroom break <laughs> before they're going to get into the launch tower there, walk across the crew access arm that you see at the top of your screen there, and into their Dragon spacecraft. Dragon Endeavor. And there's also some time here, more than likely they're probably getting some updates on the weather. Um, uh, we mentioned before the ASP had kind of set up their uh, equipment. Um, different crew members have different ways of setting up things on their, their legs and on their suits um, in terms of whether it's on a card or whether they put notes in the, the iPad that they have on. Um, and so this is also the time to kind of, any of these free moments you have are times are sort of going through that mental rehearsal or kind of configuring things, making sure your notes are where you want them. Right. So it's always nice to be a little bit ahead uh, as opposed to feeling rushed to, to have that stuff set up. Just to set expectations for what we will soon see. So in pairs, right, Raja, we're going to see the commander, Matt, and the pilot, Mike, they'll be the first to take a look at their rocket and then head up the launch tower, yeah? Exactly, yeah, and it's, it's mainly driven by um, when you get the strap-in part, um, trying to have all four people strap in at the same time would be kind of a, to speak, it crowded. And so for that reason, they do two at a time, um, and they do the two middle seats first. Uh, like you said, Matt and Mike will get in, and then the two outer seats, so that's the reason they split it up into like a 2v2. Yeah, we're going to take our viewers inside uh, the crew access arm in the white room, which is the room that's at the end of the crew access arm just before they get into the Dragon spacecraft. I mean, they're going to see that it's tight. Yeah, and it's uh, and the reason it's tight was par partially just because you're on the top of a giant tower, but also because it's essentially a clean room. They call it the white room, uh, which harkens back to uh, original days of space flight, the terminology that was used then. Um, but it's basically a, it is a mobile clean room, so you can see all that. Um, that black plastic and rubber, that's, those are seals. And so it is, and then you can see the air hose running into the cabin. Uh, so it is not uh, hot and humid in there like it is outside that area. And so they're temperature controlling it, humidity controlling it, but most importantly, uh, what we call foreign object debris, controlling for that, because even something like a human hair across that hatch could keep it from sealing. And so you'll see that's why they wear those black ninja outfits. They'll have uh, the masks and everything on to keep anything. They'll have booties on. Um, you can see that white square thing before the hatch is, mm -hmm. is sticky material. Mm. So that catches any lint, you know, little pieces of pebbles or whatever that might have been picked up uh, as they go from the elevator. But the crew will have booties on their boots until they get to the outside the crew access arm and then take those off and they go through the clean room. Um, but that catches anything else. Um, and then you can see there's like a little uh, piece of Kapton tape over the hatch seal. So everything is is protected to maintain the integrity of that hatch. And here they are coming to take a look at the rocket. Well, that's right. There's Matt and Mike walking over to get a good look at their ride to space. And like we mentioned, it's, it's hard to see because the helmet's heavy and not really melted till backwards, but so you got to kind of lean back. To uh, yeah. <laughs> and you can see he's, he's bracing his chin, trying to tilt the, the helmet up. Taking a nice long look. And as you mentioned, the, the capsule is being used for the fifth time, but a brand new booster. Um, and SpaceX has yeah, pioneered the, the reuse of both the booster and the capsule, so pretty amazing. With the yep, fifth time Dragon, first time Falcon 9 today. And now here they are, they're getting into an elevator that will take them up the launch tower. 
We won't be joining them inside the elevator, but we do have a picture of the buttons inside there. If we can pull that up as they walk inside, <laughs> as you can see, the bottom floor is Earth. And it's where good. they'll be going to is space. It makes it very easy to know which button you have to push. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no confusion there, huh? Was it like that for you, or is that a new addition? I think the space is a new addition. I think uh, for ours, it was still the, those, the other numbers correspond to the feet off the ground, is what those numbers are. And so you can imagine with uh, Artemis, it's going to be an even bigger number. They actually come up here. There's actually kind of a two floors. There's a, they come out here and then wrap around and go up another set of very short set of stairs that goes up to the actual level where the uh, crew access arm is at. Mm -hmm. Um, and you saw that uh, since they're going into the clean room, you saw the ninjas have the additional, they have the, um, the hoods on to, for their hair as well, like I mentioned. So 21, like we mentioned before, that's Denise, Denise who's the asp. Um, it's a little harder to tell that now that everyone's got the, the hoods on. That's why the numbers are probably really Exactly, important. yep. All right, so we have Matt and Mike walking up, like you said, a set of stairs. That'll bring them to the final level where they'll connect. Correct. The yep. And those arm. those yellow chevrons you see on the ground, if they have to egress, they don't actually have to go back down those stairs. They're slide wires that go from the top of the tower down to the ground. And so that's those chevrons are meant that if there's bad visual conditions, you can look down and know which way to to go. So they'll be walking against it to get into the crew access Correct. arm. Yep. But if there were an emergency, they'd be going with the chevrons. Right. You can see the. To, over their right shoulder is the access arm, and then you can see Alexander and Jeanette down at the bottom of the elevator getting their time and their chance to take a look at the rocket. <laughs> the it's, rocket reclined, and then we yeah. saw some waves from Alexander. Yeah, it's kind of a cool view with all the lights on it at night. I wonder how they're feeling in this moment to see their ride. I mean, and to also be at the base of this rocket, like we've been seeing beautiful views of it, but to really be at the bottom of it looking up, that's when it becomes yeah. really. It's pretty exciting. And I think yeah. that's why I think 100% of the people you see, even though it's uncomfortable on your head and shoulders, still tilt all the way back because it's, it is a pretty impressive sight to look straight up and to see the rocket uh, and actually get a sense of scale. Because it's really hard uh, for us when we see it from a distance you know, with nothing to really compare it to, it you kind of lose that sense of how big it actually is. To the left side of your screen, that's a great shot from, again, our flight ops team here. That's a helicopter that's uh, orbiting the pad right now, giving you that beautiful shot of uh, Mike and Matt. They're making phone calls. Yep, so you can see in the, yeah, the left-hand picture is the, the view um, of where they're at on the pad arm, and the, the right side was the crew access arm, and on the right-hand view, you're seeing uh, number 21 Denise there operating the, the pad phone there for them to call so the call to their family before they actually go into the uh, crew access arm. Yeah, the mission specialists are about to catch up right now with, there you go, with uh, Matt and Mike there. So this phone call, you mentioned that Denise helps them, and it's because of the gloves they're wearing, right? right? So yep. it's a dial. Yeah, exactly. It's a, uh, and also, again, they're, we're just super uh, conservative about anything getting contaminated or you know, touching anything. So. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just because in the gloves, it's hard to actually, uh, probably a high likelihood of misdialing, trying mm -hmm. to dial a phone. And this is an opportunity maybe to call um, some of the folks that you did just see at Crew Walkout to say, hey, I made it, uh, right, it but also be, others, right? Yeah, it could be that. Uh, it could be people that maybe couldn't travel here um, for whatever reason, maybe uh, you know, aren't well enough to travel, but are still pretty important people in their life. So that's uh, the other, I think, common thing that people might do. You see they're uh, getting rid of the cooling units there. Um, there's an ex So they left them, um, you can see like the bottom, the like middle is one of those blue cooling units because as now they, they transition to the crew access arm. And there we have Commander Matt Dominic, Michael, uh, Pilot Michael Barrett walking down the crew access arm towards their Dragon Endeavor. Walked into the camera. <laughs> Here they are now into that white room, like we were saying. So it looks like they are removing their gloves now. Yep, it looks like they might be signing the uh, around the meatball here. So this is another tradition. Yep. We have the NASA meatball here. And starting with demo two with Bob uh, Hurley and, and um, uh, Bob Benkin. Bob Benkin. Really yeah, whoops, I was like, whoop, <laughs> wait. <laughs> you say their names often all the time together. And then, <laughs> but so they sign uh, their names around this meatball. Yep, and then, yeah, it started. Uh, 
as many traditions start, um, once one crew has done it, then you keep doing it. So running out of space there, too. <laughs> We're going to need another meatball. And right next to the meatball was actually the SpaceX logo. And that is signed by the crews of Axiom 1, 2, and 3. Yep. Axiom Space right, yeah. is the first commercial company to transport private crews to and from the International Space Station. And they launched all three missions with SpaceX. And the logo is also signed by the Inspiration4 crew, so the first all-civilian crew to orbit the Earth. So again, this is like a, a physical representation of all that we've been doing in the last yeah. few years, and 2020. I, and like a perfect representation of the partnership, too. Right? You can see the, the public and the private right next to each other. And it just indicates that, uh, you know, enabling private space by utilizing government infrastructure, I mean, it's the same pad, the same facilities, the same Kennedy Space Center, and doing, doing both things uh, and working in tandem with one another to make it all happen. So what's happening now? FOD checks, is that what's happening? Foreign object debris checks? I think so. It looks like he's, uh, they're putting their hands back in the gloves. So they took their hands out to, to sign. It's crew preference on whether you want to ingress with your hands in your gloves or not. So it looks like they both are electing to put them back in, in their gloves now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what they're doing now is re, redoing that. And then, like we talked about before, once Mike gets in, his back in there, they'll re-verify visually that it's a good, the zipper's closed. Um, Maddie there, who's got the white cuff checklist on, number 11, is uh, also watching the time all the time so, and keeping them, uh, keeping them on timeline. And you were talking about FOD again, foreign object debris. I mean, it is as small as something like a hair, exactly. which actually yeah. got into the seal for Crew 5's launch, and they had to reopen the seal, remove that hair before... Um, they could close the seal for launch, yep. or close the hatch for launch. Yeah, and that's why the last thing you saw the suit tech there is pull off that umbilical cover off their right leg. That was that white plastic piece he took off because mm -hmm. you're also trying to prevent any FOD from getting into the into the cooling loop or any of the connectors there until you're actually in the... Because the spacecraft is essentially kept uh, completely sanitary and clean. So once you're in there, um, in theory, there should be nothing else uh, that can contaminate the suit. And like we mentioned, they've got their, their boot, booties off now um, as the last thing before they go across that piece and then come Jeanette and Alexander. Yep, Jeanette and Alexander, Jeanette Epps, Alexandra Gravenkin, our two mission specialists for Crew 8, walking across the crew access arm, about to join <laughs> their crewmates in Dragon. You saw some waves, thumbs up, they're chatting as they make their way across the crew access arm. They'll uh, do the signing of the meatball here while the other two are getting strapped in. Yeah, the other two are already both in. So we have uh, Matt and Mike already inside Dragon. Going into Dragon, that's called ingressing. They just ingressed into Dragon. Mm -hmm. This crew is moving. It's better to be ahead than behind, that's exactly. for sure. Exactly. So that's Alexander signing right there. And now Jeanette. And you can see, like you alluded to earlier, like why they don't all four try to get in at the same time. Uh, in microgravity, um, it's easy to do because you've got the, the vertical and three-dimensional space you can use when you're not constrained by 1G. But mm -hmm. here on the ground, trying to have four people and the suit techs and the hatch techs, all those people all in the same spot, it gets pretty crowded. Yeah, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's eight people either in the capsule, at least eight people either in the capsule or in the white room right now. So as you said, removing their boot coverings essentially. Walking on that sticky tape to grab anything off of the, the soles of their shoes before they ingress as well. Yep, and you can see they, the techs are making sure their helmet is protected on the way in just it's, so you don't accidentally bump either the hatch seal or damage the helmet. Mm -hmm. How big of a space are we talking about? Can you give us an idea for how, how wide it is in there, Dragon? Uh, inside the Dragon? Yep. Um, so it's, I mean, you can see that the four seats across and then below the seats, it gets a little wider. Um, so it's wide enough that you can lay head to foot pretty comfortably. Mm -hmm. You can probably fit two people down there. 
uh, and then it narrows as it goes up. So uh, above the displays that Mike's using right now, you could probably fit one person laying um, horizontally. So it's actually pretty, pretty comfortable. Actually, Dragon is configured for seven passengers if needed, right? Right. The original uh, outer mold line design was built so where you see the cargo bags underneath Mike and Matt's feet, that um, at one point early in the design was considered for, uh, for extra seats. Um, that wasn't, uh, that's not what it's certified for now, but there, that was originally part of the, uh, the original concept. You can see number 22, that was those um, uh, products I was talking about earlier that you know each crew runs a little differently. Some like uh, have what we call like lineup cards. Mm -hmm. um, some use the iPad. Some maybe have <laughs> you know wave for Matt. Matt waving, there. yeah. <laughs> Finding the camera, he sees us. <laughs> Thumbs up. I think that's for you, Roger. <laughs> From a turtle to another turtle. So as we can see, uh, Matt and Mike have their harness on. It's a five-point harness. Yep. Yeah. So there's a there's a harness, and then also where their boots are at, there's a, a connection in the sole of their boot that locks their feet into the the footrests. Uh, and then, yeah, you're seeing that they're they're helping. You can see a good view of Alexander's thing. It's a, a like a rotary knob that those five straps go into. Hmm. And it looks like on um, Mike's right leg, that's where the umbilical will be connected to, right? Right, they're all connected right now. You can see it on Jeanette, yeah, all of, on all their right legs. You mm. can see it's um, connected. So at some point, I would assume they'll start doing comm checks. Um, they can probably hear each other at this point, we might guess, depending on whether the, the ground's configured yet. Yeah, comm checks are They'll expected. usually probably wait for the, the, the text to get out of there, because otherwise you hear a bunch of background noise. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, so explain what the umbilical system does. Like, what do they get through these umbilicals that they're now attached to? Yeah, so the umbilical gives them air, uh, both for cooling and the breathing air, and then also it's the comm link. So it's, that's the, the, the two big things. It's, um, so environmental control and then communication. And then on the armrests are the, the actual controls for talking, for volume, uh, what's called a box, which is... Uh, a setting of how loud you have to talk for the other people to hear you because you, you don't want to hear people breathing um, so there's it's a sensitivity setting so that's what the on their hand rests they have buttons that control that you can see kind of like I mentioned this is now where they're putting on what we call the the crew configured items um, so it looks like maybe that's a mirror I think like a wrist mirror hmm. um, so pretty common to see, we'll see that on like the EVA suits. And that's because once you're at pressure, it's hard to read things on your own suit. Um, I see. And the team actually, Roger, just got another uh, weather brief. And right now, launch weather here at Kennedy is 85% go. Nice. Great news. And we have that up there. There's still some concerns. Again, flight through precipitation, anvil cloud rule. Explain what those rules are, Raja, and why we do have to keep a close eye on launch weather. Sure, yeah. So the, the flight through precipitation is just kind of the, the physics of a vehicle going really fast. If you imagine uh, driving in your car at 25 miles per hour. Yeah. Dragon SpaceX, loud and clear from Hawthorne. How you doing? We're almost dropped in. We'll get you a real comm check here in a minute. Copy. So you heard that call out. They're getting ready for comm checks. That was just a They're just a saying they're in their seats, yep. So real quickly, obviously. So yeah, so the, the flight through precept is just the speed, at that speed with the rain hitting the structure of the rocket, the concern that it causes structural damage. And then the anvil clouds is... And SpaceX PLT for comm check. Pilot loud and clear, how me? Billy yeah. Charlie too. Good to be with you guys tonight. You there's MCC X and Hawthorne. Use well, Mike. And the anvil cloud rule is essentially uh, thunder clouds. Is when you talk about anvil clouds, and so the concern there is lightning, uh, also potentially hail uh, that can be in the uplift part of the anvil. Uh, that's as the air circulates, the the nasty stuff usually gets pushed up higher. So, of, avoiding flying through that is usually something we try to do. But again, improving trends, 85% go here at the launch site, and also improving trends along the ascent corridor. So teams are growing even more optimistic that today we will see Crew-8 launch to the International Space Station.
I'm looking forward to it. So it looks like they're configuring the straps on uh, those, what they call the satchels, those crew satchels that mm -hmm. have um, a mix of basically like some of the product, like lineup cards. They have some uh, emergency egress cards and some other things like that. Some quick, basically, things if you need to get to checklist quickly, you've got it in there. You can see next to Mike's right arm, the, another tradition of putting the crews that have been in that particular Dragon Capsule in Endeavor, their patches along the, uh, the bulkhead to his right. Oh, look at this view. It's a really tight space, but I really appreciate the camera teams there giving us these great views of our crew. So as was reported out, they're in their seats, strapped in. We expect comm checks soon, followed by seat rotation, and then suit leak checks. They're ready. Thumbs up for all those things coming up from all four crew members. <laughs> it's nice to see them looking calm and collected and ready, it looks yep, ready like. Ready to go. And pretty good view there of the stuff below Mike and Matt's feet. You can see uh, not just the people going up there uh, on the crew vehicle, but also cargo. And so the, the white canvas bags are, what call, are called CTBs, and then those lockers in the middle are powered payloads, meaning it's probably science that needs either cooling or heating or some, mm. or air circuit, something um, to preserve whatever it is that needs power. And so um, the Dragon has the ability to take really high value and high end science to and from the space station because we can bring it back to Earth for further analysis. And so um, things that are uh, you know, perishable, um, that we can't necessarily don't have all the tools on the space station to, to analyze, you can bring back, which is a pretty amazing capability that we now have with the, the commercial crew program. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the reason why they're going up to the International right, Space yeah, it's Station. It's all about science, so that if you can actually, uh, you know, keep the science preserved, that's, that's huge. If you're just joining us, it is T-minus two hours, 38 minutes until Crew-8, you see there, launches to the International Space Station as part of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Commander Matt Dominic, Pilot Michael Barrett, and Mission Specialist Jeanette Epps, Alexandra Grabenkin, strapped into their seats inside Dragon Endeavor, waiting for comm checks, as well as their seats to be rotated into the launch positions. Yeah, so what you're not seeing in this view is all the activity in the white room as the, the techs are starting now to clear out those hatch shield covers and prepare the hatch for closure and start working all the, the white room ops. Uh, there you can see it there. And then, as you mentioned, so they're getting ready for comms checks, which you probably, what probably Mike and Matt were doing on the displays there, we're configuring the different seats. You can set up different relative volumes between different loops. So oh. kind of like if you were talking to me and someone else was talking at the same time, I can set the, I can vary that mix. Um, and more than likely the crew kind of has an idea over time of how they, how they like that set up. So that's probably what they're configuring. And then like I mentioned, doing checks amongst themselves one at a time with one person talking and make sure you're not getting bleed over into mm -hmm. someone else's into someone else's comm is it can be pretty annoying to to hear Next deck in there. ready for comm checks one decimal four so now we'll listen in here as they run through all Copy, the let's loops. do it let's go left to right across the vehicle ms1 commander pilot ms2 comm check ms1 comm check jeanette loud and clear Loud and clear as well. Matt, loud and clear. Same. Hey, come check. Mike, five by five. Same. Well, come check. And Alexander, loud and clear. Thanks all. Good evening, crew eight. Okay. That's the umbilical com check. And next up is seat rotation. Report when ready for that. Ready for rotation. Copy, standby one. So I mentioned that as the umbilical comm check, meaning they'll still have to do what's called RF comm checks later, which we'll hear later on. Yeah, there's when different the, kinds yep. of comms, right? Exactly. Ground yeah. stations, Tedris. Different, different pathways, mm -hmm. exactly. So they're getting ready to rotate the seats. Um, so what the crew's probably talking about now is making sure they have all their hands and legs inside restrained, nothing's out and about, so that when the seats rotate, you don't want to get anything stuck. And why do we want to rotate the seats? 
Uh, so the position they're in now is much more convenient to ingress in in 1G. It's uh, you're able to easily get in and out of the capsule. You saw they could kind of stand as they did that. Um, but it wouldn't be the best to be in this position for launch. Uh, Dragon SpaceX initiating seat rotation. If they were to stay in that same position they're at now, um, as the launch, as the vehicle goes up, the force of the acceleration the, for the gravity vector and that acceleration vector will pull the blood down towards the bottom of the capsule. So in the mm -hmm. position they had been in, that would pull the blood out of their brain. So very similar to um, when fighter pilots fly and do G-strains to keep the conscious, it would be the same thing. And to avoid doing that, since this is a much longer ascent, it's a multi-minute thing, and we rotate them under their backs. And that way, when that acceleration vector pulls the blood down, it's still staying in their head. It's mostly staying in their chest and head, um, which is a much more uh, sustainable basically body position to have. Yeah, basically you're saying that if they were if they were to stay in the position that they were They'd in, they could out. pass out. Yeah, they, they, they definitely would pass out, yeah. How much G-force are you experiencing? Dragon SpaceX, we see four seats in the launch position. How much of that force are you seeing at, at launch? And with that, you go for section two, suit leak check prep. All right. It's about four to five Gs, Megan and Peak. Um, and you'll, uh, it builds right before first stage cutoff and second stage ignition. Um, and then it, the second stage is kind of builds slowly from about two to five Gs by the time the second engine cuts off. So about wow. five Gs peak. Wow. And so what you just heard on the mission audio loops again is that they are uh, confirming, they have confirmed that the seats have been rotated into the launch position and now they are getting ready for suit leak checks, which again, you saw them do that in the suit up room. So this uh, should look familiar to you. It's just now that they're in Dragon, um, they're uh, testing it here. And as you can see, visors are down, they're all ready. Exactly, and the reason we're having to redo it is uh, you saw them open the gloves up before uh, presumably they didn't have to use the restroom, they would have to use the, open up the, the bottom uh, part of the, the torso zippers. And so since they broke that seal, they now have to recheck it. Um, but what we did rule out by doing the leak checks in the suit room is there's probably nothing mechanically wrong with this. Care completes. Check. Copy, we see it. Your go for section three. There you go for three. In the back and forth you're hearing it referring to steps uh, so there's procedure overall procedure numbers and then steps within that procedure and that's what they're talking about and there's different ones where you want to verify with the ground before you command it and you can tell that the suit leak checks were um, successful because we have a good view of Alexander here but like the top of his suit is now approaching his head again yep. because they're depressurizing the suit now that they know it can hold the right pressure Right, so you'll see them, it actually takes a few minutes for it to run, so they'll, you'll see them kind of hold still and just kind of sit there. It's checking both the pressurization and, like you mentioned, the depressurization, like the, the rate it comes out. Unlike the leak checks in the suit room, in this case, the, you can actually also test out your ability to see the displays. Um, it's like you mentioned, Megan, the, the helmet kind of expands up on your head. Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to make sure that you've got your chin and that helmet kind of interface into the pad and the foam around it such that you can still see the displays um, if there was a depress event and your, your suit pressurized. And the targeted time for seat rotation was T minus 2 hours, 29 minutes, suit leak checks, 2 hours, 28 minutes. So as you can see, we are Running ahead. ahead of schedule. Yeah, and so unlike before, earlier in the flow where you saw they would just hold and wait for that whatever time was supposed to be done, at this point they'll let them get ahead um, because if there are any unforeseen uh, delays later, you want to build all the pad that you can. So on the right hand of your screen, we're seeing again inside the white room. Talk to us about what the uh, SpaceX ninjas are doing right now. We see them shining a light on the so, seal. So yeah, they're doing hatch seal inspections right now. Um, so more than likely visually inspecting them as well as probably photo documenting it and, and running video over it. So um, they've, got a, they've got documentation of what that seal looks like before they close it. And then once they've done that and actually close the hatch, They'll also start running through hatch leak checks, very similar to the, the suit leak checks, except mm. on the hatch. 
the reason they're not doing that is because if the, they don't want to start that process until they knew the suit leak checks are good. So some of the folks up there are suit techs. So if there was a problem with the suit leak check, you have the expertise on hand already in the clean room, ready to go to basically troubleshoot it right away. Oh, that's great. As you can see from the graphic on your screen, up next, hatch close. Again, first successful suit leak checks we have to see. We have to successfully check the seal around the hatch and then they will close the hatch and that'll be the last time they open the hatch until it splashes down, exactly. right? Exactly, yep. Yeah, that hatch is not the same one they use for uh, docking on the space station. That's, you can't actually see it in this particular view. It's on top of the spacecraft in this configuration. But yeah, you're exactly right. This is the same one. A lot of the same people actually too. A lot of these ninjas will be the ones that are on the recovery boat uh, about six months from now. So you can see he's got like a little uh, lint-free cloth there that he's dabbing at something on the seal. Such meticulous work has to Dragon happen. showing four good leak checks. There's the call to four good leak checks, so that's a good sign. Copy Dragon, we see the same, four good leak checks. At this time, the closeout team is gonna hop back in the vehicle for final closeout steps before exiting the capsule. You're go for section four. Section four, thank you. So now that I know the suits are good, that what he was talking about, the, the SpaceX folks will come inside, basically do a once over the inside of the capsule and make sure, you know, there was nothing, you know, nothing accidentally left behind, um, nothing out of configuration, kind of one last check if all the straps are tight. Um, the crew is, because now they've done the leak check, uh, what can happen is that that suit expands, it loosens the straps. And so he's making sure that everything is still as it was. And as they continue to inspect the seal, let's talk a little bit about the comm checks that are coming up. So checks through the umbilicals, that happened, but we still have other checks. Can you talk us through the different ones and, and why there are several ones? Yeah, sure. There's, so there's different methods or what we call RF chains or radio frequency chains, uh, or you may have call them loops, um, or they may also call them drag into ground, space to ground. But all, all the it's just different ways of referring to different pathways that the RF flows. So you mentioned TDRS earlier, which is the tracking data and relay system. So that's one way. Um, there's direct com like radio comms. And so basically what they're doing is trying and making sure all those pathways work on the ground before they launch. Um, and the other thing they do is talk to different stations. And so there's both the, the, the loops and the, the way the the electromagnetic and all that flows. There's also within the control rooms, different sub loops um, of, of lots of people talking, but the crew only hears a very small subset of that um, through what either the Capcom or the core relays to them. And But there is for launch, the ability of some key people to be able to talk directly to the crew if there's an off nominal situation. So they're gonna check all those relay paths. Um, so you'll hear like the voice of the CE, the chief engineer, mm -hmm. the LD, the launch director. So you'll hear some of those people make sure that they have a path that goes all the way from the chair they're sitting in and the console they're on all the way to the crew in the vehicle. And that's a good awareness for our viewers as well. You know, they're hearing chatter on the loops, but there is a lot more that's going on in the background to make sure that everything's working properly. And Yeah, the crew is not hearing the vast majority of the back chatter. You're right. The average controller probably has like 14 or 15 loops um, that they're listening to and talking on and having different conversations. Um, and then the long tradition in space flight um, that comes from aviation that only one person actually makes the, sort of filters all that information and then passes it up to the crew and so we call it the Capcom in NASA speak or they call it the core um, in SpaceX and MCCX but the same thing both here and then on the ISS we do the same thing um, Artemis it's you know, been that way since Mercury um, and beyond Can you break down those acronyms for, for folks? Sure, uh, Capcom, yeah, Capcom's uh, Capsule Communicator Core. Crew, crew Operations and Resource Engineer. There you go. <laughs> so that would have been one, so for someone to ask about social media, they would have stumped me, but you, but you had it. <laughs> acronyms are huge here at NASA, so it's easy to forget one it's a once fun, in a it's while. It's a fun game to try to guess what the acronym means. <laughs> And so those satchels on this on on their legs, that's where Dragon um, SpaceX Comcheck. 
they're monitoring everything essentially. Right, so the that Apex Dragon loud and clear. Copy loud and clear. That was over the Tedris network. That's the launch configuration. Stand by for comm checks with DC, MD, and LD. Dragon. Dragon DC on countdown one. Com check. DC Dragon loud and clear. DC loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with MD. Dragon MD on countdown one. Com check. MD Dragon loud and clear, honey. MD loud and clear. Stand by for comm check over Dragon ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon Ground, comm check. MD Dragon, Dragon Ground, loud and clear. MD loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, LD on Countdown 1, comm check. LD! Dragon loud and clear, we're excited. Hey Matt, gotcha loud and clear, stand by uh, for comm check over Dragon Ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon Ground, comm check. LD, Dragon, Frank, we got you loud and clear. LD, loud and clear. And Dragon, that'll do it. Launch configuration, comm checks complete. Yeah, so you heard Matt pretty, Matt pretty excited to be talking to some of those folks. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned, I mentioned families earlier, and that's just another piece of the family. There's the, the Dragon family, there's the ISS family, the Houston family, there's the, the F9 Kennedy family. And so about a year prior to launch, um, the crew first starts actually interacting with the same folks that are on the loops with them this uh, this evening. Um, it actually kind of worked out good that it scrubbed last night because I got a chance to meet uh, my CE. Um, and so uh, it was really interesting. You heard the, the familiar in the voices, which is a really big part of the team building. Um, so even though uh, Jared, who's my CE, had uh, grown out uh, a beard and his hair was longer, as soon as I heard his voice, I recognized him immediately, even though he looked different. Um, and just, uh, yeah, it's... You learn over time and after multiple sims of hearing the intonation in their voice and just like the crew learns to work together, you learn to work with those people um, and all the controllers and, and hear things in their voice that give you an indication of, of what's going on. Uh, some of those voices are coming from here at Kennedy, some were coming from Hawthorne, um, right. and then we're also tied into MCC uh, Houston, so we're, we've got three different sites. And you mentioned some of the loops uh, that we're not hearing. You know, it's not just whether they're tracking, but there's all the all kinds of things about are the recovery ships ready to go? Are uh, are the DoD forces that are ready for off nominal? Are they ready to go? Um, so it's it's an amazing orchestra of stuff happening. And you're seeing the front rooms, Hawthorne on the left and Houston on the right, and there's a bunch of back rooms for each of those positions. There's a whole lot of another team of experts that are feeding information up to them. Yeah, it takes a lot of people to yeah. send folks to space. It's uh, super humbling to be the astronaut that uh, that just gets to be the, the tip of the spear that all those folks are supporting and it's a yeah amazing job to be able to do that and it sounds like Matt and his crew are ready to go and excited. We are now at two hours 22 minutes from the liftoff of the Falcon 9 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Crew 8 you see them there currently inside Dragon Endeavor. We have three first-time flyers on this mission we have Commander Matt Dominic and mission specialist Jeanette Epps and, and Alexander Gorbenkin. As for pilot Michael Barrett, who's seated second from the left, this will be his third visit to the International Space Station. Yep, and they're, they're excited to go up there. Actually, I was, uh, after, the, after yesterday, I was uh, able to message back and forth with Jaws and Laurel and pass the word on to them, so they sent me a pretty awesome picture of their their sad faces <laughs> that, uh. that uh, the third turtle wasn't going to be up there for a while but they're they're ready to, to catch Endeavor when it shows up to dock with the space station. Yeah Andy Mogensen um, launched on Crew 7 and he wrote on Twitter today that we should say Crew 8 is Crew Late <laughs> <laughs> and they're all excited to see them. Yeah, it's weird. What's weird been thinking about is you train uh, a lot together, and then all of a sudden the crew in front of you is gone, and the next time you see them, it's in space, which is a pretty surreal place to have a reunion. So we have the split screen, obviously, of our crew eight astronauts inside of uh, the Dragon capsule, and right outside, again, the white room as they work to uh, close the side hatch there. But so far, we are running ahead of schedule, actually. 
Astronauts have completed their comm checks, their different ones, as Raja mentioned, to make sure they can communicate with the teams here on the ground, they can communicate through satellites around the world, they can communicate with each other. Their seats have rotated from upright to their reclined launch position, which allows them to see and access the display panel, which you can see uh, both Mike and Matt. They, it's off camera, but you can see them touching uh, display screens in front of them. They also have completed their suit leak checks to make sure their spacesuits are working properly. And again, now the closeout team will verify that cabin environments uh, are stable and they are working to close the side hatch of the Dragon spacecraft. It looks like they just removed something actually, right? Yep, so those are pads to protect the seals and um, like we mentioned, when they were getting in, they're holding their helmets to make sure that nothing gets scratched. So they're pulling off that equipment. Uh, and yeah, the, the side hatch and the side hatch leak checks are the next big technical um, piece of the timeline. And so the, because of the importance of that, uh, it's very procedure driven and very intricate, which is why you see uh, you know, one person kind of running the procedure, then other persons checking the procedure signed off, one person documenting it all. Um, so as all those pieces are coming out, um, they're basically checking off an, a list of making sure everything is out of the, the spacecraft, everything's accounted for. And so far as we've been monitoring through cameras that uh, we have in the white room there, everything looking good? Nominal? Yeah, everything seems to be looking good. You see there, he's taken uh, the, the tech that it's right by the door there, was doing one more kind of uh, wipe down of the actual ceiling surface. So yeah, now all the padding is gone. Yep. Now, if you've been watching us since we came on air at 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm NASA's Megan Cruz with NASA astronaut Raja Chari, who commanded NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission. The two of us are providing audio commentary right now, but we plan to expand our coverage about an hour before launch. And we will come on camera and invite additional commentators to walk us through today's launch and ascent. Let's now take another look at the crew going into space today. Commander Matt Dominic, born and raised in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, married to Faith Dominic. They have two daughters, again, the youngest one. It was her birthday on Thursday. Matt earned a Master of Science degree in Systems, and Enge uh, Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. He was designated a Naval Aviator in 2007 made two deployments to the North Arabian Sea, flying close air support missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. He has more than 1,600 hours of flight time in 28 different aircraft, 48 carrier arrested landings, and 61 combat missions. And this is the commander's first space flight. And as you heard, he's excited to go. Uh, definitely hear the excitement as his voice doing the ground checks. Um, and then super excited to get to see Matt uh, lead his crew up to the space station. You know him well. I do, yes. Matt and I have, uh, yeah, I've started together in 2017, so it's been a, a great journey and uh, always a joy to, to work with him. He makes uh, every class, every training event uh, fun and, and always, uh, he, it's one of the favorite things he likes to say is so many questions. Uh, <laughs> so he's a bit infamous for always having lots of questions for the instructors, but I think both uh, they and us come away learning something new that we never expected every time. That's right. There's no bad questions. There is no bad questions, yeah. We only also un have... Only unasked ones are bad ones. Exactly. We have Dr. Michael Barrett, Crew 8 pilot, selected by NASA in 2000. He's the only one of Crew 8 who's been to space before, the only veteran. He was part of Expedition 1920 in 2009 and STS-133 in 2011. In total, 212 days in space. He is board certified in internal and aerospace medicine, has been awarded a bunch uh, for his contributions to space medicine research. He lives in League City, Texas with his wife, Michelle, and they have five children. I'm told that he's the one who's gonna make the best meals for the crew once they get to the space station. <laughs> one, for yeah. experience, he's been there before, but two, because 
He likes to cook in weird places, apparently. Yeah, and as you heard him uh, kind of express in his video earlier, he's got some really unique experience with, with space and in terms of having been part of the, per the team that assembled the space station, having lived on the space station, uh, and now getting to see it in, its, uh, in an expanded form. So it's, I think it's going to be really cool for him to get to see how it's grown and how the science has really matured, and it truly is an orbiting national laboratory um, and all the research that's going on, uh, which is near and dear to his heart. So it's, I think, a really cool circular journey for him to have started being one of the leading you know, flight med and science research uh, researchers at NASA, now an astronaut, and now getting to go actually do the science and, and add to that. Like I said, he's, he's written the book on space medicine, so he's going to have some more hands-on experience to, to add another few chapters. As we continue to monitor the closeout team working to close the side hatch, let's take a look at mission specialist Jeanette Epps. Also a first-time flyer from Syracuse, New York. She was a NASA fellow during graduate school and then worked for Ford Motor Company, where she received a U.S. patent for her research into auto collisions and countermeasure systems. And then after that, she joined the CIA for seven years as a technical intelligence officer before becoming an astronaut in 2009. She has a Master of Science and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Aerospace Engineering. And we saw a picture of her twin earlier in the broadcast. Yeah, that was very cool. Just uh, like I had not seen uh, young pictures of Mike, I had not seen uh, a young picture of, of Jeanette and Janet, um, which as she mentioned, if being a twin's not confusing enough, I think almost <laughs> the, the <names>. same names. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so excited for, for Jeanette, um, like I mentioned before, such a, a cool background for her. I mean, everything from Ford to the CIA, like it's a true expanse, and I think very analogous to her career here at NASA of having seen different vehicles and having that unique insight um, and taking, taking that to the space station uh, and her, her deep technical knowledge and understanding. And as you heard in her video, she's very excited to be part of the the scientific research and payloads and experiments going on up there. So it'll be fun to watch her uh, in her element. And on the far, far left of your screen, we have Alexandra Grubenkin, mission specialist, looking really relaxed as they await side hatch closure. He is also a first time flyer, graduated from the Irkutsk Military Aerospace Engineering Institute in 2002, where he majored in the engineering, maintenance and repair of aircraft radio navigation systems. He then attended the Moscow Technical University of Communications and Informatics, graduating with a degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. He was accepted pretty recently into the Cosmonaut Corps 2018, and he'll be the flight engineer while on board the space station, which is what you served as. Exactly, yep. So, yeah, so Alexander uh, was essentially in the equivalent class uh, of the Turtles. Uh, we were in 2017, and he was in the 2018 Cosmonaut class. They're offset a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, also uh, great to see the members of their class uh, going up to the space station, working with us side by side, um, and continuing the partnership uh, between Soyuz uh, and the U.S. launch vehicles. And at this point, pretty much what they're doing is kind of going through. You can see kind of how uh, Alexander's her eyes are towards the screen that. Uh, Mike's on. Um, this is kind of the crew's chance. They don't really have any actions with the side hatch closure. Mm -hmm. um, so this is their chance to go through the procedures for ascent um, and kind of talk through those again. So the, when they talk internally to the capsule, that doesn't go outside. So they can be having conversations on the intercom that we don't hear and the ground doesn't hear. It's only when they uh, push the button on their hand rest that it goes out. Um, so most likely, as you can see Matt scrolling there, they're going through just all the different scenarios and um, kind of what we call chair flying it, um, hmm. basically mentally prepping for what's going to come. So when, when it's, it's later and you don't have time to talk about it, you've done all that now. Right. Yeah, a lot of things happening in the background. And, and as we, again, continue to monitor uh, what's happening around Dragon Endeavor right now, we do have another question from social media. This one is Vava on Instagram. How did you get a job at NASA, Raja? Well, so the, the first step was apply. <laughs> so, um, so we applied through USA Jobs. Um, and as we mentioned uh, before, the Flies, which is the 2021 class, is graduating here in a few days. So I would expect uh, we will soon be hiring after that for a new class. So, um, But uh, yeah, the initial step is through USA Jobs. If you go to nasa.gov 
um, or just Google NASA.gov how to be an astronaut. It actually lists uh, some of the, the requirements there, but essentially have a master's degree in a STEM field, be a medical doctor, um, are kind of the, the academic um, baseline requirements. And then uh, from there, it's, it's about a year and a half long process. Um, you apply initially online. Um, we review those applications and then eventually um, narrow down the field and do two sets, two rounds of interviews to eventually select a class that starts ASCAN training. And I do want to point out, because we do get this question a lot, you know, you don't have to be someone in a STEM background to get a job at NASA. You know, we have a wide variety of jobs that support uh, space exploration. Um, so just because maybe math and science aren't your favorite subjects, yeah, absolutely. You saw you saw all those uh, all those rooms, like I mentioned, and all those people sitting in those control rooms. All the people that work to support the people in those control rooms. It's a huge community. Um, I mean, if uh, you mentioned the virtual passport, if people have actually got to visit Kennedy Space Center or Johnson Space Center or Marshall Land, any of the places, any of the centers, they're all almost little cities in themselves. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It it takes a whole community to to get humanity to space and. Yeah, whatever your talents or abilities are, we can definitely use them. Is the, the challenges for Artemis are, are many and, and difficult, so um, we can use all the help and, and talent we can, use, we can get. Of course, Artemis, NASA's campaign to establish a long-term presence on the moon, and then what we learn from that, we can further explore Mars. So, Raja, walk us through what's happening in the White Room right now. It looks like they're back to inspecting the seal. Yep, yeah, so you can see you've got, like, the high-density light out there. Um, and so checking the – there's there's two surfaces. There's the the dr capsule side and there's the hatch side, and both of them have seals, so they have to check both of those. And then amongst the seals, there's actually dual seals, a primary and a redundant seal. Um, so it's essentially four sets of seals that they're checking. Wow. And so sometimes what can happen, it's pretty common on the space station, maybe there's like a, you know, a discoloration or a divot. You can see, you can kind of see Maddie's iPad there. There's like pictures on the right side. Mm -hmm. So some of what they're doing is making sure that as they, as you saw them doing the photo documentation before, like let's say there's like a place where it's a slightly different color. They'd want to go back and sit, make sure, that, is that new or is that uh, an existing documented thing? Um, so that takes a little bit of time to cross check those things, which is probably what's happening now and just making totally sure that there's no new damage is the wrong word but new no um new, issue uh, yeah no things that you're visually seeing that's different yeah. than it was already documented or already known yeah yeah like we said crew five a hair yep was in the seal and and, and that is it's unacceptable worth putting a lot of time into this because it is a pretty big time hit if you fail the hatch leak check and that's built into the timeline you'll see if, if it all goes well we'll have some more time mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the uh, you know the suit leak checks and these leak checks are both very important because problems there uh, can very quickly delay things and again we are still ahead of schedule in the timeline the mission timeline as we count down to liftoff the side hatch close is set for T minus one hour and 55 minutes so we still have some time about 10 minutes ahead yep, yep. Still have some time to get that done and do it right. The other thing that's happening is the you can't get too far ahead um, because the vehicle actually has to command pressurization changes, which is happening uh, in Hawthorne and and also as part of an automated sequence. So there is there isn't a, a chance you could get too far ahead, which then could throw things off. So they mm. do there is pause points waiting as if you know if they close the hatch and Hawthorne's not ready to actually send the commands to. Um, to then change the valve configuration, then that, you wouldn't want to do that. So there's some coordination going back and forth there as well, I would imagine. Since we mentioned the clock, a reminder to everyone, T0 liftoff time today is targeted for 10.53 p.m. and 38 seconds Eastern time. So we are counting down with 85% go for a launch here at Kennedy Space Center. Dragon, SpaceX for an update. Team still working towards side hatch closure uh, and being extra cautious about some hairs they found on the seals. Uh, not a concern, and, and they're just being cautious. Check and copy. Thank you. All right, so the team just reported that out to the crew. You heard Matt answering back that he copies, that 
he knows they are dealing with a couple of hairs in yep. the seal. And I, like we uh, mentioned earlier, saw him using that lint-free cloth and taking pictures and comparing it to old pictures, so kind of exactly like we suspected. Um, saw a hair, cleaned it off, and then probably photo documenting where the hair was at um, and making sure that the act of wiping the hair off with that cloth didn't do any damage or leave any residual oils or anything like that behind. So that's, you know, the other reason they're wearing gloves is just the oils of your skin touching those seals um, can be, uh, can degrade them. Again, so meticulous. They have to be so careful. So it looks like they're closing the hatch now, so they must be happy with what they've gotten for uh, pictures and documentation. And like you said, the next big thing here is still about uh, nine-ish minutes away from the plan time to start the leak checks. Let's try to squeeze in another social media question. We have a lot coming in for you, Raja. This one is from Leslie on Twitch, asking, how come launch is so late in the day? Why not earlier? Well, Leslie, it's, uh, it's just driven by the oral dynamics. Sometimes they are in the day, sometimes in the evening, so it's purely driven by the what's called the phasing. And which Dragon, there's hatch closure. Stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. And then note for you, ensure all items are secure from now through launch. Confirmation of side hatch close. Dragon. Yeah, so it's, it's completely dictated by the orbit of the space station, so that's the ultimate target of where Dragon's going. Um, so based on where the space station is um, and the days you're trying to launch, that's what drives, drives the window. And you're trying to minimize the amount of propellant, essentially, that you want to use to do that. So you, have, um, you save opportunities for backup rendezvous. You heard the call there about monitor for state transition. So the crew now, well, you're two, two kind of actions, one to monitor for state transition. So one of the things the crew is watching through all this is what's called the flight computer state of Dragon on their displays. And that is sort of like the major, major shifts in um, what the vehicle is doing, and that kind of drives the main flight computers. Uh, and then you also heard them say, make sure that they don't have any loose items at this point. And that's because now that the hatch is closed, if you were to drop something now, you'd have to open the hatch to go get it. So it would be hmm. not great to, you know, this would not be the time for Mike to get out a pocket snack. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you'll see that, that at this point, pretty much everything they have is either going to be attached to them with a lanyard, uh, or stay on their leg um, just so that there's no chance of it falling. And, and the reason that's a problem is it's, it's not so much a FOD issue or it, you know, affecting something mechanically in the vehicle. It's more what's called a, a flail or if that loose thing were to start flying around the ca cabin during ascent. Mm -hmm. um, worst case, like if it were to like strike a visor or something like that so and cause damage. That was under, you asked about G-loading before, so mm -hmm. although you know, if you were to drop an iPad on your toe now, it wouldn't hurt under 5Gs. That would be five times the weight, and so it could also could potentially hurt or damage something. I mean, most of us can think of it as if we were flying on a commercial plane, right? And like during um, takeoff, we're told to stow our belongings. Right. Yep. Exactly. So right now, they are crouched by the side hatch. Are they about to perform the pressure check, Raja? They are. So you, it's the 17 blocking. You can't see uh, in front of them, but there's a panel um, that they'll eventually cover up before they launch, and they've got some uh, test equipment attached to that. So they're basically checking to make sure that now that the hatch is sealed, in theory, if the seal is good, it should be holding. You can add basically what's called positive pressure to the vehicle and make sure that it's not that that value is holding. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a little while because you have to effect, account for the effects of the temperature difference. So um, people who are you know, maybe in, I guess, right in high school would understand like the gas laws and how pressure, temperature uh, are all related. So you have to account for that and give it time to be thermally stable. But that's essentially what they're doing right now is making sure that if you add pressure to the vehicle, it's not going to escape somehow. Got it. So yeah, essentially the same thing as a suit lead check, but for the, right, entire, but for the entire capsule. capsule. Yep. Yep. And the, and the reason that little panel is off is that's where they run the uh, equipment through to basically add the air and then, and then check the values. And so for those who've been following along with our commercial crew launches, you know that every Dragon astronaut crew brings a stuffed toy with them to space as a zero gravity indicator. When that toy starts floating, the crew, as we've seen, who've been strapped into their seats, 
that's their only visual confirmation that they've reached microgravity. So for the previous crew, Crew 7, that launched August of last year, they brought a stuffed sloth. <laughs> And moments after reaching microgravity, Crew 7's pilot, Andy Mogensen, revealed that his family inspired the toy's selection. They say I'm the slowest person alive, uh, which is also why it's a three-toed sloth, not a two-toed sloth, because apparently that would be too fast for me. So welcome to space, Sasha the Sloth. <laughs> and Raja, this is video of your crew's zero-G indicator. Uh, you guys also had a very specific reason for choosing this one, right? We did, yeah. So ours was a, a blend of all the parts of our crew, so clearly it's a turtle, since uh, Kayla and I were lucky enough to be turtles in space together. Uh, we named it FAO, which is German for turtles, since uh, Matthias Maurer was our ESA astronaut with us. And it's actually specifically a peacock turtle, because Tom Marshburn, the pilot, uh, their class is called the peacocks. So it uh, represented a piece of all of us. And you can see we even had a little space helmet for our turtle, so it could do EVAs with us. Dragon, <laughs> SpaceX, clock ticking past T-minus two hours. Uh, we're going to step into a health check for the launch escape system. Expect a momentary flight computer state change, and then we'll be back in pad hatch closed. Jacket. And we'll talk a lot more about the launch escape system coming up, but really quickly, go ahead. Yeah, so it's basically uh, the system, once there's propellant on the rocket, um, that if there's any kind of problem that the crew needs to immediately get away from the rocket, that uh, it will propel the, the Dragon capsule separate from the F-9 and bring it back on its own. So the health checks, you talked about the reason they're giving that heads up. We mentioned the flight computer state that they're, they're watching. And so they're seeing, you know, the, they're giving that word so that when they see it change to something having to do with the launch escape system, that that's a known planned event as opposed to anything wrong with the launch escape system. Right. So just checking that real quick. A critical piece of equipment that's obviously needed to make sure that in the event of an unlikely emergency that the crew is safe. Real quick, just back to that zero G indicator we were talking about. Of course, that leaves us wondering, what is Crew 8's zero G indicator? I don't know. Do you have any any insight? It's a no, it's a very close held secret. It is. It is. If, it's, if it's well done, it's close. It's, so it's, it's got to be hidden there somewhere, but um, they do a great job of making sure it's uh, out of sight. And it's actually a tradition that's gone back uh, quite a ways. And um, it seems kind of silly, but the reality is when you're actually strapped in that tightly, you, uh, unlike if you're in a roller coaster or in a car and you slam on the brakes and you move forward uh, before the real locks, you're strapped in so tight that when the engine cuts off, you are pretty sure you're in space because you get this sort of feeling with uh, your internal organs starting to move around, but you didn't actually move as you're strapped in so tightly. Right. So to, to, uh, one way to know for sure, other than the fact that you can see the telemetry, um, a, a good mechanical analog backup is if that thing is floating, you are definitely in space. Yeah. And we're going to find out what Crew 8's zero-G indicator is soon after they launch. And when it actually starts floating around in the capsule, we're going to hear some words from them. Uh, so they can explain their choice. Again, also a nice um, thing for the whole team to do. Again, like they design their mission patch together. They pick a zero-G indicator together. Again, it just builds this, this camaraderie and, and feeling of a team. Yeah, and there's a whole, as with everything you said, uh, in, in space, there's so much more extra complication. Uh, so the zero-G indicator has to be tested as well. Uh, oh. So the one I, uh, I have um, is actually the test article for FAO, the, the peacock turtle, because they had sequins on it. So they had, we had to do pull testing of all those sequins to make sure that uh, nothing would come loose in flight mm -hmm. or launch. So um, one FAO is on the space station, the actual one, but the, the, the test article uh, is still here on the Earth with me. Because the sequins could be FAO. They could be FAO, exactly. Wow. Yep. Because since they're slightly metallic, if they were to come loose and then you know short something out. So yeah, it's a, the, the FAO I have was a little bit beat up, but <laughs> has all of its sequence still. <laughs> all right, as you can see from the clock on your screen, we are now under two hours until the liftoff of NASA's SpaceX Crew 8 mission. You're seeing three astronauts and one cosmonaut inside of Dragon Endeavor atop a brand new Falcon 9 rocket on launch pad 39A here at Kennedy Space Center. They are headed to the International Space Station to help maintain the orbiting lab and to conduct science experiments and technology demonstrations. 
You know, and speaking of their six-month trip, Raja, uh, it's going to be a really busy one. Um, first of all, a lot of visiting vehicles, including the first crewed flight of Boeing's Starliner spacecraft. Yeah, it's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Jeanette had the opportunity to kind of see that. Uh, Matt actually worked uh, on the commercial crew program and uh, worked with uh, the Boeing Starliner. So it's, it's pretty exciting to have uh, to be this close to having two vehicles that uh, launch from the U.S. taking astronauts to the space station. So it is, yeah, it is always busy during launch and landing time. But, uh, yeah, we're all looking forward to, to Butch and Sonny, who are the, the primary crew flying the Boeing Starliner, heading up there soon. Yep, it'll be a crew of two, as you said, NASA astronauts, Sonny Williams, Butch Wilmore. The mission will be NASA's Boeing crew flight test. And that flight would move Boeing Starliner spacecraft one step closer to certifying it for regular crewed trips to and from the space station for NASA's commercial crew program. And so while Crew 8 is up there, that's one Dragon of the visiting SpaceX vehicles. Good side hatch leak check. Excellent news. Great news. So you can see them closing out that access panel. Now the leak check's done. They'll put the panel back on there. So in addition to CFT, we'll also have another cargo launch, another NASA astronaut, Tracy Dyson. She's going to arrive to the space station aboard a Soyuz spacecraft, a really dynamic time for Crew 8 to be up there and, and doing work. Yeah, so I think as the, as the space station has you know, now fully completed, it has constantly got uh, traffic going and coming from it, um, bringing new science. So when CRS-30 shows up there, it's always uh, one of the highlights of the times for the crews up there because there's so much science that comes with those cargo vehicles, um, whether they're CRS, whether it's uh, Cygnus, it, it brings up new payloads, and that's how we refresh uh, and keep changing out what science is up there and always cutting edge. And then you mentioned, yeah, TC showing up there in the next Soyuz. She'll replace Laurel, who'll come back down, um, and continuing that flow. So, yeah, Crew 8 will, will get some overlap. Um, with Crew 7, with uh, Laurel and her Soyuz crew, and then uh, quickly they'll be the, the, the ones running everything up there along with TC. And Kuwait is also going to perform at least three spacewalks uh, looking at the summer-spring time frame. One is going to remove radio frequency hardware, another to prep for the installation of two new IROSAs, and then the third to install a new HD camera. Yeah, so definitely a lot of work out there, uh, a lot of work to be done, and that'll keep them very busy. But I think um, you know, spacewalk training is definitely the, the hardest physical and mental thing of the training flow uh, for ASCANs and in the astronaut program, but it's also one of the most rewarding things. And um, definitely, uh, you know, we try to do as much as we can in space using robotics um, or automation, um, but sometimes just like if you had something broken on the outside of their house, the only thing you can do is go out there and fix it. And so. Um, they'll be doing that with the, the radio frequency hardware um, is an uh, S-band antenna that has been having some problems. And so, uh, unfortunately, it can't be fixed on orbit, so it has to be brought inside, brought back down on the ground, fixed, and then sent back up. Um, and then the IROS is, that's uh, another acronym, but basically uh, oh, you're right. <laughs> improved rollout solar arrays, I right. think. Um, and so... Uh, We've, the space station's been continuously uh, occupied for over 25 years, uh, which means we've got better technology, more efficient solar panels. We're, we're putting more science on board, and that science needs more power. And so um, we'll be installing two new sets of uh, solar panel arrays. And it's pretty ingenious how they came up with the way and those uh, people who've seen the space station online or pictures know the solar arrays or the solar, they're called the saws, the solar array wings are massive. They're huge. And so um, if you'd had to take those apart and add new ones that probably wouldn't, it would be very technically difficult. Uh, and so these IROSs actually go on top of the existing ones. They roll out on top as that rollout name implies. And it's mm -hmm. a pretty ingenious solution. Um, and so most of the spacewalk involves rewiring those new ones into the existing electrical system and then actually physically deploying that rollout system. Wow. So again, they're on the space station for six months all those visiting vehicles, all those EVAs, and then Crew 8 uh, will also do a lot of science, as we've been saying. One of the main reasons why we have the International Space Stations, they're going to help facilitate um, research, uh, including whether algae may improve spacecraft life support systems. 
many of the research conducted in microgravity have applications here on Earth um, that improve our everyday lives. Yeah, and I think that's, at least for me, Megan, the most exciting thing about work on the space station. It, I mean, that's why I became an astronaut to begin with. I mean, there's the, there's the exploration piece, but it's really about changing lives here on, on the planet. Um, and so I think the most exciting research we're doing is things that helps us get to the moon, helps us to get to Mars, but also changes how we live here. So whether it's clean water technology, carbon dioxide scrubbing, both those things, we need them to live on other planets. But more importantly, uh, those are technologies that would change the way humanity lives here on Earth. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's so amazing to, to know that you're a small piece of the program, a small piece of the, of the research that does that. Um, it's really an honor for the astronauts to be able to be a, a part of that and knowing that they're the teams they're supporting is part of the research and science that happens on the space station. You can see them removing some more of the uh, parts and pieces that connect the, the white room uh, and that clean room. So now that the hatch is closed and that cover is on, uh, you'll, they'll start disassembling the, the pieces there so that when eventually when the crew arm retracts, nothing still is attached to the, the capsule. Mm -hmm. Seems like a good time now to take another social media question. This one is from Mars06 on Instagram. What does it feel like to travel to space? Uh, I think the best analogy, you kind of feel like a superhero, is the, the ability to float. Oh. Um, so I think that's the, the thing I miss the most, is the being able to just float around. Um, it, it takes a while to adjust. You heard uh, Jeanette mention in her video that um, after about two weeks, she'll be a little more acclimated. That's probably accurate, uh, a, a few days to a few weeks to really completely have your body adjust. But then once you're adjusted, it's uh, truly a joy. Great questions, keep them coming. All you have to do is go on social media, really any platform that you enjoy watching us. But we know a lot come through YouTube, X, Facebook, and Twitch. Use the hashtag AskNASA, and Raja will try to answer them, as many of them as he can. I'm sure, there, I'm sure there's many more that I'll get to, but yeah. <laughs> So you can right. see him attaching the fall harnesses there, um, is they're basically reaching out the, over the platform. So um, those harnesses are just fall protection. And they're basically taking off, like I mentioned, taking the seals off. Because again, up, up until now, this has been a completely com sealed in environment. Now as they take these seals off, you actually are getting the ambient Florida air into mm -hmm. that cavity. Um, but now that the hatch is closed and we know the seal's good, none of that's actually getting inside the spacecraft. Okay, T minus one hour, 47 minutes and counting. So far, a very smooth ahead of schedule countdown. Right now, again, as Raja said, you are watching the closeout team on the pad in the white room, preparing for the crew access arm to Starting retract. SpaceX for the big picture post ingress. Go ahead. All right, crew eight, timeline is ticking down to launch tonight. We've got the side hatch closed and leak checked with some margin. Closeout team is still on the crew arm. I'll give you a further update when they depart. How copy so far? Copy all. All right, no significant updates on vehicle and ground systems. Dragon, Falcon, and the pad look healthy as we continue ticking down. I do have a weather update for you. It's been trending better since our L-4 hour brief. Primary watch item is still flight through precipitation further along the ascent corridor, but we're down to a probability of violation of 1-5%. We've got the meteorologist continuing to track the weather per usual to monitor deviations from the forecast, but it's looking good out there. How copy? Great news, great to hear that trending, thank you. Agree, great news. That's actually all I had. How y'all doing in there? Love and life, hang it out. All right. And I did get some last minute words from Rick on the crew training team. He wanted to pass along some advice specifically to you, Matt, to quote, just don't break anything. Copy all, it's your space rep. We're gonna take good care of it. 
some fun banter back and forth there on the Mission Audio Loops. You were hearing Matt uh, being told not to break anything because right now everything's looking great. No issues with Dragon, Falcon, or the pad. Weather trending better again than yesterday. 85% go. They are looking at uh, some rain uh, farther along the ascent corridor, but still looking good for launch. As yeah. you can see, 85% go. Great news, uh, yeah, and the, the fact that it's trending better is uh, good to hear. Yeah, especially since weather has been plaguing us the last couple of days and, yep. and actually was the reason why we couldn't launch yesterday. Exactly. So as we're looking at a live view of Falcon 9 with Dragon Endeavor and our Crew 8 inside on launch pad 39A, let's take you inside Mission Control in Houston. It's the hub of human spaceflight at NASA, as you can see there, with flight controllers who constantly monitor the International Space Station and the people living on board. They are getting ready for Crew 8's arrival. Let's hear from Rebecca there. Thanks, Megan. Such an exciting mission ahead for Crew 8. I am here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Mission Control Houston. Including Demo 2, today's launch will be NASA's ninth total crewed launch under the Commercial Crew Program, which has enabled the United States to once again launch astronauts from American soil. However, it's not just professional astronauts that visit the International Space Station anymore. The orbiting laboratory was recently home to the third private astronaut mission called Axiom Mission 3, or AX3, with a crew representing four nations. NASA is enabling these private astronaut missions to open up space unlike ever before and lay the framework for a commercial low Earth orbit economy where NASA will become just one of many customers. On January 18th of this year, the AX3 crew launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center, which is where Crew 8 is launching from today. The AX3 crew spent about two weeks on board the station, completing over 30 important research experiments and conducting dozens of outreach activities. Accompanying AX3 during their stay and currently awaiting Crew 8 is the Expedition 70 crew. When Crew 8 arrives at the space station, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 8, but rather join as Expedition 70 flight engineers. We have a photo of Expedition 70 that is currently on board station and looking forward to the arrival of their new crewmates. Seated in the middle left is International Space Station Expedition Commander and European Space Agency astronaut Andy Mogensen. Next to him is NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, seated there. Heading back to the left are Roscosmos cosmonauts Nikolai Chub, Konstantin Borisov, and Oleg Kononenko. Next is Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and on the far right is NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. As the station is first and foremost a laboratory, the crew will jump right into conducting experiments with new research still to be delivered on upcoming cargo flights. NASA's commercial strategy for low Earth orbit will provide the government with safe and reliable services while also supporting an entire commercial ecosystem where NASA will be just one of many customers. To learn more, let's take a look at this video. LEO. It stands for Low Earth Orbit. That's a portion of outer space about 250 miles up. And for over 20 years, it's been home to the world's most unique laboratory, the International Space Station. In this weightless environment, the space station has enabled scientific and engineering breakthroughs that just weren't possible on Earth. It's taught us more about our planet, physics and biology, and it's preparing humans to travel farther from home than ever before. And as the space station approaches its end of life, America will maintain leadership in LEO by enabling a new era of commercial spaceflight. Through the Commercial LEO Development Program, NASA is working with industry partners to develop the first generation of commercial space destinations. These will be privately owned and operated space facilities, where NASA will be just one of many customers. This new orbital economy will stimulate commerce and usher in the next generation of aerospace engineering, opening the door for scientific discoveries and private astronauts allowing NASA to continue its critical research in LEO, supporting deep space exploration and bringing those benefits back home to Earth. T-minus one hour, 40 minutes from launch. As we're taking a live look inside the White Room, 
which is at the end of the crew access arm. This is how the crew ingressed into their Dragon spacecraft, which as you can see, the side hatch has now been closed and will not reopen until the crew splashes down six months from now. We've been talking about the crew's destination, the ISS, and how it's an incredible orbiting lab. So let's check out some of the research that's up there that has helped us down here. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The, the spectacular vantage point at more than 200 miles the above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, it, and plant life. The orbital perspective that we have here on the ISS is just absolutely amazing. Earth is gorgeous. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. So during that video, you might have heard the team over the mission audio loop saying that the closeout team has departed the pad. So now you see them, they're not in the white room any longer. They cross the crew access arm, they're down one level and they will be leaving the pad shortly, right? Yep. Yeah, and all that information they're telling them that is that you can see shadows. I mean, the crews restrain their seat, and especially once their seats rotate, you can't really see out the window, but you can see movement and stuff outside the windows. Um, so just giving them uh, the situational awareness that they shouldn't be seeing that anymore. If they are seeing movement, that would mean something else is <coughs> happening um, with equipment. And it also gives them awareness. Uh, so one of the things that we talked about earlier is uh, emergency egress. And so the crew is always kind of keeping track of how many people are on the pad. Um, because if you have to use those slide wire baskets, you have to make sure everyone's accounted for. And so this is all that, there's a purpose to all that communication to let them know uh, who's there and not there. Thanks for that insight, Raja. Let's talk about Crew 8's mission patch. You know, they designed it together, and let's take a look at it now. We have the dragon bowing with respect to the ISS as it stands watch over Endeavor. Endeavor, of course, is the spacecraft that's flying Crew 8 to the ISS, therefore enabling a continuous human presence on the lab in low Earth orbit. The dragon's tail, of course, in the shape of a number eight. The crew also wanted to highlight the international effort on the station, and that's why you see a world map in the background. And also, each Crew-8 astronaut is allowed to bring a few personal items with them for their roughly six-month stay in space. Here's a few of the things Crew-8 says they're taking up. So we will do left to right. Alexander we have there. Family photos and things that remind him of home. Mike Barrett, the pilot. He said the coolest thing he's taking with him is his crew. <laughs> but he also plans to fly mementos for people who've inspired and supported him throughout his life. 
as well as specifically, Raja, hard copy photos of his family. Then we have Matt, Commander. So he said that his dad had the same style watch provided to Apollo astronauts, and his dad recently gifted that watch to him. So he will be bringing that up to the space station with him. And then Jeanette, she'll be bringing up a photo of her mom. And for those who don't know this, her mom passed away five days after Jeanette was selected to be an astronaut in June 2009. And Jeanette says she wouldn't be here sitting in Dragon Endeavor without her mom's work ethic and the emphasis that she instilled in her, emphasis on education growing up. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, it's, uh, there's not a whole lot of room to, to put things in your suit pockets, but some of the most precious things uh, for you and your loved ones are usually what go there. So in my case, it was uh, my wedding ring and then some... Um, basically pieces that I, my children in the future use for their weddings, hopefully if they choose to do that, since they're still younger now. But that was giving them the option uh, to have something significant that uh, flew with me to space for their eventual marriages. That's a really great, thoughtful thing. It was not my idea. It was passed on to me by someone ah. else who thought it. It was, it was probably passed on to them by someone else. But, it's but nice yeah. of you to admit that. <laughs> Again, speaking I think of Jeanette's... I, I passed it on to Jasmine as well, so it's probably <laughs> part of her answer as well. Oh, Jasmine McBelly, Crew yeah, 7. Yeah. Ah, mm -hmm. Speaking of Jeanette's work ethic, uh, as we were talking about, she's probably one of the most thoroughly cross-trained astronauts in the Corps right now because, again, trained in Soyuz, Starliner, and now Dragon. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we said Mike Barrett has done shuttle and Soyuz and Dragon, but, uh, yeah, um, uh, unique and definitely not something that all the astronauts are doing. It's a, it's a good problem to have, to have this many vehicles to train in, um, but definitely also a challenge to keep track of that many different systems and, and differences between the vehicles. So um, she's uniquely qualified having seen all of them. Again, a beautiful shot of the launch pad. We're flying a new Falcon 9 booster, Dragon Endeavor flying on its fifth flight. That's the most for any Dragon spacecraft. Right, Raja? Yeah, it's uh, the fleet leader. Um, and the original, uh, the original certification done by the commercial crew program, which just the fact that we were reusing capsules to begin with was, you know, new boundary breaking and, and not an unprecedented. So this is the fact the program and SpaceX pulled that off together. Um, in and of itself is amazing, and now here they're at five. Uh, and so after this, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of analysis, um, uh, taking a really close look at uh, how the vehicles actually performed over the five flights um, and, and what the forward steps are. But uh, it's pretty amazing to, to even, yeah, like early mentioned the broadcast, like five years ago, just the idea of saying like, oh, it's on its fifth flight. I mean, we wouldn't even, that wouldn't have been in the vernacular, and now it's just talking about it as if it's, oh yeah, of course it's the fifth flight. What else would it be? So it's um, the, the the impossible has become the common. Right, and the plan for uh, the commercial crew program is after Endeavour flies on its fifth flight, they'll evaluate it uh, and work with SpaceX to maybe determine whether or not it could be recertified to fly additional flights. Exactly, yeah, or, and I think there'll be, like I said, a lot of analysis that you may not have to refurbish the whole capsule, maybe there's certain key components or parts uh, or critical pieces, um, but yeah, we'll really dig in um, with the help of the folks at Johnson, KSC, and Marshall, and really all the NASA centers that, that help the commercial crew program um, to figure out uh, how we can continue using it. T minus one hour, 31 minutes, 40 seconds and counting until Dragon Endeavor, as we've been talking about, flies its next four person crew to the International Space Station. The astronauts we're tracking today Commander Matt Dominic, Pilot Michael Barrett. Mission Specialists Jeanette Epps and Alexandra Gubenkin. A live view of them there. Up next, the launch escape health check, Raja, or are we early? Uh, they called one earlier. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was the, a, if they just got ahead of timeline to knock it out or if we'll see it again. Uh, but in either case, uh, it's before they start the prop loading and actually have to arm it for real. Um, they're mostly likely just checking to make sure it can transition between states. And that, that flight computer state, you hear, <coughs> keep hearing them talk about, that's important in the Dragon software architecture, because essentially that state is what dictates what things you can do. Uh, so for example, if it's in the launch state, 
uh, you could have a, a launch escape trigger, but once it's in orbit, it's not in that state anymore, so those, those, all those systems are saved. And so that's why the, a really key vehicle parameter they're always watching is what is the state it is in, because that is what enables different commands. I see. And Dragon's launch escape system is powered by eight Super Draco engines. They're mounted in pairs uh, around the exterior of the capsule. And each engine is capable of generating 16,000 pounds of thrust. And there's a system of sensors throughout the Falcon 9. Those sensors feed telemetry to the ship's flight computer, which constantly monitors the performance of those critical components. So if there is a major malfunction, if that is detected, that flight computer is programmed to automatically fire the Super Draco engines to propel Dragon away from the Falcon 9 rocket at a rate of a half a mile in 7.5 seconds. So really, um, this system can move the crew away from the rocket if there were an emergency. Right, and that's, I, that's one of the biggest uh, <clears throat> improvements to crew safety that the commercial crew program has brought us um, with both the, the Dragon and the Starliners. Uh, a robust launch escape or uh, system. Um, so, like you mentioned, designed to be automated, but also a able to be activated manually by the, the commander and the pilot who have a way to, to force uh, launch escape. And that acceleration is important because keep in mind, if it happens during launch, the, the rocket is still accelerating, so you actually need to accelerate even faster than the rocket uh, to get away from it. Right, yeah, good point. This launch escape system can uh, be triggered either while still on the pad but also during flight. Right, basically all the way until it's called orbital insertion. Uh, it has the ability to, to be able to safely uh, launch escape from the, the F-9. So we'll be arming that launch escape system just before propellant loading of Falcon 9 at T minus 35 minutes. Now with Crew 8 going up, that means Crew 7 will be returning home. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, JAXA's Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos' Konstantin Borisov. You see them there? They launched from Kennedy Space Center in August of last year. They've been living and working on the space station now for six months. And once Crew 8 arrives, there's going to be, called, uh, there's going to be a, what's called a handover for about five days, and then Crew 7 will undock from the ISS no earlier than March 11th. So, Raja, what, what is this handover period? What happens during that time? So usually it's about a, a minimum of five days for the, the new crew to have some overlap or on-the-job training with the outgoing crew. Uh, all the crews are already trained when they show up there, but really uh, that handover period is for all the little mini things that are impossible to cover in training. Like, where do you keep the camera covers? Uh, you know, where's the microphone for that camera? Uh, where did you leave out? Uh, you know, every crew maybe organizes the food a little bit differently in terms of how you, you know, we have breakfast food here and lunch food there, or maybe we break it up by there's meats in this drawer and vegetables in this one. So it's uh, kind of all those little day, uh, day in the life things. Um, and, uh, and as you heard Mike say earlier, the space station is constantly changing. The, every cargo vehicle that shows up there changes the configuration. And so what you saw in training may not actually be the same in some areas. And so getting those kind of real-time specifics from the crew who's there are, are pretty important. Uh, and then you also side saddle a lot of the tasks. And so just kind of getting their hand over on, you saw some of the exercising and the exercise equipment. Um, some of those things are have maintenance you do based on um, use, and so they can give you that, that handover. And one thing specific to this handover with Crew 7, I thought this was interesting, the astronauts are going to be testing new water bottles? Yeah, so soft water bags that uh, we'll use hopefully on future uh, Dragon launches, potentially as part of the Artemis program as well. Um, and the idea is that the hard plastic water bottles, they're not super efficient to get all the water out and they take up more room when you pack it down. Whereas a soft water bottle, um, you can squeeze so you can get all the water out of it. It's a lot easier to compact and you can refill it potentially. So on the Orion vehicle, that's uh, also a use case as well. So um, definitely an improvement uh, and and trying to always come up with better and more efficient ways because water, as it turns out, is pretty heavy to take up and down to space. And so as we look towards lunar and Mars missions, the more efficient we can be with that, the better. So a lot of planning and coordination uh, has to happen to bring astronauts home safely. So I want to introduce everyone now to Samantha Testa, who is a recovery director for NASA's Commercial Crew Program. 
I am a NASA Recovery Director for the Commercial Crew Program, so my job is to coordinate and lead the NASA team that brings the astronauts home from the International Space Station after their roughly six-month mission in space. I think something that's surprising about commercial crew, especially right now flying with SpaceX, is that we're landing capsules in the ocean both in the Gulf and the Atlantic side of the state of Florida. We're bouncing between coasts of Florida when we're bringing these astronauts home. We are continuously learning about the hardware associated with the capsule, the parachutes, the recovery vessel, and from the team itself, including the astronauts. My first mission stands out to me the most. Um, I was new to the commercial crew program. Um, it was the Crew 3 return mission. Uh, we were still coming out of the pandemic, which was a challenge for you know, everybody around the world, but in, you know, including NASA. Um, finding ways to make sure that our astronauts were safe, our landing recovery teams were safe, our partners in SpaceX were safe. So seeing that mission, the challenges that we saw, the way we overcame them together as a team, um, and having that mission be successful as my first with commercial crew is something that will stay with me for a long time. Really cool insight there, again, speaks to all the folks that help make a mission like this possible. All right, everyone, we have another QR code for you. This one will show you how you can download NASA's new Spot the Station app. So for those who don't know, the International Space Station is the third brightest object in the sky. And this app, if you scan that QR code on your screen, will help you see it while it's orbiting the Earth at over 17,000 miles per hour. The app can send you push notifications. It'll look just like this you see on the top there, of upcoming viewing opportunities based on your location. The app will also track the station location in real time, showing you uh, where in the sky you need to look. And you can also take a picture or record a video and share it to social media all directly from the app. Pretty cool. OK, looking at the clock again, we are 1 hour and 23 minutes, 34 seconds from launch, again, of Crew 8 to the International Space Station. Crew has ingressed, as you can see, helped by the closeout team, umbilicals, they're attached, and those provide breathing air and comms to Dragon. Their suits were checked, were pressure checked, comm, ch comm checks were completed. The closeout team also closed the seal, uh, sorry, closed the hatch, which also gets its own leak check. And that team has now departed and we will be hearing final weather checks before a no-go, go, no-go no poll for launch. Before we get to that final poll, the various teams at both NASA and SpaceX will do internal polls, making sure conditions are right with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station. That's a lot of moving parts and a lot of conversations. Uh, kind of like I mentioned, it's a really the epitome of the partnership between NASA and SpaceX that, that makes that happen. So we kind of talked a little bit about it before, but, uh, you know, I think what a lot of people don't necessarily even realize and, you know, just the amount of data uh, and rigor and analysis that goes into these crewed launches. Um, and so we take that really, really seriously, obviously, at NASA and at SpaceX. Uh, and so even down to the engine component. So the Merlin engines on the, the F-9 actually have heritage from, from Marshall Space Flight Center who helped SpaceX early on, you know, back when they were first developing the engines. And so we still have experts there that are looking at pouring over the data uh, as, as they start to the final count. Um, like I mentioned, you've got the folks from the commercial crew program who are the called SMEs or subject matter experts in all kinds of different systems who are essentially uh, also monitoring the telemetry um, kind of uh, overseeing everything and, and at all points conferring with SpaceX, and consulting with them, make sure that everyone agrees uh, that everything looks good. So it's a, the, the team has just continued to, to flourish and that those partnerships have, have worked really well. We have a nice shot now of Crew 8's ride to space, Dragon Endeavor. We've been talking a lot about it tonight. Again, the first time SpaceX and NASA will fly a Dragon spacecraft for the fifth time. Here's a look back at its previous flights and why it was named Endeavour. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, bottom dive. May 30th, 2020. 
Dragon Capsule C-206 launched Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken to the International Space Station. It had been almost nine years since astronauts lifted off from U.S. soil. The historic launch also marked the first crewed flight by a commercial company under NASA's commercial crew program. In a tour of the spacecraft shortly after launch, Behnken and Hurley announced why they named the capsule Endeavour. Uh, we both had our first flights on Shuttle Endeavour and uh, it just meant so much to us to carry on that name. Uh, that's what we decided to go with. Endeavour was also the name of the Apollo 15 command module that orbited the moon while a fourth pair of astronauts worked on the lunar surface. April 2021, Dragon Endeavour's second mission, Crew-2, launched from Kennedy Space Center carrying U.S. astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, along with JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide and ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet. Endeavour splashed down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, after spending 199 days in orbit, a record for an American crew transport spacecraft. A year later, Endeavour's third flight, Axiom Mission 1, a privately funded and operated mission to the International Space Station. Astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria and three civilians spent 16 days docked to the ISS before splashing down in the Atlantic Ocean. Then last year, Crew-6 was Endeavour's fourth flight. It launched NASA astronauts Stephen Bowen and Warren Hoburg, along with cosmonaut Andrei Fedeyev and UAE astronaut Sultan Alnayadi to the space station. Endeavour splashed down off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida after 3,000 orbits of Earth and 79 million miles traveled during its six months in space. Over its four flights, Endeavour spent more than 450 days in orbit, the most by a crewed spacecraft surpassing Space Shuttle Discovery's 365 days. Next up for Endeavour, Crew-8, and another record, the first vehicle in its generation to reach five flights. And as we count down to launching our next crew of four in Endeavour to the International Space Station, let's get a check of our Artemis II astronauts. You can see them there. Work on their launch pad is underway as NASA prepares for their historic mission around the moon. Earlier this year, teams with NASA's Exploration Ground Systems began installing and testing these emergency egress baskets at Launch Pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The baskets are in preparation for the agency's crewed lunar missions, starting with Artemis II. If an evacuation at the launch pad is necessary, astronauts and other personnel will use the egress baskets to quickly evacuate from the mobile launcher. You're getting a sped up, first person point of view of that ride now. They're like gondolas in a ski lift and you slide down more than 1,300 feet of cable to the ground. There are four emergency baskets, each about the size of a small SUV and can carry up to five people. Once everyone is safely on the ground, teams operating specialized emergency vehicles will drive them away from the launch pad. That's your Artemis Moon Minute. Next for that emergency egress system, teams will test the baskets by placing water tanks filled at different levels so those can simulate the different weights of passengers. And once that's done, then the Artemis II crew themselves are going to practice that evacuation route. Yeah, kind of like we talked about earlier uh, with Crew 8 here and knowing who's on the tower, who's not on the tower. Similar thing for the Artemis II crew is knowing how many people could be in each basket. And that's why they'll do the different tests for all the different possible configurations and permutations you could have. Um, and uh, you know, clearly testing it with, with ballast before you actually put people in it. And you're um, uh, having a, a big hand in the Artemis campaign, yeah? Yeah, I think our entire office is involved, which is one of the, one of the most exciting parts of our jobs. I mean, obviously flying in space is great, um, but most of our day jobs are is, is helping with all the other human spaceflight programs, whether it's the ISS, uh, SpaceX, Boeing, uh, and the multitude of Artemis programs. You kind of heard them there in the, the video, EGS, the Exploration Ground Systems, all the work that we call at stage zero for building the pad. Um, I'm working with SpaceX and Blue Origin on the Lunar Lander, which we call the HLS program. There's the rocket, the SLS, uh, there's the Orion capsule. So there is no shortage of uh, work going on for Artemis right now. And, uh, and the astronaut office is, is heavily involved in, in helping with all of that. Yeah, all hands on deck. 
exactly. Must be exciting for you guys to think about that. And, and the speed, again, at which we are making so much progress in, in human spaceflight. You know, we are doing such great things with the Commercial Crew Program, as we've been saying since 2020. We've accomplished so much, and now we're looking ahead with the Artemis campaign. Yeah, it's a, it's a great time to be working at NASA. And so many, you know, whether it's thinking ahead to Mars architecture, uh, the moon's sustainment, how we get there, stay there, whether it's operating, living, doing amazing science on the space station, uh, there is really no bad place you could possibly be working or supporting right now uh, within the agency. And for Artemis updates, you can scan the QR code that we're going to bring up on your screen. You can also screen grab. I don't know if you knew that, Raja. I if you were watching it on your phone and you see a QR oh, yeah, code nice. like that, you can't scan it. <laughs> so you could just screen grab it. And then from that picture, just click on it. And it'll take you to nasa.gov slash Artemis hyphen two. Again, we'd love for you guys to follow along with us as we explore our universe. Yeah, and so it's not, uh, like we talked about before, it's not just the development going on, but all the training that the Artemis II crew is involved in and, um, you know, being out in the Pacific. So we've got operations on both coasts with the uh, help from uh, our DOD partners on the East Coast for Dragon, and then just uh, this past few days on the West Coast and in the Pacific for Artemis. We are now at one hour, 14 minutes, until the liftoff of Crew 8 to the International Space Station. The three astronauts and one cosmonaut will be the latest crew to fly as part of NASA's commercial pr crew program, which uses private companies to transport people to and from the orbiting lab from right here on U.S. soil. You can see the crew there. They are flying on board a SpaceX Dragon named Endeavor. We've been talking about it, record fifth flight for this spacecraft. It's being launched today on a new Falcon 9 booster, which you can tell because it doesn't have that telltale soot on it. Nice and clean. <laughs> Raja, it's been a great countdown so far. Oftentimes we are ahead of schedule. Weather was the big watch item for us, but right now we are 85% go here at the launch site. We were also keeping a close eye on the ascent corridor and weather there has been trending in the right direction for us. So the excitement is really picking up here as we get closer to, to T0, right, Raja? Yep, it's definitely uh, definitely palpable. Um, this is probably one of the most uh, challenging times for this crew because you're so ready to go, but they're also just, with, uh, since everything has been going nominally, uh, it's kind of some quiet time. And so, um, kind of like I mentioned, most likely they're kind of just going over and over through all the different steps for the ascent all the different possibilities, um, talking through the notes they had from before, uh, from the different sims, um, and just kind of re re-emphasizing everything one more time. And for those who might be setting an alarm so that they don't miss tonight's launch, T0 is 1053 and 38 seconds Eastern time. We have time now for another Ask NASA question. Let's pull one up on the screen here again for Raja, who's been doing a great job. And actually, somebody recorded a video for you. Oh. So yeah, this will be cool. So this one is actually from a former NASA engineer turned STEM influencer on social media. His name is Mark Rober, and he was here visiting Kennedy Space Center recently, and he had a question that only an astronaut can answer. How's it going? Mark Rover here. I've got an Ask NASA question. And my question is, I remember the first time I looked through an actual telescope and just like what that felt like to see stars with my own eyes in a way that I'd never seen them before. So my question is, as an astronaut, what was it like the first time you got to space and you kind of looked out the windows and not only did you get to look out and see space and the stars with no light pollution for the first time ever, but also looking back on Earth, like what was that moment like? What did that feel like? Yeah, for me, it's, it was pretty surreal. I, I don't even know how to put it totally into words. In fact, um, Tom Marshburn, who was the person on our flight who had flown, his whole goal uh, on the ascent after we'd unstrapped was to, to actually just to watch us looking out the window to see our reaction um, and just the joy 
that we had and the joy that brings to another person seeing a human have that much joy. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the stars look a little different, but I think what's, it, for me at least, what was even more powerful is the Earth, seeing the Earth from that vantage point um, and, and seeing really the layers of the atmosphere of the Earth is, is a pretty powerful thing. Um, and I, they, the idea, too, of what's a really neat thing that you can only do in microgravity is you can rotate your body so that you see it in different orientations. So, so often we're used to seeing the horizon as a flat horizontal surface, um, but, but in space you can just rotate your body 90 degrees and see it vertically, and it, it makes the Earth, which should be very familiar and um, which where we all obviously all live, but it gives it the sense of it. You're looking at like a completely different planet just because you're not used at all to seeing in that orientation. It's such a power visu powerful visual uh, experience. And for me, just emphasized uh, how important it is to take care of the planet we live on. Wow, that was a beautiful shot. V Time with your beautiful answer <laughs> again of, of the experience it is to be in space. Thank you for that question. And a quick note, if you're in Brevard County here on Florida's Space Coast, you can listen along to tonight's launch on local amateur radio frequencies that you see on your screen. I think I would mess those up if I were to say them out loud, so just take the time that you need here to write those down. Again, only available if you're here in Brevard County, Florida. Great view of the rocket there. If you're just joining us, welcome to live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's eighth rotational flight of three NASA astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station from Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and this is NASA astronaut Rajachari, who's been gracious to spend the last three hours with us as we count down to the launch again of Crew 8. With just about an hour left, Raja, talk to me about how you're feeling. How has this count been going? Yeah, it's been going great, which is the way you want it to be. Um, I think we've seen lots of times tonight where the crew's ahead of timeline, where the launch control team's ahead of timeline, which is always a good, a good feeling to have. And we've talked about you know, the things they're doing in that free time is configuring the vehicle, going through, you know, talking amongst the crew. So we're not hearing all that intercom chatter, but that's uh, basically what's going on inside. Uh, the next big steps, uh, I think we expect a, a, another weather update. Things like, seems like everything's trending positively. Um, and then from there, the, starting the propellant load, which is the next big step. Yeah. Now, the launch team stood down from yesterday's attempt due to elevated winds along the ascent corridor. But today, weather look, is looking a lot better. 85% uh, go here at the launch site. And conditions have improved over the ascent corridor as well. It's looking like a good day for a launch, Raja. Yep, it's looking, uh, let's, let's keep our fingers crossed, but yeah, if the trends continue um, and uh, we don't have to worry about the precipitation of the launch corridor, we should be hopefully be ready to, to send Crew 8 on the way to the space station. Yeah, launch teams are still uh, keeping a close eye on the weather. We expect another weather briefing at the T minus one hour mark, so we'll be listening in for that. Now, liftoff time is still holding for 10.53 and 38 seconds Eastern time. And right now, we're tracking no issues with either Falcon 9 or Dragon, which you're seeing there on the pad. A, a beautiful reveal from behind the vehicle assembly building there. No issues with Dragon, as we said. No issues with Falcon 9. And the range is, is green, Raja. Safe to fly. Ready to go, yeah. And uh, as you've heard several times tonight uh, with Matt talking uh, and the crew talking with the, the controllers, they are excited. They're ready to go. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks to be a beautiful night for the folks that are here at Kennedy Space Center to be able to, to watch the launch. So you've got the, the immediate families. So we saw those uh, when they walked out, the ones who were in quarantine. Um, that'll be on top of the LCC to be able to watch the launch. And then the extended family and then uh, lots and lots of visitors here to see you know, the fifth flight of Endeavor, which again is just amazing. Uh, just to think about five flights on a vehicle that only five years ago flew the first time. Now, over the last three hours, our crew has been getting ready for their trip to space. 
Let's introduce you to them now if you're just joining us. We have in the commander's seat, NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic making his debut space flight. He's from Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and is a former naval aviator. Sitting next to him, Matthew. Sitting next to Matthew is Michael Barrett, today's pilot, making his third trip to low Earth orbit. He is board certified in internal and aerospace medicine. Next up, mission specialist Jeanette Epps. This NASA astronaut hails from Syracuse, New York, and once worked as a CIA intelligence officer. Mission Specialist 2, Alexandra Grabenkin, was selected to be a cosmonaut in 2018, and this will also be his first trip to space. So three first-time flyers and one veteran. Yeah, and uh, what a great veteran uh, to take them up there. Mm -hmm. Mike Barrett, such a, a great mentor, such a great leader in the office, um, has got so much experience. Uh, and you saw just a, a really cool span of those different pictures of all the training that goes on, whether it's at Hawthorne, you saw Jeanette down here at Kennedy Space Center practicing with the egress system, um, using those, those Humvees that we saw in the Artemis uh, video. Uh, you saw Matt and Mike uh, different places out at uh, JSC, so pretty impressive. Yeah, impressive crew, impressive what they've done to get here yeah. to today. Okay, so let's take a moment to also recap launch day preparations, right? So after waking up and having a bite to eat, SpaceX helped the astronauts into their suits inside the historic crew quarters suit-up room. You see them there? Jeanette, looking happy, ready? They also played a card game, which is a tradition. It's to beat the commander to use up all of his or her bad luck before the flight. Then the crew followed in the same footsteps as every NASA astronaut since Apollo 7 in 1968, walking out to greet a crowd of family and friends. After getting into their Teslas, the astronauts joined a security-escorted caravan for about a 15, 20-minute ride to Launch Complex 39A. Following their arrival, they got to take a look at their rocket, their ride to space. Then in pairs, they walked across the crew access arm and into their spacecraft. And now we are watching them live while they await the next big milestones, fueling of the Falcon 9 rocket and arming the launch escape system. Yeah, and uh, kind of the reason they're using all this time now is once the launch escape system is armed, uh, you'll see the crew will be pretty much still. They're gonna keep their, their arms, their hands, their legs all pretty much inside the restraint and motionless and because that's if there was a launch escape, it's, as we talked about earlier, pretty forceful and happens really fast. And so you wouldn't want to have your hand out or doing something like that. So um, this is the time to get all the little you know, movements out or get yourself comfortable, uh, make sure everything's fine. You've got everything configured the way you want. And it's also the time they'll do all their scrolling on the displays to go through the procedures. Because again, once the launch escape system is armed, you'll, they will probably minimize the amount they're moving around other than going through those displays. So. Um, it's a it's good when they're ahead like this because you can you you don't want to be rushed to going into that and so having the chance to review and talk through that as a crew on the intercom is, is super helpful. And Raj, as we take these beautiful aerials again from a helicopter that we have orbiting the pad, I have an update on the weather. They had another weather briefing, and we are now 90 percent go. Great news. Great, Trending great news. better. Yep. So I, my guess is uh, with a small percentage change when they do the next update for the crew they'll probably pass that on to them but um, that's uh, good to hear. Now at this time we are expanding our coverage and would like to welcome SpaceX and NASA commentators joining us live from Hawthorne California that's where the SpaceX mission team is located so we want to welcome now Sandra and Jesse. Thanks, Megan, and hello to each and every one of you joining us Dragon today. SpaceX I'm Sandra Jones with NASA Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a manufacturing engineering manager here at SpaceX. Briefly. Sandra and I are joining you today uh, from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, as we count down to liftoff of Crew 8 just about Dragon an hour copy. from now. Of course, Crew 8 is our eighth operational mission with SpaceX flying astronauts for long duration missions to the International Space Station. Crew 8 will have three first time flyers on board as well as a veteran NASA astronaut. 
Today's crew will fly aboard the Dragon spacecraft named Endeavour, which previously flew NASA's SpaceX Demo-2, Crew-2, and Crew-6 missions, in addition to AX-1, the first commercial astronaut mission to the space station. For those of you following along, Endeavour will be the first Dragon spacecraft to fly five times. It's also been five years since the Demo-1 mission, which was the first demonstration mission of NASA's commercial crew pr program to the space station. And Dragon, we and saw fast good forward feedback to today. from Dragon, we saw good feedback from all closed. the valves there. And at this time, your go for section five. When ready, report go for launch. Copy, section five, we'll go. and some great comms between the core and the crew proceeding through procedures. So fast forward to today, it's only March, and it's already been a very busy year for the teams here at SpaceX and NASA. So far this year, we've launched two missions to the space station. Crew 8 will be our second human spaceflight mission so far this year following Axiom 3. And for the very first time, SpaceX delivered a Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft to the space station on our cargo resupply mission. On the heels of that mission, Falcon 9 launched NASA's Ocean Studying Pace satellite on a polar trajectory from the Cape. And just last month, we launched our first Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLPS, mission to the moon for NASA, which we'll talk a little bit more later in the program. All of these missions we just mentioned continue to bring us closer and closer to our ultimate SpaceX, ambitions Dragon, of going eight, further into space. Copy, Crew 8, go for launch. Let's do it. And great news there. We are go for launch. It's such an exciting time for all things space. History is being made every single day. It continues to be a smooth countdown, and we're looking good for an on-time launch, as we just heard. Coming up at T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for propellant load with a final go, no go poll. So in the meantime, NASA's Rebecca Turkington is going to help us take a closer look at where the crew is headed tonight. Rebecca? Thanks, Jesse and Sandra. We are back in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Mission Control, Houston. The crew will be making their journey today to low Earth orbit, which you may hear us refer to as LEO. This is classified as orbits around Earth that are 1,200 miles or lower. There are a lot of satellites in this orbit, including the Hubble Telescope. And of course, today's destination, the International Space Station. The space station's orbit averages at 250 miles above Earth, but varies based on its apogee or perigee, which stands for the highest and lowest points of its orbit. As we discussed earlier, the orbiting laboratory was recently home to the third private astronaut mission called AX-3, with a crew representing four nations. NASA is enabling these private astronaut missions to lay the framework for a commercial low-Earth orbit economy, where NASA will become just one of many customers. The AX-3 crew spent about two weeks on board the station, completing important research experiments and conducting outreach reach activities. They also took some beautiful shots of the Earth, like this one. Axe 3 Mission Commander Michael Lopez Alegria took this photo of the moon peeking out from one of the space station solar arrays. NASA's Crew-7 is currently on board the station and has also captured some amazing shots recently. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli took this photo of rare noctilucent clouds, which form in the Earth's mesosphere about 30 to 50 miles above the Earth. These are the highest clouds in the atmosphere and are made up of ice crystals, whereas other clouds are made up primarily of water droplets. We cannot wait to see what Crew-8 captures. As we get closer to launch, let's take a look to see what's in store for Crew-8 while on board the International Space Station. I view Crew-8 like an Olympic torchbearer. Each nation that hosts the Olympics has, you know, these torchbearers that go along and they, you know, they make a scene of it and they, each person passes the torch and lights the torch and passes it on to the next person. And that's where I see Crew-8. We are keeping the flame of human presence in low Earth orbit alive by going up there, maintaining the space station, continuing to do science. Well, the International Space Station is by far the largest laboratory that we've ever had in flight, obviously the largest human-made structure in low Earth orbit. So whatever we can do in space to look at different types of materials, to look at ourselves without the force of gravity to discover its true nature, we can develop better countermeasures back here on Earth. 
You know, the International Space Station is capable as it is, becomes like a low Earth orbit wind tunnel, if you will. It gives us a platform to test things before we venture away from low Earth orbit towards the moon and eventually long transits towards Mars and, and eventually to asteroids. Это работа, связанная с различными э, научными составляющими. Это и материаловедение, это и биология. Э, то есть спектр задач, э, решаемых на орбите, он достаточно широкий. Each individual will be an experiment in and of themselves. How our cells behave, how our blood changes, how our bone density changes, muscle mass. We're looking at everything to figure out countermeasures for the human body so that it can live longer and longer outside the Earth's protection. Working and training with Crew 8 is absolutely awesome. We have a diverse group of academic and intellectual backgrounds that come together and also an international component. We are four, I would say, almost as different personalities as you could possibly imagine. The, the chemistry we've kind of developed, I think, is, is really quite magic. This mission has brought us together in a way that I don't think any other circumstances ever would. The ISS is, I would say, a very critical stepping stone in human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Every time we launch four more people to space, we're building our sample size and our understanding of the human body and the things that happen to it in a zero gravity environment. That sets us up to go to the moon. It sets us up to go to Mars. So for us, we are just carrying that torch to go increase that sample size and be a part of the team that moves human knowledge of space travel further. Reusability is the key to making spaceflight more routine and ultimately what will enable humans to become multiplanetary. Down at Starbase Texas, we're continuing to build, test, and fly Starship, the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed. It's a fully reusable transportation system and will transform how we access space because it's designed to carry a massive amount of cargo and large numbers of people to Earth orbit, the moon, Mars, and beyond, which will help continue driving down the cost per launch. Starship will be capable of carrying up to 150 metric tons to orbit and up to 100 passengers. We're still in the testing phase, but major milestones like flying at a high cadence, full system reuse, and on-orbit refilling are key priorities. We're also building a second star-based launch tower to further increase Starship's flight opportunities. This will also allow for continuous upgrades to the towers while continuing to launch. Also in testing, our engineers are proving out all systems necessary to make a trip to the moon possible, such as propulsion, life support, and even the elevator that will take crew and cargo from the Starship hatch opening down to the lunar surface. In partnership with NASA, Starship will put the first Artemis astronauts on the moon. The vehicle will perform one uncrewed demonstration flight before the Artemis III mission, which will be the first human surface expedition since 1972. To that end, SpaceX has been hard at work getting Starship ready for its moon missions. With the ability to deliver cargo and people to the lunar surface, we'll be ready to help humanity build a sustainable presence on the moon and learn how to live off-world before the next steps to Mars. Just last month, SpaceX launched a lunar lander on Falcon 9 that became the first U.S. lunar landing since the Apollo program ended more than 50 years ago. That's right. On February 15th, as part of a commercial mission by the company Intuitive Machines, they sent a lunar lander to the surface of the moon. NASA was one of several customers to hitch a ride on the lander to deliver science and technology demonstrations to the moon's south pole. And it's part of the agency's commercial lunar payload services initiative to learn more about the moon before returning humans there under the Artemis campaign. Shortly after separation, Intuitive Machines captured this picture of its lander named Odysseus as it flew away from Earth. And then it took another photo six days later as Odysseus entered lunar orbit with NASA's six science instruments. And on February 22nd, Odysseus soft landed on the moon. NASA worked with Intuitive Machines to gather as much data as possible from its six payloads until the lander's solar panels were no longer exposed to light. 
When the time comes for humans to explore the moon and beyond, they'll have to take everything with them for a surface mission. Building bases or even cities will require huge amounts of cargo and eventually crew, and that's where Starship comes in. This year is shaping up to be a busy one for Starship. Right now we're getting ready for the third test flight down at Starbase, Texas. Every launch and mission yields critical data for continuing to improve and pave the way for our future in space. And we look forward to eventual human missions to Mars, but right now we're paving the way with today's exciting mission, which will conduct over 200 scientific experiments and technology demonstrations, including new research to prepare human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and benefit humanity on Earth. But for now, I'll send it back to Megan and Raja at KSC. And since we're hoping to go farther into space than ever before, NASA is in the process of gathering as much data as possible to understand how long-duration trips to space affect the human body. For more on that, let's go out to NASA's Jasmine Hopkins, who's at a nearby launch viewing location here at Kennedy. Thank you so much, Megan. Yes, we're joining you from the Operations Support Building here at Kennedy, which is one of the main VIP viewing locations here. And joining us right now is Kristen Fogg from the Human Research Program at Johnson. Thanks for being here, Kristen. My pleasure, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Human Research Program. Exactly. So I, I see the excitement in your voice. Tell us, what is the Human Research Program? What do you guys do? Well, it's, it's really all about the human. So we really focus on the risk and how do we reduce risk for humans in space flight. So that can be things like uh, behavioral health, so stress or sleep, physiological changes like bone, muscle, how does exercise impact that, nutrition, food, medical capabilities. It's really about how do we, how do we understand those risks, how do we counter those risks, we call those countermeasures. It's all about optimizing crew health and performance. Right, and there's a lot that goes into that, of course, the human body. And right now, one of the human research program's long-standing experiments is called Cypher. There's like 14 different experiments over a year. Tell us about that and how is Kuwait contributing to Cypher? It doesn't seem like that long ago that I was standing here talking to you about starting Cypher. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really excited. Crew 8 is going to have our third Cypher subject. And just to kind of emphasize what you were just talking about earlier, 14 studies and one research complement. So that's addressing a lot of the risks that I was just talking about earlier, about behavioral health and physiological changes. And really what Cypher is designed to do is to say, how do we connect those dots? All of those risks, how do they interact and impact the human as a whole over a period of time? That duration piece is so critical about mm -hmm. microgravity. And so we're really excited about this. Right, there's a lot of excitement that goes into this. And again, studying the human body, especially in low Earth orbit, because that's yeah. really a stepping stone. We want to go further to the moon and then on to Mars. So how is our research in low Earth orbit getting us there? Yeah, so, okay, well, as we talking about Artemis and for Mars, so we have these unique spaceflight hazards that, that the human may experience. And so that can be radiation, so solar radiation or galactic cosmic radiation or distance from Earth or isolation and confinement, the environment of the vehicle like sound and lighting or the environment on a surface mission, so lunar dust or, or Martian dust. And so all of these hazards can impact spaceflight, but there's also extended time in microgravity and the International Space Station is such a wonderful lab for us to understand microgravity, the changes in the vestibular or sensory motor function, that motion sickness. Mm -hmm. uh, Cypher is really helping us to understand a lot more about all of the changes to microgravity. So we can start actually using station to really help us get ready for those exploration missions and really help reduce those risks. Yeah, there's a lot that's going into this and a lot that the human research program is doing. Thank you so much for being here to represent them. Kristen, really appreciate it's it. It's my pleasure. Of course, all right. We're gonna to toss it back to SpaceX at Hawthorne, California. Thanks so much. I'm Ronnie Foreman, a commercial sales manager here at SpaceX. We are coming up on just about 47 and a half minutes to launch, and our teams are carefully moving through the process to lift off. A lot of preparations have brought us to this point, including a dry dress rehearsal and static fire earlier this week. Now, as Megan noted at the top of our webcast, we did stand down from a launch attempt yesterday due to weather. But for now, everything looks great for launch tonight at 10.53 p.m. Eastern. Now, next up, in just about two minutes, our launch director will check in with the team for readiness, both for prop load and for launch. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they're go by voting electronically. The launch director will also check in with the Dragon mission director and NASA launch manager to make sure they're ready to move forward as well. 
And as Jesse mentioned earlier today, the Dragon launch team, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the Launch and Landing Control Center at Hangar X in Florida. On your screen right now, you have that beautiful nighttime view of the Dragon spacecraft with the white crew access arm still in the service position. Right now, Crew 8 is on board Dragon waiting to get the green light to stow that arm for launch and arm the launch escape system. Once the launch director gives the go-ahead, we should get a good view of that access arm, access arm moving away from the spacecraft. The range also continues to be go for launch tonight, monitoring the clearance area surrounding our launch pad, as well as the air and sea space along the flight corridor. At Kennedy Space Center, weather is looking good for launch, although we are continued, continuing to monitor some potential inland storms that could trigger our anvil cloud rule. And if you're joining us on the Space Coast, you know it's about 64 degrees outside with light ground winds. So overall, we're looking good for launch in just about 45 minutes, with again, less than a 10% chance of weather violation. Downrange landing zones, if needed in the event of an escape, are also go. Our teams will be staffed around the clock in mission control to monitor Dragon, not just today, but throughout the entire mission, from liftoff to Crew 8's arrival at the space station, all the way through splashdown when the astronauts come back home. On console and mission control, which you have a view of on your screen right now, uh, there are six key positions. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you may hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core. And the four additional team members are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. Now, apart from mission control, our Falcon 9 team is also currently located in the launch and landing control center at Hangar X. Now with less than an hour until T0, all teams are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and liftoff. Poll is complete. Again, right now we are standing for by for that access poll from arm our retract. Both launch controls, control rooms will go into lockdown at T-45 minutes and remain in that state until launch escape system is disarmed. All operators are to remain in their console and remain in a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming the launch escape system following orbit insertion of propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and the approval board in the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch out sequence immediately and proceed in the launch abort sequence. At T-10 seconds, launch control will be hands-off relying on automated work criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the current for movement. Crew arm status has started. And with that, we are moving forward toward launch. Propellant loading will begin in about 10 minutes and crew access arm retraction has begun. So in the meantime, let's check back in with Megan and Raja. Thanks, Veronica. Now the countdown clock is continuing to tick and we are now at T minus 48 minutes and counting from launch. At the time of launch, the space station will be flying 260 statute miles over the Southern Arabian Sea, southwest of India. Now the crew access arm will retract from Dragon. That is what we are looking for now, and actually it is happening right now. This is a critical milestone, right, Raja? It is, and uh, yeah, so the, the next big thing will be launching. Dragon SpaceX for countdown timing. Go ahead. All right, Matt, we're looking at one closeout photo of the side hatch, uh, doing some analysis on it, and uh, are gonna be looking for you to be crisp with the launch escape system arming. Uh, Team is under a bit of pressure here to get a call in. Okay. So just the word there. Arm recheck complete. So now that the arm is out of the way, the next big step is to arm the launch escape system. You heard the MD asking you that they keep it crisp, uh, just because they work some time constraints on the analysis from the the side hatch photos. Um, yeah, pretty key thing here: the launching the arm, uh, the launch escape system. 
um, the crew will actually hear a number of valves, thunks and thuds, as the actual the Super Dracos we talked about earlier, the valves that supply prop to them are actually open, so you can, you can actually hear that and feel it, the vibrations in the vehicle, and that's part of the training flow. There's actually a thing called Sound of the Dragon where you listen to those sounds uh, at that Buck High Fidelity trader out in Hawthorne, so you can hear those before you're actually sitting in the capsule. Uh, what you can't simulate fully is the actual vibrations. You can actually feel the, the capsule vibrating as those things happen. Now a launch escape system obviously built into Dragon to remove the crew, to pull the crew away from Falcon 9 either on the pad or during flight if there were to be an issue. Why isn't the launch escape system armed sooner, Raja? Uh, so you want to wait uh, until you don't really have any other alternative and that we wait until we start loading prop. Because once there's prop on the vehicle, it's essentially alive in terms of uh, there's fuel and oxidizer, which is what generates the thrust for the, uh, the rocket, but also essentially could cause a hazard. And so at that point, you want that ability to immediately clear. There still always is the, the possibility of defueling the rocket if there's some problem. And in fact, if there was a, a decision later to scrub, that's what they would do is defuel it and then swing the arm back out. But once there's prop on board, you want the ability to get off quickly if you have to. And like we talked about, it can be an automated system. It can also, the crew can initiate that. And, and before they arm the system, they're actually going to pull up a screen and Matt and Mike will be able to see the parameters that, that trigger an automated uh, escape. And they'll make sure that everything is within limits before they activate the system. Is what you wouldn't want to do is activate it and have it immediately trigger. And so right now, the only way off the capsule is the launch escape system, right? Uh, at actually, this point, they can still, there's, there's two the ways, mm -hmm. exactly. So there's a command called emergency egress that initiates the crew access arm to swing back, and then you would unstrap normally and get out. There's also the launch escape, but you always retain the ability to hit the emergency egress because there could be a case. Dragon SpaceX, expected decision at T minus 37 minutes. At this time, you're go for viewing section six of the procedure. You are not go for arming the command. How copy? Dragon copies. Can we preemptively close advisors? Yes, sir. Go for that. Can you walk us through that call out? Right. So we, like, closing advisors. We talked about there's steps and procedures. They said you can review but don't execute. So he's looking at the steps to arm the launch escape system, but what they've told him is to hold off until uh, another few minutes here to actually get the call to do that. Um, and you heard him talking about the the photos they're looking at from the close out of the hatch. And we talked about you know the analysis that goes into looking at everything and saying, was it new, old? Um, so uh, there's probably something they're looking at in those photos. We saw them spending some more time with the lights and the pictures uh, and wiping it down just to make sure they're, they're happy with what they saw. So making sure that the side hatch and the seal are all good before exactly. proceeding with launch. And the reason this is a, where they want to you know, pause and think about that now is because, like we've talked about, once you arm the launch escape system, then now you're sitting on a armed uh, set of prop in that in that dragon. The, the super drakers are active, um, and so right now the closeout crew is gone. No one's around there. So before you take that next step, you want to make sure that you're uh, you have a clear path forward towards launch. And so again, we're expecting that decision on whether or not to go forward with arming the launch escape system, which obviously needs to happen before we can proceed with to launch. Yep. We're expecting that in about a minute. That is the time that the launch team briefed Matt and the crew. And so, Arming the launch escape system was supposed to happen around T minus 39 minutes. Obviously, if it happens, it were to be later. Still okay if absolutely, yeah. The, that the, the, the driving factor. So the, as I mentioned, as we get closer and closer to launch, the margin of pads they build in just gets a little tighter. Um, but yeah, the, the driving factor is how long does it take to get the fuel and the oxidizer into the Falcon 9 before uh, before launch time as long as the launch escape system is armed, which is a pretty quick command and pretty instantaneous um, for those valves to change. It's, it's more that they have to back out how much time does it take to fuel the rocket and make sure they preserve that amount of time. Again, we're going to stand by for what we expect to be a decision. Dragon SpaceX, at this time your go for 6.4 arm launch escape system. Team is confident that we understand the issue well enough to proceed into LES arm and it's within existing analysis. Dragon copy, go to close advisors. Advisors closed, so we are arming the launch escape system. 
Copy. And with that call out, again, arming the launch escape system, one of the major milestones before liftoff today at 10.53 p.m. and 38 seconds Eastern time from Kennedy Space Center here in Florida to send three astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station. This is the Crew-8 launch, and you're watching the live broadcast of it. So you, you heard the, uh, the, uh, the acknowledgement for them to go ahead and complete the procedure, so um, you expect that you'll hear something. Launch escape system is verified art. Now needing to use the launch escape system, it's just a possibility we have to plan for. No one wants to think about it, but it is something we have to plan for. Yeah, it actually, it, it, it makes the overall launch uh, safer because you have, uh, you have an alternative if there's something wrong with the, the F-9 rocket. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. You wouldn't want to have to use it, but the fact that we, that we built that into these commercial crew vehicles uh, is, a, is a huge safety uh, improvement over the past. And uh, it looks like they're starting the loading prop now, which is the next major step. Um, and so now that the launch escape system is armed, uh, they can start putting the prop onto the vehicle. You'll start to hear calls. Um, and again, the, the crew can actually feel some of these things. Um, they don't actually have direct insight into the actual fuel levels inside the Falcon 9, but they have a timing, a timeline inside the, the Dragon that gives them a sense of Propellant when. load has started. There's a call out there, confirming there. that propellant load has started on schedule at T minus 35 minutes from liftoff. And so at this point, the, the crew, like I mentioned, with the launch escape system armed, uh, is pretty much in, in flight mode. Um, so you know, if they're watching the timeline of and will be monitoring the calls they get from the ground as opposed as that kind of layout if the prop loading is happening according to timeline. Um, and then for us uh, watching on TV, a really super easy way to see how full it is is just the, as the condensation comes off the rocket that gives you a sense of how far up the fuel has filled inside the tanks as the cooled uh, fuel and oxidizer go into the tank and then evaporate. Yeah, right now we have RP-1, a rocket-grade kerosene, going in, and also liquid oxygen loading on the first stage. And the, again, the reason, just like with the LES arming or the launch escape system arming, as well as the prop loading, they make those calls to the crew so that when you hear these clunks and mm -hmm. thuds and kind of ringing of the vehicle that you know that was supposed to happen as opposed right. to... Uh, you know, without a call or without the timeline they have, if you just hear a very loud thud, it's kind of just like in your house, you're like, what was that? Um, so this just kind of keeps everyone in sync as to the things they're seeing, feeling, and, and hearing are, are normal. So inside Dragon Endeavor right now, we have Commander Matt Dominic, born and raised in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, married to Faith Dominic, and they have two daughters. He has a Master of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School, designated a Naval Aviator in 2007, made two deployments to the North Arabian Sea. He has more than 1,600 hours of flight time Dragon in Space 28 different aircraft. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, want to get back with you and chat about that LES arming time pressure uh, summary. We saw a small crack on the side hatch seal at the top of the hatch. Main concern is re-entry heating soaking through a damaged seal. We do believe the crack is small enough to be bounded with margin by existing analysis, uh, but the team is still working it and double checking. How copy? Checking copy. So here's the call there, uh, essentially saying uh, they gave them the okay to arm the launch escape system, but that does not necessarily mean they're, they're totally comfortable or have finished the analysis for what they saw in those hatch seal photos. So just giving the crew the update that uh, and clearly they're not going to let them launch if they're not confident, but it sounds like they, they um, believe based on the analysis they've done so far, they have margin for the, the worst case, which is another word for bounding scenario. You heard him mention that. Um, but uh, and basically what they're doing now is prop loading in parallel uh, with that. Right. 
because that call out gave us some insight into why there was a delay in arming the launch escape system. They basically said there was a small crack in the side hatch seal. And the concern of that crack would be during reentry. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think uh, obviously, um, like we've talked many times throughout the broadcast, you've got uh, some of the, the best experts in the world on both the SpaceX and the NASA side looking at the data. I think it really shows the importance. You know, early on we were ahead of time, um, but all the pictures and photos they were taking of the hatch seal, and this kind of demonstrates exactly why they do that. Because now, when we don't have access to the hatch and we can't just open it up and take a look, we can pour over those photos. Um, go back to the SMEs, uh, the REs, as you heard them called, the responsible engineers, the subject matter experts, um, and use that photo evidence uh, compared to the analysis and the development verification information to, to make sure that we're confident uh, that everything's good to go. Right. Because as I said, they believe it's small enough. Start of to stage fix. one cryohelium loading. Stage one cryo, uh, cryo cryohelium. loading, as he you said. Cryohelium. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, helium. So you mentioned before, there's RP, uh, RP1 is the fuel, and then liquid oxygen is the oxidizer. What pressurizes those those propellants uh, is helium. Um, so not only do you have to load the fuel, the oxidizer, but you also have to load gas to then push those fuels into the engines. T minus 30 minutes, 19 minutes and counting to T zero. As Raja was saying. Propellant loading is happening on the Falcon 9, but there is an issue still in review, which is a small crack in the side hatch seal. The team briefed the crew just a few minutes ago, saying that they are reviewing it, but they believe it is small enough to fix. And that is why propellant loading continues. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so for, at this point, the crew is kind of just going through procedures uh, and talking through the ascent. Again, uh, the next big point for them will be at about T minus 10 minutes where they'll start uh, again talking back and forth to the ground. Sounds like maybe they might get an update as well. As by my guess, they'll probably get uh, an update about that point from the ground control team. And as we wait for updates, we recently got to ask the Crew 8 astronauts why they believe human spaceflight is so important. And here's what they had to say. Everything we learn on Space Station enables our technology, it increases our knowledge, and it burns down our risk as we go further. As explorers, we're looking at ways to further human knowledge, human experience. As said однажды Konstantin Edward Solkovsky, our Earth is a collodel of humanity. But the human being is always in a collodel. People are so different on Earth. The more people we get into space, the more things we learn about what happens to their body in space, the more we learn to move humanity further to the moon and then ultimately to Mars. The experiments that we'll conduct help with radiation, how to grow plants in space, how to get the human body to last longer outside of Earth's protection. In Zero Gravity, we've actually discovered physiological processes, how the body works. Uh, that we didn't even know existed without finding them first in space. Uh, that includes mechanisms to lower your blood volume, to adapt to a weightless environment, mechanisms that store sodium uh, in your body, which we didn't know existed, uh, ways that the human can control its cardiovascular system that we didn't know existed. Every single human that's ever been born and ever died has all happened on our planet Earth. And if we want to continue the light of consciousness further, we need to make ourselves multiplanetary. Go further, we will. Go further, we must. But we want to have that deck stacked in our favor as much as possible, and our mission will definitely contribute to that. T minus 27 minutes and 10 seconds and counting to launch. Let's head back to Jasmine Hopkins, who's now with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy. Thank you so much, Megan. As always, it's an honor to have our NASA leadership here for a launch. And of course, we know there's a couple of watch items right now with Crew 8, but both of our leaders right here have been to space before. So actually, can you guys talk about why safety is so paramount in human spaceflight? 
Well, you're dealing with a very unforgiving environment with uh, a lot of explosive power and uh, you're defying the laws of gravity. And as a result, everything has to be right. So you don't launch until it's right. Now, Pam is an astronaut space shuttle commander. She's flown three times in space. I've flown once. And uh, you've been through this many times. Uh, you didn't have as many scrubs as we had on ours. We got in, strapped in, ready to go and scrub four times over the better part of a month. But that pretty well tells you you don't launch until it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, Bill. I had several scrubs of my own, uh, delayed six days for my first flight, uh, three days for my second, had a couple of strap-ins. You're right, not as many as you. But I think, um, you know, it's important to remember that the crew is very focused on their mission on the space station. And it's not like they're saying, hey, I've got to get home for something. They're going to wait until they're safe. And that's Stage the way two, we do it, too. As started. Bill said, a lot of things have to go right. Uh, and we're going to keep safety number one. Right, right. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And of course, we're on our eighth rotational flight with SpaceX. You know, it feels like just yesterday, Demo 2 launched. So can uh, Bill Nelson, can you speak to the, the progress of the commercial crew program? Well, it's unbelievable. Uh, just think uh, how much the cost of launching has come down as a fact of reusing the rockets. Uh, and just uh, the Falcon 9 has been such a proven workhorse. Uh, this past year, uh, they launched Falcon 9s, if you can believe it, 96 times. This year, they're going to launch 146 times. And next year, 200 times. Wow, it's a workhorse. Oh, yeah, it definitely is. And you know, we've, we've had a lot of success with SpaceX already this year with the launch of PACE to help study our climate. Uh, we also had the a su a successful landing on the moon for the first time in over 50 years. So, Pam, can you speak to what's next for SpaceX and NASA together? Well, Jasmine, it's amazing what's coming up. First of all, the crew is going to have a very exciting increment. They ho have over 200 science experiments that they'll be running, including several medical experiments that will benefit all humanity. But while they're there, they're going to have some very exciting visitors. We're really looking forward to seeing Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore launch on the Boeing Starliner on the first crewed flight test of that brand new human space flight vehicle. They'll be visiting the station. And then uh, if we stay on schedule, this increment will also see a new cargo vehicle going up with Sierra Space's Dream Chaser. Uh, and then you look at the rest of what we're doing in science. We have uh, an eclipse coming up. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be the last eclipse visible in North America for uh, almost two decades. And uh, then we'll be launching NISAR, which is our partnership with India, uh, to look at the Earth. And uh, we also have uh, the X-59, our new X-plane, right, right uh, quiet <laughs> supersonic boom yeah, uh, coming up. And year. then, of course, the Artemis II crew, you're going to be seeing a lot of them down here in yeah. Florida as they're training for their mission next year. Right. This is a pretty That's thrilling year. we got a lot going it on. It really is. There's so much going on. But, of yeah. course, we, we still want to keep our eyes right now on Crew 8. So thank you so much, Bill and Pam, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thanks. All right, our friends at SpaceX, back to you. As we continue to count down, let's take a closer look at the vehicles that will be taking Crew 8 to the International Space Station tonight. Sitting atop the Falcon 9, the Dragon spacecraft and its trunk stands over 26 feet tall. There are two windows on the spacecraft, plus one under the nose cone. The nose cone opens shortly after launch to expose the forward bulkhead thrusters and docking mechanism that will connect with the space station. Dragon's trunk holds solar cells, which power Dragon while it's in free flight. The trunk can also carry unpressurized cargo. And Dragon has 16 Draco thrusters that can be used in space to help navigate the spacecraft to its destination, each providing 90 pounds of force. That doesn't include the eight super Draco thrusters used for an abort, which are no longer active once the crew is in orbit. 
For those of you following along, you'll know that Dr the Dragon spacecraft has played a significant role in advancing our future in space by safely transporting crew to and from the space station. There are currently four Dragon spacecraft supporting human spaceflight missions that have docked to the station, Endeavor, Resilience, Endurance, and Freedom. Crew 8 will fly aboard Endeavour tonight, which previously flew NASA's SpaceX demo mission 2, Crew 2, and Crew 6. In addition to Axiom's first mission, the very first commercial astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Altogether, the reusable Dragon spacecraft has completed seven human spaceflight missions on behalf of NASA and visited the space station 38 times under NASA's commercial resupply and commercial crew programs. As always, Dragon will be delivered to orbit today by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, which provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust on its first stage thanks to its nine Merlin M1D engines. Once the first and second stages separate, these engines are also used to help land the first stage. The first stage will perform three burns as it makes its way back toward Earth today. First is the boost back burn, and that's where three of the M1D engines will reignite to help flip the first stage around to head back to the launch site. The second burn is the entry burn, and that's where a single engine will reignite to help slow Falcon 9 down as it prepares to enter the Earth's atmosphere again. Finally is the landing burn, and that's where three engines will slow down the rocket enough to perform a precision landing back down on landing zone one. Meanwhile, the second stage continues to orbit, powered by one single Merlin vacuum engine with over 220,000 pounds of thrust. The H2, second stage will secure complete. Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit. And we did just hear that call out that stage one RP1 load is complete. That's great. We're continuing to check through these milestones now almost less than 20 minutes until tonight's launch. So again, the second stage will continue to secure Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit before separating, leaving Dragon to continue its journey to the space station on its own thrusters. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin, which exposes its guidance navigation controls that help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. With T0 coming up in just about 19 minutes and 30 seconds, our teams at the Cape and Hangar X are doing a series of system checks to ensure Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready. Let's check in with Ronnie for a quick status update. Ronnie? Thanks, Jesse. We are still looking good for an on-time launch, about 19 minutes from now, and we'll keep monitoring all the vehicle systems as we get closer to liftoff. Both Dragon and Falcon 9 continue to be healthy. So as we continue to listen and watch the countdown, our teams are continuing to prep the vehicle for flight, and propellant loading of both RP-1 and liquid oxygen began at T minus 35 minutes. We also heard the call out a few minutes ago that the launch escape system is now armed. The range, which is monitoring keepout zones, among other key flight requirements, also continues to report no issues, as they are go to support tonight's launch. Weather also looks good, and we are still tracking less than a 10% chance of violation at our target liftoff time. As a reminder, today we do have an instantaneous launch window, driven by the orbital mechanics constraints of two spacecraft meeting in orbit. The technical term for that meeting is called a rendezvous. The reason we need to launch at a specific time is because Dragon is basically trying to catch up to the ISS, which as we speak is orbiting the Earth at more than 17,000 miles per hour. That means we have to deliver Dragon to the correct orbit, and we also need to time its trajectory relative to the orbiting laboratory so that they are in the same place in orbit at the same time. A precise liftoff is crucial for achieving a timely rendezvous between Dragon and the space station. So at this point, if we hear a hold called for any reason, we will have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity, which is tomorrow at 10.31 p.m. Eastern. So with all systems go, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca for a status update from Houston. Thanks, Ronnie. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are ensuring the space station is ready to receive Dragon. They're also checking that all the communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly. Right now, everything is proceeding as planned. The teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of Dragon on Tuesday when they enter joint operations, which happens when the spacecraft enters the approach ellipsoid,
which is an invisible boundary that helps us monitor spacecrafts arriving and departing. After docking, the crews will perform Dragon a series of leak checks and then work to... Working. Expect more words here in a few minutes. Shooting for T minus 10 minutes to get you a brief. And we just received Dragon. an update that we that we are proceeding towards launch. Once the crews perform those series of leak checks on board, they will work to open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew Stage and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the... Here in Mission Control, Flight Director Garrett Hain is on console overseeing the team for launch, and Paul Kanya will be on console on Tuesday for docking. That's it from here in Mission Control Houston. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Megan, how's it looking? Thank you, Rebecca. If you're just joining us, we are now at T-minus 16 minutes, 7 seconds and counting from the 8th astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. Uh, Rajachari, commander of the SpaceX, uh, NASA SpaceX Crew 3 mission here with me. And Raja, we just heard a call out saying to expect a, another crew brief at T-minus 10 minutes about the uh, crack that we, uh, the teams are currently monitoring in the side hatch seal. Yep, and that's a pretty standard at uh, T-minus 10 is usually when they've kind of done all the final polling uh, and usually give an update to the crew um, and for the crew to make sure that they're all ready to go uh, inside the capsule as well. Uh, and since we know of at least that one open issue, that's also kind of the logical time for them to update uh, crew eight on the status of that before they go into the final terminal count. Not to say that they can't continue working it during that 10 minutes, but that's sort of the, I think the checkpoint they gave the crew of when they'll give them some information about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's a, uh, uh, it's always exciting, and I, it was, uh, I think the administrator said exactly what we would expect and exactly why we do what we do, that, of course, safety will be paramount. Um, of course, we want to see them launch. Obviously, the families want to see them launch. Crew 8 uh, wants to get there, and the expedition uh, on the space station wants to see them, but clearly we want everyone to be safe, so yeah. I, I know the team will do what they need to do. So we're doing, we're taking the steps towards launch, but we're waiting for that T-10 right. brief to really give us the final Right, resolution. so we'll continue doing stuff in parallel to, to be ready to go, sure. but obviously the analysis still has to get completed. So when Crew 8 arrives at the International Space Station, they will be greeted by seven other crew members, including NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. She's been on board since last September and delivered this personal message to her soon-to-be new crewmates. Hey, Crew 8. I'm so stoked for your launch and to welcome you on board the International Space Station. I very vividly remember my first few days on Space Station, so I'm looking forward to getting to relive those days through your eyes, and uh, I'll try not to laugh too much. Matt, uh, it's been an amazing seven years so far. Uh, it's going to be really special to get to fly with you, uh, such a good friend, and I know this is going to be one of our craziest adventures together yet. Mike, I uh, can't wait to share this boat with you. Jeanette, looking forward to continuing the good times that we had in Star City together. Sasha, there's no ice rink on board, but uh, we have some other games planned up here. I hope you guys have a beautiful launch. I hope you enjoy the special time that you're going to get to have in Dragon together orbiting Earth. And uh, we'll be on board waiting with a big meal prepared with all the foods that we don't like. So with that, safe travels, and I'll see you on the other side of the hatch on Space Station. I like what she said, she'll try not to laugh so much as we're inviting three new first-time flyers onto the space station. Yeah, Laurel is uh, infamous for easily getting cases of the giggles, so it's uh, <laughs> awesome to see her. It's been so fun to watch uh, her and the current ISS expedition crew uh, loving working in space. And so I, I know she's excited, uh, as well as the rest of Crew 7, to see uh, Crew 8. And, and Laurel's time, uh, but she'll eventually get replaced by TC, who will be launching later in March uh, from Star City on the next Soyuz up to replace Laurel. So. Um, we'll be tuning into that uh, just a few weeks from now on March 21st. T minus 12 minutes, 48 seconds and counting. We are counting down really to a T minus 10 brief uh, with the crew to talk a an issue that the team is, uh, is working. Uh, Raja, can you talk to us about that? What are your final thoughts as we approach that? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we got to see, I think we kind of had an inkling just watching, the, you even brought it up as we were watching the, the hatch close out, just a lot more time taking pictures. And as we talked about at the time, the, the reason we do that, and they mentioned even back then, they said they maybe saw hair. Um, and so as they go through and analyze those pictures, um, it sounds like, uh, at least from what we could hear on the loops we can hear, and there's a, probably a whole bunch more going on in the background. 
um, that uh, they're doing some analysis to see that a crack they saw in one of the photos, it sounds like, um, whether that case and the analysis shows that we have what's called margin, meaning um, there's not any concerns for the worst case scenario uh, of a re-entry, as it sounds like what they're, what they're calling the bounding case. So that analysis, I expect, will be go ongoing. Um, it would not be unusual for them to tell the crew, even at TMIS-10, like, hey, we're still working it. We'll get you an update prior to launch. Um, because, again, the more time you buy the team to, to do the analysis, the, the more conclusive of a recommendation they can come to. So I would you know, expect the, them to be pouring over that data. And like we talked about earlier in the show, that's why the, you know that's why we have uh, all these teams here looking at the data. Sure. Um, there's there's no more important thing than the human and human space flight, and so um, we want to be absolutely sure that uh, they are good to go on their way to the space station. And when we take that wide shot of uh, Falcon 9 on the pad, uh, we see a lot of venting happening. Again, propellant loading continues. Dragon SpaceX for a follow up. Go ahead. All right. We are confident that we understand the issue and we can still fly the whole mission safely. We're comfortable proceeding because the condition is bounding by existing analysis, as already mentioned. Additionally, we expect the gap uh, created by this crack in the seal to close as the material will swell with reentry heating. And finally, it's on the lower heating side of the vehicle during reentry. Uh, the engineering team here is comfortable uh, proceeding. How copy? Dragon Captain. Okay, okay, so with that. With that, Crew 8, confirmed displays are configured for launch. All right, so with that, it seems like we are go for launch. The team telling the crew they are confident. SpaceX Dragon, displays are configured for launch. Crew 7, this is Crew 8, we're coming for you. <laughs> it's time for Crew 8 to relieve you of the watch of the International Space Station. SpaceX Dragon, we are ready for you to cast off the strong back and launch Dragon Endeavor on its fifth voyage. There you have it, the team confident that they can fly this mission end to end. So now, in this final stretch of the countdown, we're going to turn it over to Sandra and Ronnie at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, to take us through launch and ascent. We copied all. Godspeed, Crew 8. Thanks so much. So with that and Crew 8 sounding excited for liftoff, our next major countdown event will be around the T minus nine, nine and a half minute mark when the Falcon 9 launch commit criteria get checked by computers. So right now we're listening in for that call. The launch commit criteria are specific thresholds and pieces of information about the entire Falcon 9 system needed to make sure that the rocket is healthy. Of course, we have many systems in place to ensure that the rocket and crew are both safe leading up to liftoff and during flight, now that we're approaching terminal count. Our teams are performing all those final checks before launch. Back in Mission Control Houston, there's a variety of systems and console positions that are also being worked in tandem and monitored by, by the team. These include cameras aboard space station, reboost capabilities, as well as a console that monitors trajectory to ensure everything is looking good. It'll be about a nine minute ride to orbit today, and that's about the time that we'll see second stage cut off. A few minutes after that is when we'll see Crew Dragon separate from the second stage. And along the way leading up to this, you'll be hearing some performance calls as we get into the final countdown and then after liftoff as well. These are SpaceX flight controllers reporting on trajectory, speed, booster performance, and key milestones. But there are some other calls you'll hear the crew make as well after liftoff. The crew will report out number and letter combinations, which mark different abort zones throughout the flight up the eastern seaboard. The first two, 1A and 1B, have that name because they're in the first stage, and that will last until they're up to the very north of North Carolina. The next are 2A through 2E. Those will come into play once the second stage kicks in. That takes us from the top of North Carolina all the way to the tip of Newfoundland in the northern Atlantic. Diverting a little bit from the other naming systems, you will hear the call Shannon or forward to Shannon, which refers to Shannon, Ireland, meaning they would target off the coast of Ireland if they were later in that second stage and did need to abort. So again, you'll hear these different callouts throughout the flight uphill, along with key performance callouts from guidance, navigation and control officers. And you can expect to hear from them um, on calls on trajectory and propulsion as well. 
So one of the next call outs we're listening for is the announcement that stage one engine chill has started, which is one of the key processes that prepares the engines for flight. Right now, propellant in the tanks is isolated from the engines, but at T minus seven minutes, we'll open the engine pre-valves and start passing just a trickle of liquid oxygen through the Merlin engine pumps, engine chill chilling the started. engines for the start sequence. There we go, right on time. Now we do this because the super chilled and densified liquid oxygen is really, really cold. And we use this process to bring the engine hardware down to a cooler temperature before flowing all of the locks and propellant into it during flight. At liftoff, Falcon 9 is consuming 700 gallons of fuel per second. So engine chill helps us to prevent thermal shock and ensures nominal engine performance. So again, now that we've got that good engine chill call out, Shortly after that, we should be looking for that stage one RP1 load complete call. So with that engine chill now underway, one, we're looking ahead complete. to the call out that RP1 load is and there you heard it, RP-1 load is complete. RP-1 is densified kerosene or rocket fuel that will propel the crew into orbit. All of that RP-1 is now loaded into the first stage and we did hear that the second stage was completed a short time ago as well. We're still loading liquid oxygen on the first and second stages. This is the oxidizer needed to combine with the densified kerosene that just finished up loading. Coming up, we'll hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count and then transition over to internal power. Then we'll hear the propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, adding some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for the strong back to retract. At first, it will move just a couple of degrees and then we'll see it swing open completely the moment of liftoff. That strong back provides access to Falcon 9's fueling lines and umbilicals for both prop load and the different gases being loaded on board. We'll continue to check through a couple more fueling milestones, including one around the two minute mark before flight, where we will hear that the liquid oxygen is finished on board the second stage. Dragon is in configured for terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks pressurizing for strong back retract. And we did just hear that call out. Dragon is in terminal count. The onboard computers now are taking control of the spacecraft. The first stage will finish liquid oxygen loading in about three minutes, followed by completion of second stage locks loading one minute later. Strong back retract has started. There's a call out over the nets that we are moving forward into strong back retract. The next thing you might be able to see on your screen is actually gonna be the clamp arms opening up around the base of the second stage. That will allow the strong back to recline about two degrees away from the vehicle. And because we've now begun pressurizing Falcon 9, we know that it's strong enough to stand on its own. That TE will throw back all the way to 45 degrees at liftoff. The strong back is part of the transporter erector, which provides liquids, gases, and electrical connections to the vehicle. There you can see those clamp arms have fully opened around the base of just the trunk of Dragon on stage two. And so the next major milestone that we're tracking today is stage one locks load being complete. We expect that call out at about three minutes when that first stage locks load will be completely finished. So all those white clouds of vapor you see on your screen right now are normal and we'll continue to see them build up as we get even closer to launch. Because liquid oxygen is super chilled, it boils off a little bit in the warm Florida air. in for the call out that stage one locks load is complete. Stage one locks load complete. There's the confirmation that we have completed loading liquid oxygen on board stage one, but locks will still be loading for about another minute on board stage two. Then we'll prepare to vent down the TE, which is going to produce another white Dragon cloud. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal you may also power. Hear there's confirmation that Dragon is on internal power. You may also hear an announcement to the crew about that venting procedure. So everything continuing to go as planned. 
this evening. We are now two minutes and 20 seconds away from the launch of Crew 8. Standing by in about 15 seconds, we should hear the call out that the second stage locks load is complete and that Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two lock load complete. And with that, you did hear that lock load is complete. Gas closeout has also begun, so we're now isolating all the feed lines for Dragon the different gas systems from idle. the Falcon 9 rocket. They'll then get... Great news, continuing to move towards launch, and Dragon you could even hear some of those gases testing. being vented over just shortly. And you can hear it even better now. Something else you might see here in a few moments is water being poured onto the pad because rockets are super loud. The sound can impart loads back on the rocket itself. So that water helps absorb and prevent the sound from hitting the structure and reverberating back onto the rocket. FTS Coming up on Falcon one minute until launch. Dragon is in countdown. The flight termination system is armed and we are in Dragon, countdown. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. Five seconds. Dragon copy, go for launch. Reports go, crew reports go. Now about 30 seconds away from liftoff. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition, engine full power, and liftoff of NASA Crew 8. Go Falcon, go SpaceX, and go NASA. What Alpha! Endeavor ascends a beacon of human hit. 1.7 million pounds of thrust now propelling Falcon 9 and Crew 8. Vehicle is pitching down range. We know that Falcon 9 is throttling back up, and that one call out for one Bravo means that we are in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing to get good performance from Falcon 9. Now at this Back point, the crew started. are already pulling over two Gs. And with that call out, we know that that engine chill for MVAC, which is our second stage engine, has now also begun. That also means we have a couple of events that are going to happen in rapid succession. First is that chill on the MVAC engine, and then we'll have main engine cutoff, or MECO, where the nine engines on the first stage of Falcon 9 will cut off ahead of first and second stage separation. Then the Merlin vacuum engine on board the second stage will ignite and carry the crew eight astronauts to orbit, while the first stage begins its journey back to Earth. At this point in the flight, the nine Merlin stage engines are starting down. to throttle down, and we're standing... There's that call out for, st for throttle down, and we're standing by, by for Miko. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. And back in there. Copy through Alpha.
So those incredible views on your screen and of course the cheering behind me means that we have had successful main engine cutoff, stage separation, and ignition of our MVAC engine on board stage two. We are also in two alpha for the aborts if needed. Of course, that second stage is being illuminated on the right-hand side of your screen by our single Merlin vacuum engine on board stage two. Now the next milestone we're tracking is the stage one boost back burn on the left-hand side of your screen. And we are expecting completion of that burn in just about 10 seconds. And so crew eight is now traveling at over 4,000 miles per hour. We're continuing to get good call outs, everything going really smoothly today. That second stage will continue firing until we reach about eight minutes into the flight. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Dragon. Good performance on the lone Merlin vacuum engine on, on the second stage. The crew's G-load dips right when we hit the separation event and it's going to continue to build up now. Again, we just heard another call out for nominal trajectory. That was the guidance, navigation, and control officer stating nominal trajectory or everything is looking good. Dragon is pointed in the right direction, continuing its flight uphill. This second stage will continue to fire until a little over eight minutes into the flight, accelerating Dragon to more than 17,000 miles per hour and placing the crew in orbit. Right now, the crew is traveling at 4,500 miles per hour and is over 93 miles in altitude. That single Merlin vacuum engine can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space, and you really see it doing the heavy lifting right now. So while Crew-8 continues on its way to the International Space Station, the first stage booster is on its way back to landing Dragon zone SpaceX, one. trajectory nominal. Confirmation Dragon. there that the trajectory for both vehicles is looking good. Now the first stage has a couple of events itself in order to land. At T plus six minutes and 16 seconds, stage one will begin its entry burn, which will be the first of two burns prior to landing. During this burn, Falcon 9 will ignite only the center engine for about 10 seconds in order to slow the vehicle down before it reaches the denser parts of the Earth's atmosphere. That will be followed by the landing burn at T plus seven minutes and 21 seconds. This time we'll light three engines and the burn will last for about 20 seconds, ending just about a minute before we expect Dragon to be inserted into orbit. And so we did also hear a couple of different Dragon ground Dragon station Dragon call Dragon outs Dragon. like Bermuda. Uh, that is one of the ground Dragon. stations that we're receiving telemetry from and everything continues to look really good with the trajectory. The crew now traveling over 6,000 miles per hour. Again, this second stage will continue to light for a couple more minutes before second engine cutoff. At that point, the vehicle will coast for a few minutes before separation. And it looks like we're starting to get some views of the Florida coast there on the first stage as it continues to make its way back to Earth. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Dragon. Continuing to get good call outs, everything going smoothly. Now almost seven minutes into the flight of crew eight. So the next milestone we're standing by for is stage one landing burn start. Again, as stage one approaches the space coast to touch back down at landing zone one. Stage two FTS is saved. And it is great to see that first stage back on Earth coming up. 
next on the second stage is second engine cutoff. You can hear some excitement here at Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters as that first stage successfully landed back on Earth. So second engine cutoff will take place here in just a couple of minutes. Once the lone Mer Merlin engine cuts off and stops firing, the second stage will continue to coast for about three minutes until Dragon is commanded to separate. At this point, Dragon will separate from the second stage and will fly free with crew eight still on board and in orbit. Shannon. Copy, Shannon. And that call out for Shannon, indicative of Shannon, Ireland, the very last abort zone in the second stage. The Merlin engine is about to shut down. You just saw it there on your screen. Dragon SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. Dragon Hearing copy. good call-outs following second stage cutoff. The crew is Watch in a nominal or far. as expected orbit. That is, that is great news. That launch escape system. And we are getting our first view of crew eight inside Endeavor. Three of them in space for the very first time. So again, we'll continue to coast for these few minutes after that second stage just shut down. This helps to allow rates and motion to settle out. There are actually small reaction thrusters on the upper part of the second stage that can be used to counteract any residual motion, basically making sure that we're in a stable coast before Dragon separates from Falcon. We expect that separation here to, to occur at about the 12 minute mark into the flight. So again, we did hear that the crew has been successfully inserted into a good orbit. This is the crew in microgravity, three of them for the very first time, all good callouts. So right now, the second stage is performing a series of checkouts as we prepare to separate Dragon from stage two. And so we will see that separation coming up in just a couple of minutes, after which a number of activation checkouts occur automatically. First, we'll be checking out 12 of the Draco maneuvering thrusters all around the service section of the Dragon spacecraft. And then we'll also begin to get ready for nose cone opening. Nose cone stays closed for the flight uphill to help protect all of those guidance, navigation, and control sensors. It also covers four of the Draco thrusters that will be used for the majority of the different phase burns requiring Dragon to catch up to the International Space Station. So we are standing by for Dragon separation to occur here in just about 30 seconds from now. Of course, the view you have right now on your screen. Oh, actually, now that our view has transitioned, you're getting a great view of Dragon's heat shield. This camera is on top of stage two and looking up into Dragon's trunk. So if you're just joining us this evening, we had a successful launch of Crew-8. They're on their way to the International Space Station. The first stage has already returned to Earth and landed successfully, and the second stage has shut down and we're awaiting separation, and you see it on your screen right there. Dragon, Dragon and Space Endeavor X. now flying free. Dragon, SpaceX, this is your launch chief engineer. Go ahead. Welcome to orbit. It uh, truly is our greatest honor for you to trust us to launch you into space. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, and we trust that all the science and work you're about to do will continue to move humanity further towards the stars. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the ride, and thank you for flying on Falcon 9. Please send our regards to Crew 7, and make sure to remind them you just wanted to be fashionably late.
I'll hand it off to the launch director for a few words. Dragon LD, hope the ride was as awesome as a Cybertruck. Have a safe journey to the space station, and we we'll look forward to see, seeing you when you get home. Thank you for flying SpaceX. SpaceX, oh my goodness, what an incredible ride to orbit. I'm both glad and not glad that you ha don't have a copy of our ICS. The cheers the whole way up are incredible. A big thank you to SpaceX for incredible instructors. Tyler, I'm talking to you and your team right now. Incredible instructors, engineers, and operators. They're the reason we are now safely in orbit. A thank you to NASA, Roscosmos, CSA, ESA, JAXA, who work together to make the International Space Station work for us all. And, of course, big thank you to my family, friends, and mentors who are the reason we're here today. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, hey, Earth, uh, just to let you know, it's kind of like a roller coaster ride with a bunch of really excited teenagers. Just want to mention the, uh, the NASA community is just a, a really warm but steely-eyed family that does amazing things, and it, it kind of hugs you, but it pushes you into the unknown while watching your back. It's really been an incredible place for me to grow over these past 30-plus uh, years, and now I'm really honored to fly this new generation spaceship with this new generation crew. Thanks to my own family for tolerating my otherworldly habits. Uh, thanks to NASA for being the backbone of exploration that, uh, that we are. And just thanks so much to our friends and colleagues at SpaceX for the awesome ride. It's great to be back in space again. And uh, I would like to second Mike and Matt's words. I'm super excited to be here. And, um, you know, I need to here. And the words that come to my mind is that I'm so grateful and I'm thankful for everyone who uh, got us to this point. There's no way we would have been able to do this without all the people, from all the instructors, from all the people supporting on the ground, to the, people, the folks in the kitchen who kept us fed and moved out in SpaceX. Yeah, I just, I'm so grateful for everyone, and I just want to give a big thanks to my um, family and friends who came from all over the world to see this. Thank you for supporting me through all the, all the days of um, waiting to get to this point. Thank you for everything, and I want to give a shout-out, a quick shout-out to my sisters who couldn't make it, Brenda and Patty, and then I'd also want to give a nod to Syracuse who supported me through everything, and I am in a New York state of mind right now. It is amazing. Thank you for everything. Warm greetings to everyone from the orbit. I would like to express the huge gratitude to Roscosmos, NASA, ESA, JAXA teams, and all who took part in preparation and implementation. A separate shout out to my family and friends. Thank you for your support. My son, Seriosa, Vlad, Sasha, be good. Kuzbasa, Mitski, see you soon. Всех тепла приветствую с орбиты. Выражаю огромную благодарность коллективу Роскосмоса, НАСА и САДЖАКСА и всем без исключения причастным к подготовке и реализации нашего полета. Отдельный привет передаю своей семье и близким. Спасибо вам за поддержку. Сыновьям Сережа, Влад, Саша, будьте молодцами. Кузбас, мужки, до встречи. Dragon, we copied all, and we see the vehicle chasing down the International Space Station on orbit. Uh, nose cone opening is in progress. We saw nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. With that, you're go to raise visors. And uh, I've got one final note. We have a tradition on board this spacecraft for its travelers to bring a small token, a zero-G indicator, if you will, to clearly demonstrate the, the free-floating nature of objects traveling in orbit around the Earth. And I wonder if you've brought anything fitting that description. Well, you should ask. <laughs> oh, man. So per tradition, we, of course, have a zero-G indicator. It's already been deployed. The significance of our zero-G indicator is not, not actually what it is, but who chose it. Many parents around the world have jobs that take them away from their children and families for long periods of time to serve their communities, their country, and the world. 
Military families are a prime example, but many jobs, including our own, share this trait. The choice of the zero-G indicator was given to my daughters to represent the sacrifice that children everywhere make while their parents are serving away from home. We chose a stuffed family dog, and she is free-floating here today. Matt, we copied all good words. I think we don't have video inside the capsule. We'll have to come back with you in a minute uh, for a video of that stuffed dog. No worries, Big. So right now on your screen, you do have that initial video of nose cone deployment. And again, the nose cone is opening to expose those two sets of hooks that Dragon will use to autonomously dock, dock with the International Space Station. Of course, loved hearing that crew's description of their zero-G indicator, and we're standing by for those views. Zero-G indicators really do become an important symbol of microgravity flight and the communities behind each mission. So for those of you following along, you'll know that our first zero-G passenger was Little Earth on demonstration mission one. Here's Little Earth on board Dragon on that DM-1 flight and later on board the ISS. Today, just five years later, we've reached 50 people flown to space. From zero G to 50 in just five years is pretty incredible. And of course, here in Hawthorne, I actually have the real Little Earth that went to space safely back on Earth with us here in Hawthorne. Little Earth is a celebration of zero gravity indicators, an essential component of space missions that help mark the transition into zero G. From Yuri Gagarin's famous pencil to modern indicators like Little Earth and demonstration missions to Tremor the Sequin Dinosaur, zero gravity indicators have become a way for all of us to connect with and celebrate human spaceflight. Human spaceflight has come so far in the last five years. SpaceX has launched nine human spaceflight missions on behalf of NASA and four commercial astronaut missions. That's a total of 50 crew members to space since 2020, 34 on behalf of NASA and their partners, and 16 commercial astronauts, including the first all-civilian mission to space and the first all-private passenger mission to the International Space Station. In addition to flying people, SpaceX also enables researchers the opportunity to fly critical science to orbit. SpaceX and Dragon carried over a thousand research experiments to and from low Earth orbit and the International Space Station and transported over 300,000 pounds to and from the station since 2012. Researchers from around the world use the space station to address complex human health problems on Earth, studying disease formation, testing drugs and diagnostic tools, and examining the inner workings of the human body. At any one time, the station hosts hundreds of investigations spanning every major scientific discipline from physics to microbiology. Every mission yields critical research and learnings that help make life both on Earth and in space better. From DNA sequencing to 3D printing, studies on the space station test a variety of technologies, systems, and materials that will benefit life on Earth Dragon and SpaceX. be needed for future long-duration exploration missions. Yes, and forward bulkhead Draco checkouts, and we see an upcoming burn in 23 minutes, 2-3. Getting great views of Crew 8 on board their capsule there and standing by hoping we might get a shot. There is their zero G indicator. Loved hearing the crew's description of who chose this, uh, who chose this animal and why and everything that it means to them, to their mission, and obviously the community standing behind each of these four astronauts.
And in addition to that, we heard some great words from the crew expressing their thanks and excitement to be on orbit. Really great to see them successfully on their way to the International Space Station. We had a successful nose cone deploy as well as those Draco checkouts. Everything continuing to go really smooth. So for now, we're going to end our coverage from here in Hawthorne until we pick back up with our docking coverage in about 26 hours. So for now, we're gonna hand it back over to Megan and Raja at Kennedy Space Center to wrap up today's launch coverage. If you're just joining us, welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we just watched Crew 8 lift off from Launch Pad 39A. Three NASA astronauts and one cosmonaut now en route to the International Space Station. I'm Megan Cruz. This is NASA astronaut Raja Chari, and we got to see an incredible launch. What a clear yeah, night. that was amazing. Um, Dragon SpaceX cabin environment looks good for suit doffing, and we'll take the camera external here in just a sec. Uh, your go for 4.012 suit doffing. And that's the question you were, we were just talking yeah. about before we got back online was uh, when are they going to actually start docking their suits? Yeah, happy to go. 4.012 suit docking. And so you heard the calls there. So first they wait for the nose cone to get open. They wait for the Dracos to be safe, um, which was the, the launch escape system. And then once they've verified the cabin atmosphere is good, that's when they can take off their suits. And as you heard them say, they're going to take the cameras external because basically they're taking off their, their space suit. Um, and it's pretty sweaty. Uh, <laughs> you've been laying on the back for a while. Um, yeah, but you could hear, hear it in all their voices, the, the excitement. And like you said, what an amazing night down here at the Cape. It was super clear. You and could see. Dragon cameras are exterior. You can actually see the staging, um, and it was Happy external. amazing view, and I uh, got to see the first stage come back, so it was a super clear night, and we got to see the, see the second stage turn into just a, a very faint star all the way at Seco. Yeah, and it's great to see some friends launch of yours. You're really close with Matt and Mike, I understand, um, and really it's nice to see a launch because we really waited till T-minus 10 minutes to know whether or not we were going to go. Yep, yeah, and it's... Uh, you know, there's, it's always exciting when it comes to space flight, even more exciting when it comes to human space flight, and just great to see, you know, the team come up with a technical solution, look at all the data. Um, as you heard, them keeping the, the crew informed, like we talked many times tonight, the core is the person and the, the Capcom that they are talking to, mm -hmm. but there is literally hundreds of people talking on loops and making engineering decisions and um, trying to go back and look at analysis data, and so a great uh, testament to the team tonight to pull all that data together. Um, as they always do. Yeah, and to make sure that they're safe uh, at launch and also re-entry. So great to see the launch again. And once they get to the space station, they're going to have a hand in some incredible science investigations. And here's Jasmine Hopkins with more on that. Thank you so much, Megan. That's right. We saw another beautiful, uh, spectacular launch from here on the Space Coast. And joining us now is Dr. Xi from Emory University to talk about Project Eagle. So Dr. Xi, what is Project Eagle? Our goal is to investigate uh, the impact of space microgravity on human heart micro tissues. These tissues are generated from stem cells, and they are a potential source of cells for cardiac regeneration. One challenge is that these heart stem cells are largely immature, meaning that they're not as fully developed as the heart cells in our body. So we are trying to find ways to push these cells to, de to develop further. Um, because uh, transplanting immature cells could actually increase the risk of uh, complications. The good news is that we found this uh, um, heart muscle cells become more mature on the ground-based uh, simulated microgravity. And we would like to confirm that observation under real space microgravity. Right, so we're yeah. kind of taking what we've learned here on Earth and seeing if we can apply it in space. So with that in mind, we've been studying heart health in space for quite a long time now. So is Project Eagle going to tie into any of the other research we've already done? Great question. <laughs> yes, um, uh, actually our experiments built up on several interesting uh, studies uh, on the space station, um, including our own. Uh, for example, on the uh, space station, heart stem cells uh, or precursor cells grow faster than under a standard gravity. So in our new experiment, uh, we would like to learn if uh, the beating heart muscle cells can develop further and become more mature under space microgravity. Right, so yeah. we're kind of taking that, uh, that research to the next step there. And of course, that's really important because we're looking at going even deeper into space. But actually, is, you know, things like Project Eagle, could that actually help us on Earth? You know, what we're learning in space for our heart, could that benefit our heart health on Earth as well? That's good. another good question. <laughs> yeah, so uh, 
we hope to learn, um, identify the molecules or conditions uh, that can um, be helpful to pr promote the maturation of heart cells, because mm -hmm. that could help us develop new strategies to push uh, the cells uh, become more mature on Earth. More mature heart cells are more um, reliable for repairing damaged heart, mm -hmm. and those more, more mature heart cells are also useful for develop uh, new medications mm -hmm. to treat patients with heart disease. Right, right, yeah. so it's great to see, you know, we're taking it in space, also benefiting our life here on Earth. Thank you so much, Dr. G, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Of course, all right, Megan and Raja, back to you. All right, we're about to wrap up our coverage here, but I wanna take one last social media question because this one is super cute. This one is from a four-year-old, Robbie, and he wants to know what will the crew do to pass the time on the way to the space station? Well, well Robbie, ho hopefully your parents are typing for you and you don't have your own social media account <laughs> as a four-year-old, but uh, it's actually probably the best time uh, both at the beginning of the mission and at the end of the mission um, because on the ISS, uh, your timeline down to five minute increments, increments so you're going, going, going. Uh, so this time uh, in the Dragon on the way up and the way down is kind of the time to honestly look out the window, um, enjoy the fact that you're in space. Uh, for all of us, uh, we've trained and spent most of our life getting ready for this moment, so actually getting to, to savor that and enjoy it. Um, and you heard uh, Mike Bear talk about being able to look, you know, he said it was like being in a roller coaster with a bunch of teenagers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, it sounds like this, a lot of joy in that capsule right now. Um, now. On the serious side, they are starting to probably be de getting, uh, working with the cameras, uh, taking some Earth observation photos, uh, things like that. Um, but it's mostly just starting to get the cargo ready so that when they do dock, uh, they can be ready to go. They'll have to now start worrying about the rendezvous timeline, so they'll be monitoring the burn. So each time there's a phasing burn to get them closer to the space station, they'll be monitoring that and preparing for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when it gets time to do the actual rendezvous, uh, they'll get back in their suits um, and then start monitoring the systems and being ready to, to jump in for, for anything that's off nominal. So um, they do keep relatively busy. I was going to um, say, so sounds like they're doing uh, a lot over the next... There's plenty to be done, um, but it is a nice chance just to, to decompress a bit and, and enjoy the fact that you're in space. And there's some that adaptation so that the ISS is a much bigger volume, um, so it's actually kind of helpful to use the Dragon where you're confined. Uh, you're pretty clumsy at first, and so uh, you can't go very far without running into something and stopping. Oh. So you can use the Dragon as sort of a, like with training wheels, I get see. used to microgravity before you get on the, on the space station and go So they can actually around. get out of their suits in these next right. 20 hours. Right, so when you, when you heard them say they could, they could do the suit doffing procedure, they're absolutely unstrapping, taking the suits off, um, putting on some more comfortable clothes, uh, and probably depending on their timeline, they may immediately go to bed. Um, they may have some time to eat and then get up later. So it all depends on the docking timeline. Okay. Well, thank you so much for yeah, that insight. And Robbie, thank you so much for that question. That's going to do it for us here on NASA TV. But you can follow along with Crew 8's entire ride to the station by listening in to real-time mission audio. And you can check that out by scanning the QR code on your screen. Or if, again, you're watching us on your phone, just screen grab the code, and then you can click on it later. Now, Matthew, Michael, Jeanette, and Alexander are on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 3 a.m. Eastern Time on March 5th, so Tuesday. On-camera coverage of docking and arrival will resume about two hours before on NASA TV. And that's really always fun to watch. Oh, yeah, there. absolutely. Just the, the, the faces of the crew. I, mean, I think we showed some clips from earlier before, but uh, it's both exciting because you're coming onto the space station. And it's so bizarre to have trained so much at Johnson Space Center in the mock-ups and then see the real thing and it's upside down or sideways and just uh, your mind trying to take that all in. And I guarantee the smiles are gonna be huge. As you saw, Laurel's excited to see him. Everyone's excited to see everyone. It's, it's, a, it's a really weird family reunion when it happens <laughs> in space, but it's uh, probably one of the most fun ones to have. Well, and of course, before we sign off from Kennedy, I wanna thank Raja Chari for joining us, co-hosting his second launch with yeah. us. I hope you had a good time. I did, yeah. Okay. I, think I, uh, I wore the jinx this time, so I thank you. Got. I appreciate that. What we're going to do is sign you up for Crew 9. That's right. You heard it here, <laughs> folks. Crew 9, Raja Chari co-host. And a huge thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. But most importantly, thank you all for watching. And you can keep up with any updates on this mission using the online resources we're going to put on your screen right now. For everyone here at NASA and SpaceX, have a great morning or evening. It's still 1125. And we'll leave you now with a look back at highlights from suit, off, suit up to lift off. Inside the suit up room, where we see our three astronauts and one cosmonaut. And the point of this card game is so that the commander loses, to use up his bad luck. Here they come, Crew 8, taking their first steps outside before their journey to the International Space Station. 
crew is departing from the operations and checkout building across Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. Walking over to get a good look at their rides to space. Commander Matt Dominic, pilot Michael Barrett, walking down the crew access arm. See they, the techs are making sure their helmet is protected on the way in. Jeanette Epps, Alexandra Govenkin, our two mission specialists for Crew 8, walking on that sticky tape to grab anything before they ingress as well. We see four seats in the launch position. They're closing the hatch now. Full power and liftoff of NASA Crew 8. Go Falcon, go SpaceX, and go NASA. Endeavor ascends a beacon of human mission. 1.7 million pounds of thrust now propelling Falcon 9 and Crew 8. Vehicle is pitching down range. 